uh, one more question. Uh, yes. Who is uh, who is letting the people in the waiting room in? Um, um, if it's possible, uh, that will be you. Um, I'm letting in the co-share team. Yeah. So okay. we can uh, make sure that uh, everything is fine uh, in co-share. Yes. And then we, uh, you will you will uh, may entrance uh, uh, entry everyone. Yeah, uh, just at, at, at nine, exactly at nine, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think it's for the Oui, tout à fait. Uh, L'ordinateur est allumé, là? L'ordinateur est allumé? Um, so I'm I'm letting everyone in at nine o'clock, right? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Hi to the people from Kosha. Um, do you hear me? Okay, I'm letting everyone in the waiting room in.
Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, so those that are online or people that are here, we're a limited number, but still we're there. So uh, welcome to people in China from Shanghai. So uh, the session today is about uh, um, uh, high throughput experimental databases. But as you have seen in the format of the conference, we are introducing the sessions uh, with a, a general presentation. And today we have the chance to have with us uh, Professor Luis Alavo um, Bonino from Twente in the Netherlands. And he's been involved in the original FAIR effort. And so he's going to be presenting this uh, FAIR effort to us. And we thought that there was a really nice introduction to the whole uh, workshop. And so we're looking forward to nice interactions among you there and us here and hopefully it's going to work fine thank you very much Luis. thank you um good morning everybody good afternoon or evening from people um in the other parts of the world um should I... so uh the idea the idea of this session is to give a, a introduction on fair on the FAIR principles, but not only talk about what FAIR is, uh, and uh, it's not, but also how can we uh, do, how can we follow the principles in our daily activities? So uh, as, as probably you already uh, heard before, FAIR became a hype, and uh, as any hype, um, there is a, a, a certain amount of inflated expectations. And uh, the idea of this presentation is to uh, set uh, the baseline. So this is what we are expecting. This is what we can do. This is what we cannot do now and so forth, but we are working on that. So uh, as uh, Gianmarco said, I've been involved um, with fairs from, from the beginning. I attended the, the first fair meeting in January 2014. And uh, since then I've been working almost exclusively on designing and developing technologies to um, realize the FAIR principles or to support the realization of the FAIR principles. So just, just as a, as a, as a con context, so what we have nowadays uh, in our daily activities, and the larger the organization we are dealing with, uh, the more complex is the environment, is this uh, variety, this heterogeneity reality. So we have a, a enormous amount of technologies, platforms, providers, and it's not because we, we, we find it fun to deal with this complexity, it's because the reality is complex and we have solutions that solve specific problems, but because our, uh, we have a variety of different problems with different solutions, we need to use all these different things and hopefully get them as uh, integrated as possible so we can have a generic overview of the organization, of the activities, we can have uh, some kind of efficiency in our daily operations. So when we are look at the data specifically, so there were several, several uh, surveys, uh, uh, papers about how people dealing heavily with data, how they uh, spread their time. What's the, the time division? What they, do they do? And uh, this is just one of them. Uh, I, I've, I've read several of them. And uh, they are basically uh, pointed to the same direction. If you look at here, we have building draining sets, cleaning, organizing data, collecting data sets, mining data for patterns, refining algorithms, and other things. But if we look uh, closer, 79% of the time is spent in collecting the data set and cleaning and organizing. Why is that? And here, of course, uh, you're only spending time working with data after you found the data, but we, we are not considering in this kind of surveys the uh, enormous amount of times when we don't just don't find the data. We try we search and search for quite some time and we never find it. So, but here collecting the data set, so figuring out how can I get my hands on the data and then how can I organize, clean up, because you know there's a lot of stuff that maybe I don't need and, uh, and organizing and try to figure out how can I combine this with other stuff. This is roughly 80% of our time. Imagine that you work as a scientist, you have been trained 
uh, for good part of your life to to master your domain and then you uh, what you want is to analyze the data about your domain uh, come up with some conclusions to to improve the 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 state of the art but you are not doing that for 80 percent of your time so from the five days of week you are doing your job one day the other four days you are just uh, wrangling data and clean up you're doing you know housekeeping stuff because the data is not in a good shape in the first place so th this this is uh was a reality in 2016 was a reality before and is still in grand part uh, grand part is still a reality so when we try to break down the, this problem we we see that first thing of course and naturally we need to find the data we cannot work with anything that we haven't found. Um, then we have, to, once we, we know where it is, we have to access, we have to check whether we are entitled to do that. And if we are, how can we um, manage well, what's the procedure for us to get our hands on the data? And then we, uh, in most of the cases, we need this data to be interoperable because we need to integrate this with something else. Nowadays, it's rarely the case that one uh, data source is going to be enough for your whole analysis or your whole activity. You have to combine with different things, with different systems, different analysis uh, algorithms, and so forth. And in the end, we, what we want is to reuse. We want to optimize the resources that we spent uh, creating the data in the first place, and then the, uh, we would like this to be used as much as possible for the purpose that we intended and for other purposes as well. It's often the case that uh, some data sets are created for one purpose and they serve many other purposes in other contexts and so forth. So it's not coincidentally that uh, this, the steps, uh, the initials of these steps uh, give place to the acronym of FAIR. And uh, FAIR, well, the, the, the acronym and the principles were born in uh, January 2014 in a conference at, uh, for the conference uh, in, in Leiden, the Netherlands, organized by the, uh, the Netherlands Science Center and the, and the Dutch Tech Center for Life Sciences, um, where 30 something people from all around the world got together to discuss those problems. Situations like, oh, I know that we had the data. I know that my PhD student worked with the, uh, on this data for four years. Where are the data? Oh, it was in, in uh, the student's laptop. It graduated, uh, he or she graduated, and you know, have no idea where, where is the data. So that, that's very common. And this cannot uh, happen, right? because we are wasting resources. So um, uh, after that meeting in 2014, when these things were uh, discussed and the acronym was created, was not something that we created before, was created as usual. And uh, being back here in, in, in person after one and a half a year is it's an achievement, I, I think, because the, the acronym of FAIR, and I think that part of, of at least the widespread um, acknowledgement of FAIR is due to this easy to grasp acronym. Uh, it was born in the, in the drink, in the, during the, the, the drinks in, in a kind of social interaction that uh, we wouldn't have much if we were uh, Zooming from all around the world because then we'll be in the next meeting, the next meeting and so forth. So uh, two years later in that meeting, we spread ourselves in three groups, one for uh, where I, I participated, I still participate in uh, that we are aiming at developing technologies to support the realization of the fair principles. Another group was advocacy to spread the world around. And the other one was to, to try to secure uh, funds to for the, the, these activities. Then, uh, we, we got together and other people uh, joined after the, the meeting in 2014. And then during 2015, we wrote this, this paper that was published in 2016, the, the Fair Guiding Principles for Scientific Data Management and Stewardship. Surprisingly enough, um, it, it heavily cited, not because of the breakthrough scientific insights because you know <laughs> it's just a list of, of principles and some motivation but I, I, I believe that's because it touched 
a need, a, a pressing need uh, that we all have. How do we manage our data better to, to have a more efficient work? So um, a little bit on, on the, the uh, outreach part. So for our surprise, six months after the, the paper was published, we, we saw nobody still, still nobody know how this, this happened. It was uh, explicitly mentioned in the um, official report of the G20 summit in, uh, in China. And then uh, a few months later in 2017, the same happened uh, at the G7 summit. And uh, from 2017 on, the European Union embraced that uh, uh, fair start being part of the, um, of the, the uh, um, manual, the research manual for Horizon 2020, it's still in for Horizon Europe. And then Europe started organizing to um, develop what's called the European Open Science Cloud. The idea is to be based on the fair principles and connect uh, the research infrastructure throughout the Europe uh, with a fair layer between them so they can be connected interoperable. And then we can have a, a seamless uh, as possible integration of these diverse services, infrastructures, applications, and so forth. Um, the principles, the FAIR principles were primarily targeting machines. It's not because we believe that humans should be put out of the game. It's, it's, the, it's the opposite. It's because we think that uh, humans are essential to the process, but uh, essential in the, the, uh, in the places that we, are, we, are, uh, we excel. So we, are, we cannot handle anymore the amount and complex and variety of data. We cannot look at the, you know, billions of data items to check everything. Machines can do that efficiently. So we, we, the principles are targeting machines so they can do the have lift for us. So uh, the machines can help us by doing the heavy work and then we can focus on, on the things that we are good at. But first we need, they, they need to understand understand what we mean and understand of course is a very uh in a very you know loose sense because you know uh, it's more in, in, be able to interpret certain uh type of information and so forth and then uh, these are the principles i imagine that most of you have at least seen them um so they are split in these four different aspects we have uh, 15 principles included, the some principles uh, to try to give some guidance on how do we deal uh, with data, but not only data, uh, any kind of digital artifact. So in the principles, I'm going to mention this, uh, it's not only about data, it's about services, it's about vocabularies, it's about uh, um, applications, APIs and everything that can be done digitally, we can apply the FAIR principles. Um, but first, let's start what, what FAIR is not. So, uh, as I said before, because it, it is a hype, there is an unfair amount of expectations that are doomed to be uh, frustrated. But so it's, it's important that we uh, got it it's not a silver bullet, it's not going to solve all the problems of humankind. It's not covering all the aspects that we eventually need. It's the baseline for guarantee optimal interoperability and reusability um, at a certain level. So FAIR is not a binary state. It's not the case that you are going to be 100% FAIR. If not, you are unfair, completely unfair. It's not the case. That's why we have 15 principles. You can choose to follow some of them. And the choice should be based on your goals, what's your, your purpose. So we have been conducting a lot of activities on how to verify things. And the first thing that we do, and we're going to see later in the verification process, is to plan the verification. And the first uh, uh, point on planning the verification is that, why are you doing this? What do you want to achieve? And depending on what you want to achieve, you can focus on a, a certain set of the principles and not on the other ones. Of course, uh, uh, in the long term, you may aim to fulfill all of them. That's fine. But uh, you know, uh, if you try to do all at once, you're not going to 
to to get anywhere. So you have to start with the you know the, maybe the low hanging fruit or your priorities. You have to prioritize somehow. It's not a standard, so it's a set of principles, not a set of standards. There will be multiple uh, implementation choices to be done. Of course, we need to converge in some choices because then we can guarantee higher and higher levels of interoperability. But uh, there we, uh, the, the, the whole thing was set as being uh, as open as possible, as you know, constrained and agreed as necessary. Uh, it's not new, so the acronym may be new, may, may have been born in uh, 2014, but if you look at that, and I, I've heard many, many people saying, and of course, that's always the case, people are trying to, to achieve or are already doing or uh, aiming at this for many, for a long time, right? It's not uh, all these concerns were not born in 2014. So it, it combines and organizes decades of concerns on how do we deal with data. So, uh, and it's not restricted, as I said before, to structured data we can apply the fair principles to any type of digital object. So here in this slide, I try to, um, I try to highlight with different colors, the different aspects, the different, you know, small things that you should uh, uh, look into when you are considering to follow one of these principles. For instance, F1, metadata or data, are assigned with the global unique and persistent identifier. So we have an identifier to identify data, your metadata and data, you know, broad sense, any type of digital object and the metadata um, as, as associated to, to your object. So, and, and this identifier should be persistent and should be globally unique. And then F2, for instance, data are described with rich metadata. So here we, we establish the role of metadata uh, and the, the object it describes. So the metadata here is used to describe whatever you are uh, describing. And then we, we should be, uh, we should have as rich as possible metadata to help all the, the other principles. And the, in the paper, we explicitly mentioned that uh, some of this richness that you can uh, uh, argue on, on, on F2 are the uh, elements that we are describing in R1.1.2.3. So these are different things that uh, we, we should look into when you are uh, considering the fair principles. And then there's another way of looking at that. As you can see here, a lot of the principles have meta in parentheses. It means that this principle is applicable to both the metadata and the data. But then if you just normalize and, and you know, let's take off the, the, the parentheses, only uh, look at the metadata, we can see that all the principles uh, are related to metadata. We can do things with metadata. And, and this was a good thing that uh, the FAIR principles put a, a lot of emphasis on metadata, also because metadata, it's easier to manage than the data. So it's, it's, a, it's normally the low, low hanging fruit. So uh, it's easier, it's cheaper, and you can get a lot of results by sorting out properly your metadata. If you do the other way around, forget about the metadata and let's focus on the different types of digital objects, then we have all these principles that um, are addressed directly to that. So you can say, okay, but F2, data are described with rich metadata. Yeah, but to fulfill that principle, you don't touch the data. You have to have a metadata record that's rich enough to be able to describe that. So that, that's the subject, the, the data in this case, is a subject of the main part of this principle, which is please provide as rich as possible metadata. And the same for F3, that the, the identifier of the data should be present clearly and explicitly in the metadata record and so forth. So the, the focus on these principles that are in black are not the data, uh, the focus is on the metadata. Another way of looking at that is that uh, there are other third-party elements, not the data that we're dealing with, not the metadata that describes it, something else. For instance, the identifier, it's not 
that it's something else. You, you, to, to have a globally unique persistent identifier, you need to have an identification system that means uh, identifiers that are related to either your data or your metadata. And then here we're just putting the, the properties of this identifier. Uh, F4 that says that metadata and data register or indexed in a searchable resource, we need to have a search engine uh, that will be used to index the metadata of the data and so forth. Um, another, another angle that you can look at them is what are, what's technology, technology related? So these parts of the principles that I highlighted in, in red can be directly uh, addressed using technology, technology. So when you say that metadata are assigned with globally unique identifier, so we can have an algorithm in our identification system that we can demonstrate that uh, provides globally unique identifiers. The persistence part, on the other hand, is something else. The same as F2, data described with metadata. So there is a way that we can create a technology that we can uh, express metadata that's used to describe the data. How rich, that's something else. That's a social agreement, it's not technologically related and so forth. So by having some infrastructure, my point here is that by having some fair oriented infrastructure, we can cover a lot of the fair principles. This is the easy part. So as I said before, my, my role is to try to design and implement some technologies to support the fair principle. I always say uh, to my colleagues that, that mine is the easy part. Technology, we know uh, what needs to be done. So it's still a lot of work to get everything ready and right, but we know it's a kind of manageable managed uh, problem. The other part, the social related issues, are the, the hard ones, because as we all know, if you put more than one human uh, to discuss something, then you can start having exponential problems and, and discussions and time to discuss. That's, a, that's our nature. So for instance, the persistent part of the identifier is not technology related. It's a social agreement that the provider of the identification system commits to uh, keep the, the identifier resolving or pointing or relating to the same element for X amount of time. The principles don't say how much, how much should be considered by the communities. Each community will have different needs for persistency. The only point here is that the identification system should have this uh, persistence commitment explicit so the communities can uh, check and verify whether that uh, system complies with their expectation. How rich is the metadata depends on social agreements. Uh, uh, metadata I2, for instance, metadata and data use vocabularies that follow the fair principles. How fair should they, these vocabularies be, should also be a concern of the communities and so forth. So um, these are the parts that we have to get together and uh, organize our communities together so we can take these decisions. And this is hard and time consuming, but uh, will bring benefits. So here, I, I just want to, know, uh, to show briefly that we have uh, been de designing this verification uh, workflow or process that's composed of pre-verification, the verification itself and the post-verification that we have to plan the verification again, identify the goals, uh, what to what's the roadmap, what are the priorities, why we're doing this, uh, what we're going to do. So get the, the resources together, the expertise together, the, the tooling and so forth, then get to the, and this is a verification for legacy data. Of course, you can skip the retrieve non fair data if you are just creating uh, your data or generating from scratch. And then you have analyze and prepare the data. That's the 80%, right? Um, that we saw in this slide before. It's not analyzing in the, in the sense of getting conclusions out of the data. It's analyzed to understand what the, uh, the column A in that spreadsheet means. And the title of this, this, um, this column is A. And the, col the title of the column B is B and so on. So uh, you have a lot of values you have no idea what they mean and how they are related. So we have to understand this. And then we define the semantic model. So then uh, whenever someone else 
uh, gets the, um, that same data, we'll be able to uh, reuse the data much faster, don't need to understand all the data because the explanation is embedded with the data by means of the semantic model. And the same thing we do with the metadata. And then uh, step 6A, to make the data linkable so it can be more easily connected to other stuff, that's optional, of course, because some types of data are not suitable to do that. Uh, but you know, if you can and the data supports, that will be useful. You can have data in different formats that are optimal for different types of activities. That's not a problem at all. And should be, uh, we should have incentives to do that because different formats uh, uh, serves different purpose. And then you publish this, the metadata and the data associated. And then you can assess, you can do this before and after to, to check the comparison, but at least you, you should do this uh, after you finish the verification to verify whether you achieve the right level of fairness that you aim at. And that was you know, the general message that I wanted to convey. Uh, if you have any questions, I think that we have still a few minutes for questions. Thank you. Thank you all. And sorry for the, the presentation. So it seems that the quality was not really nice in terms of the picture. So we'll try to sort that out okay. for the uh, upcoming talks. So is there are questions I will first ask in the audience. And in fact, is there questions here? Okay, maybe on, on the web, are there questions? Okay, I'm gonna ask one in the meantime. So you said that you were working on the tools for the verification. You didn't present them very much here. No, so no. Could you say just a few words about that? Yeah, so, so we, we, have, um, we have designed a, a kind of whole ecosystem for that. Uh, and then we have some pieces in different uh, maturity levels. We have one uh, specifically targeting metadata, we call the fair data point, should, should have been named the fair metadata point, but. Uh, the idea is to expose, it's a set of specification, we have a reference implementation, but the main goal was to be a set of specification that could be implemented in any system that ex wants to expose their content uh, through fair metadata. So this, this we have, we have the specifications, we have the compliance criteria, so we can test whether an application is really behaving as a fair data point and so forth. And then we have uh, also, develop as a test that can be deployed anywhere uh, an index where these different fair data points can uh, communicate and and this index goes there and harvest the metadata of the various fair data points and become a, a data search engine or any kind of resource search engine because you do have the metadata of all these different resources and then we have also what we call the data stations this is more, uh, it's, we just uh, got a project that we, we are going to work for one year. It's a short project to do, uh, have the final design and the, the initial reference implementation of what we call the data station. It's a place where not only you expose the metadata of your content in a fair way, but you allow the interactions uh, on the data or on the content. So the idea here is that data should be as uh, to, should be left as much as possible where they are just moved when absolutely necessary to avoid you know data normally is way larger than the algorithms the analysis algorithm so keep it there and then also under the control of whoever is controlling that data so uh, issues on privacy and so on are kind of uh, covered by leaving the data the source and then the algorithms visit the data and do all this uh, analysis there with all this the, the uh, security and, and uh, privacy checks and so forth. So we are work on that. We have also uh, a preliminary version of what we call the verifier. It's a tool that you can uh, upload your data set, um, clean up, do the, all the wrangling. So clean up and organize and so on, and then define the semantic uh, model and then uh, generate the linkable data at the end. So you can keep your original data, you can have the, the linkable data and you have the semantic model and publish that in a further point where you have also the fair metadata. So we are working on this kind of tools. Okay, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Give me a quick one. So you just said a few words about that, but I was gonna ask, since you mentioned that 80% of the time is spent in cleaning the data and so on, 
what are the tools that are available? But you just yeah, the verifier, yeah, the verifier yeah, yeah. Will, will do the work there. Yeah, we we need to improve this a lot because now in the current state it is still usable by you know data expert. It facilitates their lives, make it the process easier. But still, we want to, to improve that a lot to make it more accessible to less technical people. And uh, associated with that, we have a hackathon-like events that we call BOIDs, Bring Your Own Data, where we put together the domain experts. We cannot do any of this without the domain experts. We cannot uh, define it because we don't know what's relevant to what those things mean. So uh, we put together the domain experts, the data owners, and the fair and the fair experts together to uh, verify data and answer some defined questions. Thank you very much. So let's thank uh, uh, Luis again. And so we can move to the next speaker who's Ralph Anstoffer from Berlin. And so Ralph uh, is going to be speaking about concepts for unifying data infrastructure and transparent data analytics in experimental physics. So the word is yours. So we see your screen, Ralph. So now you can just speak. All right, excellent. Let me just get the right windows back here. All right, so um, thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present our work, um, which is, I will take you down sort of to the street fight level now after the very generic introduction to the fair uh, principles um, of data management. Um, I will take you to the perspective of kind of a practitioner from uh, the field of condensed metaphysics, some experimentalist. Um, and I will discuss um, kind of the challenges we face and uh, have been facing and are still facing uh, and our ideas um, to mitigate them um, in view of making a community and experimental technique fair, uh, which as of today uh, has made very little progress along these lines. Um, I will discuss this on the basis of one specific technique, which is uh, photoelectron spectroscopy, but I think the basic principles I will be touching on are pretty much generic and apply to pretty much any experimental technique that is driven by individual labs rather than large scale facilities. The key people involved in this endeavor here are Tommaso Pincelli, Patrick Siang, and Lawrence Rettig, and the key funding sources uh, for this are the Max Planck Society and the um, European Union. So let me start with a slight historic perspective. So as Luis said, um, the basic idea of open research data is much older than the FAIR principles. Um, it definitely dates back to the previous century, but a very strong uh, political statement I, I found um, is from 2004, uh, which is an OECD declaration, um, which um, essentially suggests that um, research data that is performed with uh, taxpayers' money um, should maybe be open with kind of the main goals to enhance the quality and productivity of science. So specifically, what the general public expect, expects from this development is <clears throat> that we see an advancement of the scientific research in general, that we improve the training of researchers, um, especially also across boundaries and borders, and that we maximize the value of the data that is collected uh, from a, a given investment, um, that we sort of reach out wealthy countries uh, that can afford uh, expensive instrumentation, um, provides a basis for uh, developing countries to participate in, in the research data that is um, produced. Um, and overall, of course, a, a key goal is that the quality of the research um, in, improves. There's some concerns, um, of course, that need to be taken into account. For individuals, uh, it's the protection of intellectual properties and sort of for um, larger bodies or nations, um, it relates to security issues, primarily in privacy. 
issues. So that's uh, the political boundary condition. Uh, the question is, where are we uh, in, in that terms, almost 20 years later after this declaration? Um, the answer is, it very much depends in which field you work in. Uh, let me make an example. So I'm, as I said, I'm a condensed matter physicist, and probably the two most basic properties of a material are the arrangement of the atoms and the arrangement of the electrons in the crystal. So if we first look at the information you can get about the atomic structure of a material, if you type in crystal structure database into uh, your favorite search engine, uh, you find many, many results. Of course, there's not as many databases, but there is plenty. If you do the same thing for electronic structure database, uh, you still find many results, but there's a key difference. Uh, the atomic structure is based, well, databases are is based on experimental data, whereas essentially all of this is based on computational data on, on the electronic structure of a material. And if you sort of modify your search and explicitly add experimental, you will find only an abstract to a talk I gave some time ago. So essentially there is no, um, there's a huge discrepancy between experimental open data um, only if you sort of consider very different aspects of material, the atomic structure or the electronic structure. So um, w w why is that? So um, we have the strong political incentives um, to support open and, and, and enforce open access and open research data, um, but it hasn't happened in all communities. So the European Union is a, a key driving force in sort of um, pushing open access. Um, and on, on the German national level, uh, we also now have a big initiative, the NFDI initiative, um, that um, supports this with substantial amounts of funding. But I think the key question we have to ask is not what is um, policy or the, uh, the public trying to, to push us to, but why should an individual researcher uh, participate in this? Why? What are the incentives for an individual to participate in making um, his or her research data uh, public and open? Uh, what's what's in for me or them? So. Um, a key motivation could be that you're forced to, and as I mentioned, there is uh, major funding energy uh, agencies um, that that follow that route. But of course, um, we don't like doing things because we're forced to. So let's um, look at kind of the, the positive uh, effects from that. Um, so why are you benefiting from participating uh, in, in an open research data initiative? Um, if you if you participate, you you demonstrate maximal openness and transparency in the research you do and how you do it. And um, on the midterm, I'm convinced that this will lead to improved credibility. Um, in general, I think it's fair to state that any experimental researcher only makes fractional use of the information content of the data collected. So by sharing your data, you make it accessible to other approaches, other communities and other expertise. Um, this will only fly or sort of be an, an, an incentive if you will get credit for that. So what has to happen is that um, individuals um, need to be able to, to um, demonstrate that they have a scientific track record and that this is appreciated um, in the sense of a personal advantage in sort of in your career path, for instance. Then a big motivation is that if you turn an, a lab effort into a community effort, of course, you will share your procedures, you will share your data, but this is not a one way road, but that eventually you will also benefit from development um, of other labs. Um, side effect is that it very easily triggers collaborations and um, in the long run, it also eases the exchange of researchers, of people. Um, and then the final point is that um, 
in fact, we have been uh, um, responsible for proper data stewardship uh, for a very long time. So everybody in Germany at least has to sign that um, he, she obeys the rules of good scientific practice, um, which in essence requires that everything you do, your re research is reproducible um, and can be reproduced for, for 10 years and more. Um, I would claim that um, this rule is uh, existing on paper and many groups would fail if they would be forced to demonstrate this. So overall, um, the hope is that we do better science uh, in the sense that we make the process that we call science, which is extracting knowledge from data, uh, fully transparent, reproducible and transferable. So now, what are the challenges in doing this and why, in my community at least, uh, we haven't made uh, much progress in, along these directions. So let me start with kind of one of my favorite experimental techniques, uh, which is angry result for the emission spectroscopy. No worries, I won't explain any details, um, but it's important to understand the basic aspects of such an experiment. So there isn't a sample, it's illuminated by light. The light kicks out electrons and the electrons are detected. Um, the detector uh, then records basic aspects, the energy and an angle of emission of the electron. And this is what we traditionally call the data. And this is, um, many people refer to this as a snapshot of the electronic structure of a material. But besides this data, there's a lot of additional so-called metadata. And it's natural to group this um, along the basic components of such an experiment. So there's metadata associated with the detector. Uh, this can be two, three, or even four dimensional data. There's data associated with the light that it is used to do this experiment. There's data associated with the sample, uh, the parameters during um, the measurement, like temperature, but also the history and other characterization that has been done. And importantly, there's also data related to the act of performing the experiment, um, which is sort of soft metadata, but which is incredibly important. So I will, a key message I want to get across is that um, if you want to achieve fair, um, fair, fair data management, uh, we need to treat all this data on the very same level. And I will explain in the coming slides uh, what I mean with this. Um, the requirement to achieve this is that we have automated access to pretty much all these instrument parameters, this metadata, and that we need to improve our recording of this data and automation of the entire experiment tremendously. Uh, and one step and a key step is that um, the use of electronic lab notebooks um, need to, to improve in, in, in my community at least um, tremendously. And there we'll learn more about this um, in, in the course of this, um, this workshop. So let me sh show you what the challenges are based on uh, some real, um, a, a real example. So in this experiment, what you record is a stream of single electrons and every electron has a couple of parameters, so a position on detector, time of flight, um, some other parameters characterizing the experiment. And we record billions of these electrons per hour. Uh, and this is actually what we call the raw data. This raw data is essentially not accessible. In order to make it accessible, it needs to be transformed. So it needs to be processed. Um, and it needs to be converted from a stream of single events into some volumetric data uh, where the axis of what one looks at is already a subjective choice of the experimentalist, depending on which kind of information that person uh, would like to retrieve from that data. But this process here um, is very complex, um, depends on the experiment, of course, but in general, this is a co very complex process. It even is iterative in, in, in some experiments. And it's, very sub, it's, it's a very individual process. So it depends on the hardware, but uh, in many experiments, it even depends on the details of a single acquisition. So it changes between different experiments of the same, um, with the same machinery. Um, 
and it's it, it's it's a key process um, to arrive at what most people would call the raw data. So one should be aware that raw data is not the same as raw data. Um, if you use a different RPIS technique from the same community, um, you will have a similar workflow arriving at this point, um, but the details will be can be completely different. So such a, a, a data set is kind of a the, the common base um, of a, a given technique of a given community, the RPIS community. Um, so one has to agree on how this data should look like. And an important aspect is that this already includes a tremendous reduction in the data size, um, which means that you also lose information in that process. And this is important to realize. Um, so this data will be uh, combined with the type of metadata I have shown before. Um, and if you combine this and put this on an uh, open re repository like Sinodo, uh, one could think, OK, we're done. Um, so let's check. Um, the data will be findable and accessible, um, this we achieve. Um, the reusability of the data will be rather limited. Um, I explain why. Um, I would claim that it's close to not interoperable. Um, and an additional important aspect um, I would like to discuss is it, the, the data itself arriving at this point, what the, the, the raw data itself, um, is not necessarily uh, reproducible. So this process here, if this is not properly documented, um, we don't have a, a repro reproducible workflow, even if the data acquisition itself is highly reproducible. So if you come back to the, the, the FAIR principles, what do we need to do? Um, the aspect of uh, making the data findable, um, that's a fairly easy one. So this can be easily achieved right now. Um, make it accessible. Um, this is also um, this is also very simple and uh, largely in the responsibility of um, the people operating uh, data repositories. Um, to make it interoperable, this is probably the toughest one because what we need for that is we need to agree we a specific community. Um, on a certain language on how we describe the data. Um, to make it reusable, of course, this aspect is uh, also very important. Um, and as I said before, it needs to be done in, a, in, in an entire community, so in a specific domain of experimental physics in, in this case, um, that there need to be a, a, a community standard. And to make uh, things reproducible, uh, we need to add transparency to our workflows. So from that, there arise several key challenges um, on, on our way to achieve really fair data publishing. Uh, and I will discuss what I consider the, the key aspects. So the first one is the reproducible data processing workflow. So I'm talking about this, this circle. Uh, from going from really the true raw data to what the community would consider the raw data. Uh, in our example, this is really, a, it's, it's a complex workflow where sort of you have the, the data from the machine going through a sequence of different algorithms and then arrive at um, the data where the, the data analysis uh, would only start. Um, what we do to achieve this uh, is we essentially take the effort and write uh, papers about each individual steps um, and share the code um, in, in a repository on, on, on GitHub. Um, but we have been starting doing this only two years ago, um, and uh, we are still um, only one of a few groups that do this, and for the vast majority of groups, in my community, um, this process here is, 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 is not transparent. I'm not saying that they do, uh, they're making mistakes there. It's just not reproducible for um, people outside their, these groups. Um, a second 
uh, challenge in achieving interoperability um, is to achieve a unified uh, metadata structure. Um, so there is, we have the problem that ARPIS is, it's a very broad technique, but there's different flavors of this. So there's kind of the conventional ARPIS, which records full emission intensity, function of energy and momentum of the electrons. Then there's spin resolved ARPIS, where additional the spin state of the electron is recorded. There's time resolved ARPIS, where this changes over time and movies are taken of the electronic structure. Um, there's spatially resolved ARPIS, and there is um, many more techniques, and for sure there will also be new techniques being developed in the future. Um, as of today, uh, these are different sub-communities, and somebody doing spin-resolved ARPIS um, thinks he or she has very really different data structure compared to somebody doing normal ARPIS or time-resolved ARPIS. Um, so how can we bring this together and really um, merge this into a single community? Um, one idea is, as I mentioned before, that we give up um, this distinction between data and metadata. So if we consider our signal um, as photo emission intensity in a high dimensional parameter space, where some of the parameters are kind of the classical dimensions that are recorded and resolved by our detector, and all the other parameters are associated or historically called metadata, so the, for instance, parameters characterizing photons used to do the experiment, the geometry of the experiment, intrinsic parameters of the sample. And if we sort of give up this distinction of data and metadata and merge it into a single high dimensional parameter space, then we have a formalism uh, that in principle can cover all different ARPIS techniques. So, and I discussed this now for my specific technique of photo emission, but this basic idea, which is very trivial in, in nature, um, can be transferred to many other communities, for instance, optical spectroscopy, uh, which is also a very wide and perceived as very diverse um, experimental technique. So how can we do this? Um, we have made a suggestion on, on how to achieve this. Um, and the, the key ingredient is that one reaches out to the community and agrees on, on a dictionary. So essentially, this contains all the terms and words that are relevant for any of the ARPIS techniques. Um, one has to agree um, that there's only one term, term for a, a, a given thing, like a photon energy, that it's called so between the different techniques the same way. And then the sub-communities, the subdomains, have to agree on which, which of these parameters here are really important and essential for a given flavor of, of the ARPIS uh, experiment that they are performing. So this is called an application definition. And we're thinking of doing this here um, in the hierarchical, hierarchical structure of the Nexus data format. Um, and with these ingredients, we can then merge what is traditionally called the raw data and the metadata and have to develop a parser. Um, this is specific for every lab, every experiment, but you only have to do this once. And this would parse then um, the, um, the, the data into this uh, hierarchical structure. And then we have uh, essentially a merged data metadata set um, which then, after checking the compatibi compatibility with, uh, with the database, could be uploaded um, and um, be a very structured um, data set um, and be essentially have the same structure for the entire um, community. So an example would be that we would use this natural distinction that an experiment is usually combined from different um, aspects, like sample, detector, light source, and so on. Um, use this block-like structure, and then each application would, would choose uh, which of the blocks are important, and again, which parameters in which block are really important. Um, and agrees on, on such application definitions. But it's really important that this is not a decision made by an individual research group, but that the community would agree um, on, on, on such a convention. 
And this is probably the biggest challenge in this, uh, and especially for where we are with this right now. So how can you spread the word about this, spread the idea? And how can this be turned from the effort of an individual group to a community effort? So what we try to do is uh, we, we, we try to really properly describe uh, these ideas um, on, on a web page and we um, we try to reach out uh, on through workshops, uh, conferences and, and really in person uh, meetings. Um, if you achieve this, I think we're still not done with the aspect of interoperability. Um, because if you look at the definition, what that actually means is that um, we it's the ability of data or tools from non cooperating resources to integrate or work together, which means that different aspects exchange and make use of information. So this an example for for my case would be that um, a computational data and tools existing in in the world of, of computational research would be applicable to and comparable be made comparable to experimental data on the electronic structure so if you look at this um, on the experimental side um, we have large high dimensional data sets where an individual data set uh, is on the level of, of 10 gigabytes um, and the information content that one would like to uh, retrieve from that uh, is linked to really very complex and basic properties of a material. So it's it's a very rich uh, spectroscopic signal. At the same time, it's very complex. And retrieving this type of microscopic information on the electronic structure of a material from this data, this is this is current research. So this is currently done by hand by individual researchers, and there is no generalized technique because this process of kind of knowledge extraction from this and expressing the knowledge in terms of well, microscopic properties um, this is done on a very individual level depending on the problem at hand which scientific questions would want to be answered um, which class of material that is so it's it's this is extremely diverse and extremely non-uniform so Really achieving interoperability uh, at the current state uh, appears rather unfeasible. In order to, to make steps in this direction is that we need tools to reduce the complexity and also the size of what we consider the raw data. And we need tools that don't aim to kind of retrieve all the information that is possible in this data set but take a first step and extract kind of basic knowledge uh, from such complex data sets. And basic knowledge, for instance, we talk about the electronic structure, basic knowledge would be how, what is the dispersion of this, this, this bands uh, of the electrons in, in the crystal. And I wanna show you some examples uh, of, of what we have been doing in this direction. Um, so the general goal is to develop data analytics tools that um, lead to a reduction of the size of the data um, and um, would extract the essence of a data set. But this is a subjective choice, what you consider to be the essence. Um, that then would allow that you, you compare experimental data with computational data um, and eventually then allow to go one step further and start really building um, a database, an experimental electronic structure database, uh, based on sort of not the full complexity of the data, but what a, a, a group or a community would um, define as, as an essential information content of this data. So an example, um, what we have been trying to do is if you have such a, an, an, an image of the electronic structure, the people with a physics background know that these are dispersing bands describing the states of the electrons in that material. Um, but it's, 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 it's much more complex compared to a, a 
computated uh, band structure. So what we have been uh, demonstrating is that with a chain of pre-processing steps, one gets this data set ready to apply some machine learning techniques. So this is a, a rather simple probabilistic machine learning approach uh, where we feed this data through. This, um, this approach is sort of preconditioned by computational data, which is publicly available in, in, in databases already. And after some po post-processing, one can retrieve the shape and energetic position of essentially all the bands of the electrons in that specific material. So um, the result of this procedure here um, then is essentially such a representation of, of the bands of the electrons. And this can be expressed in, in a polynomial basis because this material has a hexagonal symmetry. So here you see kind of the topology of all 14 bands. They agree rather well with, with theory. But the key point is that now we have a representation of what most people would call the key information, the band structure of that material, and it can be expressed in a polynomial basis. The consequence is that we have reduced this volumetric data set uh, by more than four orders of magnitude from gigabytes to less than megabyte data um, with sort of the, the, the difference in, in the representation of the band structure, if you're only interested in that, um, being less than a percent. So um, now with this, we can, what I would consider the, the, the last challenge <clears throat> and take the step from putting the data onto a repository and take the step to build an encyclopedia. And uh, what we need to do uh, for achieving this is we need to um, develop advanced data analytics um, that sort of extract key information. We need to achieve data reduction to a level that uh, a large number of people is comfortable handling. Um, we also need to develop tools that allow to inspect the data uh, because in general we talk about high dimensional data and um, most humans still kind of only connect to things if, if, if you can visualize it. Um, and we then can start to link experimental information on electronic structure uh, <clears throat> with calculated databases of the electronic structure. All right, and um, what I've discussed is essentially what I consider the key missing steps as of today in order to achieve this. And um, we sort of teamed up with, with other people and we participate um, in the Fermat Consortium um, where angular resolved photo emission spectroscopy is sort of one of the experimental uh, techniques or communities that um, is present already from the start um, and where the basic concepts to sort of making uh, our data management fair um, are meant to be implemented. Uh, we closely work together with uh, other experimental techniques and you will learn uh, about uh, some of these in, in this workshop, for instance, electron microscopy by Christoph Koch. Um, but also we reach out to other spectroscopic techniques, optical spectroscopy, for instance, because I'm convinced that they face the very same challenges um, as we do. And then, of course, um, the, the big benefit of, um, of doing this will be if we start leaving our domain of experimental research um, and really make our data accessible, interoperable um, for for other communities, especially, of course, uh, to theory and computational uh, research. So um, what I have discussed, we really need, as a community, um, make progress on, on a common metadata standard. We need to make our data um, workflows uh, transparent, and we need to share them. We need to make it a community effort. And I think this is a very important aspect um, to create incentives for other groups and people to join, uh, because this is in practice a huge effort 
and if you can uh, benefit from what others have been doing in the past, um, this is a very big incentive to, to join the club. Um, and then, of course, the key goal is to establish an encyclopedia. And um, to achieve this, one needs to adopt concepts that sort of uh, bring together very specific experimental techniques that largely at this point still think, OK, they're, 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 they are isolated, they are singular, uh, and their data structure doesn't exist anywhere else. So one needs to think of um, data um, structure concepts that are unifying and sort of bring many groups, subdomains together, and make them realize they're actually, in fact, uh, a single domain. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Ralph. So I see in the chat there is already a question by Luca. So Luca, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. I thought you, you would read. So the, my my question, uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Ralph, for a very nice uh, overview. Um, and, and, and the kind of provocative uh, uh, assessment. Um, so my, my point is about uh, this uh, uh, kind of, uh, uh, so the, the interoperability point that you have made, and I think it's more of a, towards uh, reusability. So before uh, talking to the, to, to, to the theorists, let's say, so we're comparing uh, the, uh, so using the metadata that, that you have stored for, for the experiment and, and see if you have a connection with the, with the theory, what about uh, experiment to experiment, even with the same uh, device, say different vendors, uh, different groups. Uh, so if you have different settings, uh, how do you compare uh, data so that you can use data on different samples um, in the same uh, kind of scientific project? So without redoing by yourself, because at the end, you don't know what to do with data done by others, obtained by others. Yeah, this, this is a very good, very good question. And I would say from my perspective, it's equally complicated to compare our data with computational data compared to, to uh, experimental data from another group. The, the level at which comparison happens now is on the very far end of data after all the data analytics. Uh, that has been applied. I'm not talking about kind of this pre-processing workflow that um, would bring us to what we consider the raw data. I'm really talking about the far end when uh, data is further analyzed and sort of a key aspect is extracted. At this point, different experimental groups would start comparing. Uh, it's essentially non-existent that one group, let's say us, with our workflow of doing data analysis would feed in data from another group because at the current stage, it would be such an effort to make, I mean, sort of, um, Luis mentioned 80% of the time, it, it, it would be very similar. It would be such an effort um, to convert the data to, to make it uh, usable for our algorithms that this in practice is not happening. So it's at, at, at the current state, it's uh, this is close to zero. Okay, we but, have. But, but, a... oh. Sorry, oh, just, just to follow up. No, do ahead. you think it's, it, it is a, a, an effort worth uh, uh, taking to kind of try and, 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 and really speak the data together? Because, of course, it, it, it is great that you have the data if you want, and, and then you can check and, and reproduce. But, but, but what about? Uh, having a, a, a translation between one group to the other to make it short. Well, I mean, so what I discussed here, uh, I, I, I guess I was mostly motivating it in terms of making it comparable to computational data. But sort of the, what I presented here as kind of making it um, unified over the entire community of ARPAS, this would exactly allow this. So it wouldn't make a distinction between other experimental data or computational data. Um, if we achieve uh, kind of this, this common Nexus-based uh, metadata standard or data structure in, in, in general, then you can do this. Then you can also compare different experimental techniques. But it's sort of, it's, it's the same, the, 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 the road to achieve that is, is very much the same. And um, yeah, we, 
at the current stage, this is there's no advantage in 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 sort of or the, we don't have made further progress in comparing with other experimental data compared to computational data. With, with, with other experimental techniques like optical spectroscopy, this might be a, a slightly different, but in, in our field of photo emission spectroscopy, I, I think that's, that's the case. The only comparability you have is if instruments at large scale facilities are used where people bring their sample, take data with the very same machinery, and they go home with sort of data in a certain structure. It doesn't comply with all the requirements I've been discussing, but then different groups have the same type of data. And this can be compared, but this is, this is only a small fraction, I would say, um, of the data that is collected uh, in the entire community. Okay, so we have a few questions here. So the first one is by Stefan Kotimir. And my question is about uh, your challenges one and two when you're at the level where you are still operating on the raw data or close to the raw data. So you develop uh, tools within your group that you hope to generalize in the same or in a modified form to an, an entire experimental community. And that is a hard psychological effort because people will either be ignoring you or they will develop their own tools. And in the end, you will have then many competing tools. But in an experimental community, you have something extra that we in the computational community do not have. You have the vendors of equipment. So I wonder, would it be an option to develop, even in your own group, something that works? and then offer it for free to all the vendors of detectors and convince them to implement that in their native uh, analysis software. And in that way, suddenly everybody in that community that buys a new detector will have the procedures available. So that makes it super easy and maybe in this way the ID spreads. So I don't know whether this is anyhow realistic. That is my question to you. This is also this is an excellent question. Um, so the situation in, 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 in my community is there's a handful of vendors. Um, it's sort of the key thing is the electron spectrometers. And we have, although it's it's very few, we have kind of all the extremes from sort of one vendor being very transparent and sort of very eager to sort of uh, adopt developments of the community. Uh, another vendor being very secretive about the details of the instrument because I think they fear that people could uh, do back engineering. For instance, if they make the, this loop here, yeah, if, if they make this loop transparent, uh, then of course you can learn about uh, the instrument itself. And if this is protected, uh, then well, th th there's a certain danger. I can understand this. So in, in my small community, we, we have all of that. And we are just at the stage to sort of reach out to them um, and um, essentially make an offer that they become an active part of this thing. So it, I would even not say, um, please adopt what we developed. I would get them on board like all the other research groups as well and sort of participate and sort of um, share their ideas as well as concerns um and and be part of kind of the active community shaping this 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 is our current strategy and um i i, I would expect that some companies adopt this offer and, and accept this offer and, and others not and then we'll see how things develop i i i i feel that in five to ten years from now uh, people making a decision on which instrument to purchase um this what i've been discussing will be an important uh, aspect in the decision making process but maybe this is too much wishful thinking okay we have time for a short question here by um, Nikhil van Senten. Uh, thank you very interesting um I, I just wanted to kind of put one more layer of, of complexity maybe um i think in this very complex data right having fair data is one thing right but if i want to search like a database for something 
I would like to search for something like a, well, a trivial thing would be a gap of something or, or some very specific feature. What is your, your thought about this, about kind of the, basically this downstream analysis, um, how to kind of turn language effectively completely into something that can then be, be searched on, on such a complex database? Yes, uh, very good points. So I think that this is a key aspect of, of kind of this development here. So if, if you have such a representation of the data, so th this is essentially the projection of the data onto a polynomial basis, let's put it like this. Uh, and the size of this is sort of kilobytes. Um, and of course, now this contains, for instance, basic properties like dispersion gaps between the bands and so on. Um, I, I think that's a good example for the reduction we have to do at the current stage, meaning for the next couple of years, um, to, to, to sort of data of that size and complexity is of interest to a wide community. Uh, the, the, the raw data, not. And I think it's, uh, we'll see then um, how, how quick the development will be for really truly advanced uh, data analytics. And I think uh, this won't happen without really advanced machine learning approaches, much more complex than most data mining approaches um, um, used right now in, in material science um, to, to sort of make use really of the full, full beauty of the data set, the full information content. But I think as of today, this is kind of the level we, we are talking and uh, kind of you were thinking of right now, I think. Thank you very much, uh, Ralph. So I think we have to move to the next. Also, so thanks again from everyone here and from all the, all the audience. Thank you. So the next talk is going to be by uh, Satoshi Minamoto from NIMS in Japan. Uh, good morning. Uh, so can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you and we can see your screen. It's not yet in full screen, but... Uh, Okay, how about this? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone, but uh, good evening in, in Japan. So uh, my name is Minamoto uh, from uh, NIMS teams, uh, Japan. So I would like to, today I'd like to talk about uh, our system uh, development uh, and uh, 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 system de development for the structural materials. And uh, so we are thinking uh, to utilize the data from the system uh, by using the API. So I'd like to talk uh, about our pro the national project. And uh, this is very short story uh, about uh, NIMS, NIMS, uh, National Institute for Material Science, uh, which is uh, located uh, just above, uh, six, just away, uh, six kilometers away from uh, Tokyo, uh, Tokyo Station. And uh, the people, uh, the number of people, uh, researchers, uh, almost 400, and engineers, uh, almost 700. And totally, uh, uh, 1,600 people are working uh, on three uh, locations in Scuba area. And uh, one of the main, uh, our research work is to develop uh, the database. And some of them are, disclosed uh, openly, freely uh, on the web. Uh, so uh, as a Matt Nabi uh, application, and for example, the uh, polymer, polymer databases or uh, crystal structure databases, or uh, this is uh, uh, maybe the, the phase diagram uh, databases, and this is uh, electronic structure databases or something. Oh, and of course, we can uh, disclose the experimental data just like a CCT databases or uh, for example, the superconductivity uh, database or something like that. So today, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, uh, what the materials integration is, uh, uh, which is developed in Japanese national project. And as you know, uh, may, maybe uh, you know about the ICME in the US uh, or MGI in the US. Uh, ICME is the short uh, for the Integrated Computational uh, 
uh, materials engineering or something like that. Uh, materials integration in Japan is uh, the concept of, of materials integration is almost similar uh, to the uh, ICME concept, uh, which is uh, uh, very, very uh, focusing on developing, uh, reducing the time, reducing time uh, of developing the structure materials. In the uh, concept of materials integration, uh, we use this uh, four uh, scientific paradigm, uh, just like experimental and theory and numerical calculation and uh, uh, data science in order to understand the linkage of the uh, processing and structure and property and performances. And uh, finally, we are focusing on the uh, tackle to the inverse problem, uh, which is very important to design the structure materials. That is, uh, uh, if we want to the best, uh, for example, the strong materials, so what the composition uh, is, is like. Uh, so such kind of uh, problem is uh, our focusing on, okay. And uh, actually, the, uh, our project is in the second phase. The second phase has just started in uh, 2018 and will, uh, and will finish in 2022. And first stage uh, is before uh, five years. Uh, that, uh, that is 2014 to 2018 or so. And uh, almost over the 100 researchers are participating uh, uh, to the uh, national uh, project in order to uh, establish the, the procedure to design the uh, airplane material, for example, the, the wings uh, or engine turbine or something like that. So uh, we have three domains, uh, A and B and C. A is focusing on the system development and uh, Analyze, analyze for the metal, uh, pro, metal problem, uh, for example, the 3D additive manufacturing or something like that. Uh, so we are focusing on establish very, very fundamental technique uh, in, in the A domain. And she and, and the B and she is focusing on the CFRP and the 3D additive manufacturing application uh, this, respectively. And, uh, However, the, the 100, more than 100 researchers are participating in the whole, in the whole project. However, the three or four uh, person uh, for the system de development and the, I am the uh, responsibility of the system development. And the budget is, uh, is yes, uh, to 20 million US dollars or almost 20 million US dollars a year. And uh, yes. And here is the uh, R&D concept uh, for inverse problem analysis uh, for our second stage uh, SIP project. <laughs> and of course, uh, we will uh, we need to design the very accurate uh, for problems uh, design as a workflow. Okay, uh, in this picture, so we can, uh, uh, for example, we can we know about the competitions of the uh, alloys, and of course, uh, we know the the temperature of the treatment, so we can understand the, the uh, microstructure evolution based on the, for example, the carpet calculation or phase field calculation or something like that, uh, as a uh, forward program analysis. And after uh, we capture the, the features of microstructures, uh, we can uh, move uh, to the uh, analyze to the uh, for example, the property, perform, uh, property analysis or performance analysis. So, uh, the, for example, the chemical composition or heat treatment condition is the uh, process uh, in the PSPP relations. Okay, and uh, this is the uh, microstructure of the alloy, uh, is the structure data, uh, structure uh, section of the PSPP relation. And finally, uh, the, for example, the SS card or uh, tensile strengths or fatigue life limit or creep, li creep lifetime or something like that is the uh, property and the performance will, will be the uh, most uh, uh, imaginable uh, 
features uh, based on its boundary condition or environmental condition or something like that. So um, ordinary, so we analyze uh, uh, PS property, P uh, problem uh, in the in the forward analysis. And so once we uh, got uh, the workflow uh, from this direction, so we can uh, move to the backward as a inverse analysis. But uh, sometimes we need uh, another technique uh, to handle the very, very few data, other sparse modeling data or uh, Bayesian analysis or something like that. Okay. And uh, this is uh, the just uh, uh, an example of the uh, our system. Uh, here we call uh, mean system. Uh, mean system is short for the uh, materials integration by networking technology. Uh, so hereafter, so we I will call our system as mean system. And in, in the in the first stage of our project uh, uh, during this time, so we uh, developed a web-based application uh, to design the workflow uh, of the uh, analysis, forward analysis of the structural materials. And of course, we can uh, we we need the, the uh, player how uh, handle the uh, design the workflow. Uh, so we uh, developed a, a workflow player, and of course, uh, uh, after that, so as a post uh, treatment, so a data bureau or something like that, uh, has been developed in the first stage of the uh, of, of our project. <coughs> and uh, uh, yes, uh, and uh, here is just an example of the, uh, the simple workflow, and the uh, red, uh, no, no, uh, blue. Blue icon means the input, and the orange and yellow icon is the prediction model. Uh, in other words, uh, the physical model. Uh, and the gray icon uh, means the output uh, parameter. Okay. So to uh, manage the uh, this workflow, of course, the numerical input parameter or output parameter is uh, essential. However, we need uh, the background data as a metadata. Uh, we uh, correct, okay? Uh, so the vocabulary inventory system and the calculation, calculation data are stored in our system. And the, the below picture is the just a very uh, simple example of a workflow uh, in order to estimate the, the fatigue life limit. And in the in the workflow, uh, about one, two, three, four, uh, six or seven. Uh, prediction modules uh, perform the automatically in the system, and the, the user uh, input to something, and they get the output. So, out, uh, get the output. So the our workflow management system uh, consists uh, by the three uh, parts. Uh, one is design uh, part, and one is vocabulary management system, and one and the other uh, is database of experimental data or calculation data. Okay, so the, it is very important to describe the uh, data flow uh, of the structural material forward problem uh, uh, in order to understand the PSPP linkage. Okay, and each prediction models a uh, module uh, passes data uh, and the physical background and the materials engineering information as a metadata and physical. Uh, for example, the calculation condition or uh, experimental condition uh, or some other restriction in the materials. Okay, so this kind of information will be very useful to generate the machine learning models uh, as reusable prediction models in the uh, system. So it is very important to reuse those uh, models in the system. Okay, and here's uh, uh, our Data, how, how the data is stored in the databases. And uh, yeah, it, uh, blue is input port, and the uh, yellow one is a prediction model, and the gray one is output port. And of course, the uh, data uh, input file, for example, for the phase field model or a film model or something, is important. However, uh, it is difficult to make uh, machine learning models by the 
uh, input file itself. So we have to uh, divide the language of material science of engineering to before storing data. <clears throat> okay, so the so we make it possible to extract the parameters as a uh, supervised data for machine learning. So very uh, important section here. And uh, of course, uh, the prediction model uh, has very uh, various types of metadata. So we uh, need to store as much as possible. However, the descriptors uh, are expressed in different ways uh, by different people and need to be standardized. I mean, the here or here, uh, the how to express the, uh, for example, the test stress or tensile stress or applied stress or something is different uh, by the people. So uh, we don't uh, unify the expression of the uh, input or output port. So we cover uh, to absorb the difference by the uh, making the API, database APIs so, uh, that I'd like to talk about later. And here is the, uh, the, the graph uh, structure uh, of the database of our workflow system, okay? Uh, input port and output port uh, and the predict input port and output port and the prediction model and the relation uh, between uh, each nodes are expressed uh, as a, uh, as a an expression just like here, okay? And of course, the attribution of a PSPP or something, uh, for example, the tag or PSPP or some other attribution is applied uh, to the port information. After that, so we can connect, uh, merge, I mean merge, the, the all of the workflow data stored in our system. Okay, and uh, here is the uh, accumulated uh, uh, workflow information uh, as a graph structure databases. And uh, yes, uh, we can store the many uh, different workflows uh, by different uh, researches, but uh, we can uh, match and as a one graph or, or several uh, part graph uh, still existing, um, but so we can get uh, the very, very big graph uh, of the uh, our workflow system. This means uh, the, the each workflow, part of the work, uh, part of the graph are developed by the uh, one people. However, uh, we can search passes uh, from, uh, uh, for example, here to here by uh, passing, for example, this loot or this loot or this loot. So, uh, our worker system, I believe uh, our worker system can uh, match the, the, the wisdom of the very, very uh, different people uh, in, the, in the community, okay? And this is uh, just like an example uh, of the, how to build the workflow from existing prediction modules, okay? And this, this is very uh, complicated and, and I will show the video uh, based on the Japanese uh, language, I'm sorry. So, but I can uh, express. Uh, I can explain uh, as can as much possible. I'm sorry. And uh, once we can, uh, once one people build the, the workflow here, and uh, another workflow here, another workflow here, we can, uh, for example, uh, connect uh, workloads if the uh, input three ports and output two ports, uh, the, the information uh, is matched, okay? At this time, so we uh, assign the persistent ID for each uh, port. So we check uh, the, the ID. And so if the ID matches, so we can uh, connect the workflow each other. And this is uh, we call the suggesting uh, feature in the workflow. So in this case, uh, the thermal connectivity analysis and the uh, brittle uh, distinguish the brittle. Uh, the, uh, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> and uh, but so we don't have any workers because the the uh, very very far from the 
uh, this trip far, uh, very long distance between descriptors uh, from the uh, start point and end point. And the, if the models are stored in the system separately, so uh, our system can suggest uh, the workflow uh, as an as an candidate uh, workflow. So of course the uh, users uh, have to check uh, the, the suggested workflow is uh, uh, variable or not. However, the system can uh, understand. Uh, I'm sorry. So the, the user can understand the, the very, very small uh, workflows and the system can connect uh, by judging the P passes the ID matching uh, conditions. Uh, I, I'm sorry, uh, I, I can't explain so well. So, but uh, if the user uh, know about very small information about the uh, behavior of the material, for example, the composition and the displacement or something, but uh, if the modules are restored, uh, stored in the system, system can uh, judge the match of the ID and the, uh, if the uh, system can find the uh, usable uh, workflow, the so system can uh, suggest uh, to the users and connect uh, and build the workflow uh, as an, as an uh, proposal. And uh, this also the API is very important, we think. Uh, so. At the first stage, our uh, system version one is established uh, under five years, uh, three or three years ago, uh, five, uh, four years ago. So we are now uh, developing uh, APIs uh, to handle the features of our system. At this moment, so we have developed uh, very, very various uh, uh, APIs uh, in order to handle uh, our, feature, our system features. <coughs> So by, uh, by making an API, so user uh, can make uh, their own GUI-based application. Uh, because sometimes it is difficult to, uh, to, to, to use uh, our system if the uh, user uh, is not familiar to the computer system or something like that. So, we need to uh, establish uh, the environment to make the Jira application uh, very easily. Okay, and here is the very uh, here is the uh, workflow to analyze the uh, weld fatigue anal analyze uh, uh, <coughs> for the weld joint part. Uh, but uh, sometimes user cannot uh, use as is, so uh, we developed uh, our uh, own web-based uh, uh, GUI system. And uh, we applied, uh, for example, the inverse problem as an uh, optimization uh, of the uh, parameters of the uh, heat input condition, or uh, for example, the uh, distance be be between here or uh, distance between here or something like that. So user can easily uh, use uh, our <coughs> uh, inverse problem analysis uh, environment, okay? And after that, so we are uh, making uh, data uh, of structure because sometimes uh, uh, for the, basically for the structure material, so we can get uh, the data described uh, as a relation of process and property. Uh, for example, chemical condition and uh, temperature and uh, for example, the strength of the material or something like that. And uh, sometimes uh, we cannot get uh, the structure information, just like, uh, uh, for example, the uh, micrograph picture or uh, some dynamical information uh, of that. So uh, in order to understand the relation of PSPP, so we need uh, the structured data, but uh, uh, existing data don't uh, have, does not have such kind of data. Uh, so, uh, what we are doing is to 
uh, generate uh, is structured data by the numerical calculation or simulation technique or something like that. So uh, the, after that, so reusing the system is very important. Uh, so models, um, I mean the prediction models or uh, based on the physical models or machine learning models or something like that can be shown as an uh, alternative tools uh, in our mean system. Uh, if the uh, physical model is replaced by the machine learning model, so the calculation time uh, will be dramatically reduced. So it means uh, increasing the parameter such as speed uh, with surrogate models. So after that, uh, so user can de uh, switch to the uh, detailed model, FEM or uh, first principle model or something like that. And here's our uh, concept uh, to generate uh, the structured data. And the, the top of the figure is the conventional databases. Uh, I mean, the process property linkage is described in the databases. Uh, but I need, we need the structured data uh, in order to understand the PSP relations. So the, uh, in order to understand, uh, so we need a uh, mesoscale analysis technique, just like uh, uh, some dynamic calculation or first principle calculation or deferred the data uh, store, storing the such kind of data. And uh, or uh, merging database is very important. So today I will talk about uh, A and B. A is the how to uh, manage the, the several databases uh, this described in different uh, language, different terms. And uh, B is the uh, data search and uh, for the uh, first principle calculation or databases. And here's the uh, schematic data, uh, schematic picture uh, of the uh, aggregating many databases uh, consists of a small number of data. Data B, data, uh, database one, database two, three, four, uh, we are having, but uh, described in another, in, in, very different way. Uh, the schema is different, item name is different, metadata is different, or unit is different. So we are uh, tackling uh, by using uh, absorb this kind of uh, inconsist inconsistencies uh, by using APIs or uh, conventional dictionaries or graph databases or by using the QDT uh, developed by NASA. <laughs> so we, uh, we can, uh, adjust, arrange the same structure, uh, for example, data B or in database uh, four and DB, uh, N, and we can extract the data as one uh, in, in one picture. And here's the uh, uh, one example uh, about the relation between the yield stress and tensor strength uh, managed from five databases, okay. <laughs> Now after that, we can uh, filter or omit data uh, in order to uh, perform the machine learning technique. And uh, the structured data is very important. And here is just, an, uh, of course, and just an example of how to Im import uh, the S uh, information, structure information in the machine learning models. And, he, and this is the uh, building uh, CCT data, continuous cooling transformation data, which is very important in the uh, steel development in order to understand the, the microstructure or phase transition temperatures and something like that. At, <clears throat> in our institution, so we have uh, several hundreds of uh, CCT data. Uh, so we can, of course, uh, build to the prediction model of the CCT data uh, by using the composition or a cooling temperature, uh, cooling speed or something like that. However, uh, in this uh, calculation of the gauche olsen model, uh, which is uh, the, which is using the, uh, some dynamical uh, driving force uh, or something like that, uh, that uh, driving force uh, information of the, uh, from the gauche olsen model is incorporated in our uh, model, for example. Minamoto-san, we should, we should really start concluding because we are approaching the end of your the time that is allocated to you. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. 
uh, I will finish in, in several slides. Yes. Um, here is the uh, example of how to handle the uh, first principle data in order to calculate the, the some dynamical stable calculation. Okay, and uh, uh, thank you very much. So we have developed the, the Mint GUI, uh, which is perform, performing direct problems uh, for the structural materials. And the API will be used in order to understand the, the uh, inverse problem of optimization by uh, using the PSPP relation. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. We have time maybe for one quick question because we have here a coffee break. <laughs> and we have to start. I'm sorry. No problem, no problem. Um, maybe a quick one from, from me. So, um, I mean, in terms of, you know, compared to what was discussed in the previous talk in terms of collecting the data, the experimental data. So do you have tools that you, you know, that you have developed yourself also in connection with that? Uh, you mean the experiment connection uh, between experimental and the yes. calculation? Uh, yes, yes, we we developed uh, our, our own. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Are you sharing that, or is it uh, something that it's private? Uh, so I'm sorry, this is very Japanese uh, the cross the project. So I, I will ask to our bosses okay. to no, no, it's just that. just to know. It's just to know. Yeah. Okay. So I, I will let, let you know later. Yeah. Okay. Ah, there's a question by Ralph. Yes, Ralph. So um, I have a question to kind of which level of properties um, you envision to be able to, to treat. And particular also, if we think of device functionality, then the functionality or the property of a device is not only the property of a single material, but arises from combining specific materials together to achieve a new property. So do you foresee that sort of with your approach, you can deal with this sort of more complex level of, of, of material properties, device properties? Yes, uh, we are discussing that. Uh, however, at this moment, so as you know, this, the data of structural material is very sparse. So uh, we cannot use uh, such kind of detailed uh, meta information or uh, detailed uh, the properties. So in, that, in, in this situation, so we use this very, very uh, conventional property, uh, however, uh, yeah, if we can get much more data about the device data or some other data, so we can uh, maybe the, find out the, the, the or distinguish the differences between the properties. At this moment, we don't. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So we're going to stop here for our coffee break. And so we'll reconvene at 11.15 as originally planned. Thank you very much.
So our next talk is going to be by uh, Christoph Barbeck. Yes, so Christoph Barbeck is going to present uh, uh, a talk about big data strategies for automated high throughput research lines. So Christoph, when you are ready, you can start sharing your screen. Yeah, thank you. So my pleasure uh, to be here and to present and thank you for the kind invitation uh, to present here. Um, most popular question in Zoom is, uh, I suppose the audio quality is good. And I hope you can see me and yep. see you guys in the presentation mode. We can see you and we can hear you. So you can go ahead and okay. you can see the presentation perfectly. Perfect. Just let me clean up the screen. So good morning again. Uh, my name is Christoph Tarbets. I'm working at the Friedrich Alexander University uh, at the Department of Material Science and I'm also affiliated with the Research Center Jülich, FZJ, and I'm a director at the High Iron for high throughput methods. Um, for today, I would like to quickly introduce you in the research facility on automated research we have built in Erlangen over several institutions. And uh, then I will go to the uh, long-term challenge uh, we are working on, and this is automated, autonomous and automated research infrastructures. Uh, just briefly, uh, lots of the focus we are working is on photovoltaics. Uh, we do have an effort on the material science, uh, which is coming um, uh, from the FAU, so lots of the material and device development is done there. Uh, there is an, a cooperation with the Energy Campus Nuremberg, where we are operating a process line. And at the Helmholtz Institute Erlangen Nuremberg, we are going all the way towards the system with uh, the high throughput methods. To give you an example on how this looks like, um, at the high urn and together with the FAU, we are developing uh, a platform which we called Amanda, which is for autonomous and accelerated material and device development. And that will be the focus for today to introduce a little bit on this uh, Amanda uh, and the concept behind Amanda on doing accelerating material and device development. Right now it's automated and in the future we hope to go autonomous. Um, we, we are planning to do the same on piloting. So we don't think that we should stop uh, automation of research at the lab. We believe it, the benefit even will be higher if we can do this at the pilot level. So this is uh, what we will attack in the next couple of years uh, to introduce automated research on real production or pilot equipment, uh, which is even more challenging than uh, to do this in the lab. Uh, the focus we have behind is on the lifetime and sustainability testing. So whatever is coming from Amanda to the lab here, then should go into lifetime testing so that we are coming closer to the system's requirement and we can go uh, to full system and demonstration systems. So the last two points uh, will not be stressed for today. Uh, that is what I'm going to discuss, and I, I will give you an introduction on uh, this Amanda line. So it's nothing else than the lab with uh, a high level of automation. We have about uh, 80 to 90 separate tools we are controlling, and I'll introduce in more detail the philosophy and the concepts behind. And please keep in mind, we are not at the stage, but uh, what we would like to do in the future is to introduce the same logics, the same research logics and data quality uh, to piloting lines so that we can do the R&D level on process relevant equipment. So the overall um, objective and the philosophy we are following, uh, the traditional approach, the way we are doing research, and how our PhDs are doing research is the manual approach. So this means there's a hypothesis, there is a material, there is a process. We combine the uh, hypothesis with the material. Uh, we characterize it. We have the evaluation from the raw data to the evaluated data, and then we verify the hypothesis. The first step uh, we are planning now with the automated platforms is that 
There is the researcher, he has an hypothesis and he wants to verify it on an automated platform. And again, we go through the same loop uh, because of processing characterization. And the researcher still would do the evaluation and verifying the data quality. Uh, when we go to this autonomous platforms so or closed group research platforms, then we, uh, we, we imagine that we have an automated platform which is capable of doing such a development cycle and it can do this automated without any, any input from the outside. But the question is, from where do we get the hypothesis and the evaluation? And these would be the AI agents, which are now starting to formulate a hypothesis and then retrieve back the data, do the evaluation, and then the conclusion. So by linking these two together, uh, this would be a disclosed loop and the first step towards autonomous. Uh, we still will have, besides the, the way the AI is working, the database and evaluation, there will be the researcher. And the task of the researcher will be to pose the relevant questions and to understand the value of the outcome. So in all of these aspects, we will have the active role of the researcher, but depending on whether we are on the manual process, to the automated, to the closed loop, the role of the researcher will evolve and develop uh, on a different level. So these are the researchers. Uh, I'm speaking mainly from today. Uh, the development of line one uh, is headed by Jens Hauch uh, and uh, uh, Christian, Jari and Stefan, you can see here, uh, contributed tremendously in, in developing this. Uh, so this was a bottom-up development, which means that in the software, the controls, routines, uh, the agents, the APIs, all were written by this team. Uh, on the material evaluation uh, that is headed by Thomas, uh, and I'm going a lot on the data, he and Xiaoyan, Chao and uh, Rong developed together with Jonas on the organic solar cells and the head behind the development of the models and the MLNI algorithm is, is Larry and uh, that is uh, what I'm referring for today. Uh, let me also acknowledge funding from different projects and I want to highlight that part of the work we're doing is under the Fermat uh, proposal for uh, we are in the, the research area E uh, for the optoelectronics. So this also explains why today I'm, I'm speaking a lot about optoelectronic devices and characterizations. Uh, one of the material systems which is fascinating for us uh, for quite a while actually is this organic photovoltaics. Uh, it's a highly, highly active research field. There are efficiency records from probably every other month. So there are lifetime records, uh, but it's still in the research. It's not really in the market. And the idea is what is missing to get such a, a very promising technology. Uh, what do we miss to get this on the market and can we accelerate this? Uh, let me briefly introduce you to the organic photovoltaics. Uh, the first papers came out in 1995 uh, uh, from the uh, Santa Barbara group from Ellen Higa. And uh, the, the very important uh, observation, which was done even a little earlier by Serda Sarachivci and Ellen Higa, was that when you add a fullerene to a Pi conjugated uh, semiconductor, uh, you can get a very fast charge transfer. Now, for anyone working in semiconductors, you would say this is not surprising. It is surprising for the organics because the pi conjugated systems are excitonic and exciton binding energy in the order of maybe a few hundred milli electron volt. So the free charge generation rate in a pristine material is below 0.1%. Now, when you mix two semiconductors with preferential potential differences, you can get a charge transfer, which has a quantum efficiency of uh, up to 100%. And we could verify why this is the case. And the case is you see in the transient pump probe spectra, this is the case because it's, it's really fast. So you can see here, this is the trace where the CT is kicking in. Uh, and it's happening at a time delay of some tens of a second. So it's very fast, and this is the reason why it is so efficient. Now, this we can regard as a molecular diode. Now, a molecular diode is a great piece for a solar cell, but you have to imagine a solar cell is a macroscopic device. So this means you have to understand how to, 
how to arrange uh, and how to order and how to distribute these molecular diets uh, in the bike. And uh, that was uh, for, for quite a while, it was not understood that the most homogeneous mixing is actually a disadvantage because the more you mix these two systems, the more you have recommendation and losses. And only when you start to get a phase separation between the systems, uh, and this was pioneered by Jean Chagin uh, almost 20 years ago. Uh, only if you get this phase separation, which you can see here also by the AFM images, then you create domains and these domains may have a purity and the purity and the size of the domains is actually determining the performance. So this is the complexity of the system we are talking about. We have a phase A, which is an acceptor, and we may have a phase B, which is here the donor phase. Light is coming in, <clears throat> we excite light and it's an exciton. It's not a free carrier, this exciton can diffuse to the interface. And here, this line of the interface between these two domains, uh, we will get the splitting of the charge. You have then the positive carriers and afterwards the transport, the electronic transport will happen in the respective phases, the electrons and the holes here. So you, you see that we have a very complex microstructure far away from what we are used on crystal and semiconductors. We have disordered systems with domain sizes within the axon diffusion lengths, which are a few nanometers to a few tens of nanometers. And we really have to control them. Like one nanometer domain size, no performance, 100 nanometer domain size, again, no performance. So we have to be able to influence that. That is the reason why organics have been developing a little slow, I would say. There was a slow trace in the beginning. And most recently, we have seen a strong development going up here, thanks to a new class of materials. And by today, the efficiencies are in the order of 20%. You can see here still a little less than the inorganic solar cells, but 20% is it's the benchmark for where you would think that the solar technology has may get a chance on the market. So um, why we are not on the market with the solar cells is that you can look at the annual table here with these performance, it's record efficiency cells, which are typically fairly small. And the product is a module, <clears throat> not a single solar cell, which is should be fairly large. And you can see between the cells and the modules, there's just a little bit of a drop, but when it goes to an industrial product and there's significant drop. And if you are asking us uh, where we should start with the acceleration of a material science, then it's not so much in this regime, but it's probably more in this regime. And this explains why Amanda I'm introducing today, this is working here in that regime, but the pilot line I was showing you in the second slides in the beginning, this would be working in this regime. And actually we think that acceleration at the higher tier level is even more beneficial, but we are not at the stage there. So let me show you one of the state of the art systems, which I take as a proxy to introduce in our uh, automation and data strategy. Uh, that was a uh, great work by Feng Liu and Ming Zhang, and uh, they were taking four materials, two P-type semiconductors, two N-type semiconductors. So they had a quaternary blend and they could show indeed by, by finding the right ratios of mixing and the right processing conditions, they could get an improved performance from 14 to almost 18%. And they also so slightly, slightly better stability, not tremendous better stability. Red is the original, blue is that quaternary, but at least from the trend, it, it looked a little more stable. Uh, so that means that the material science now has to deal at least with quaternary systems. So let me make a break here and explain you the complexity of quaternary systems for materials invention. Um, the time it takes uh, a, a new material from, from the early stages to the market, actually, the way we understand it is slowing down. Compared to silicon, <clears throat> and we can discuss what silicon, the invention of silicon was, probably the testimonial paper from the Bell Labs in 1954. Uh, it's, it's about 25 years until 
this this technology was on the megawatt level, right? And we would now by today, a megawatt level is not a lot. The pilot line I showed you in our labs has a megawatt level. Uh, silicon is not the only one. If you go to optoelectronics, gallium nitride, it's it's not so different. Let's let's suggest that 1972 was the first demonstration of electronomancy and gallium nitride. It was discussed before that quite a while. And the first bright LEDs on the market were between 93, 94. So we might think about 20, 22, 24, 26 years again. So that's the time it takes. And if you, if you analyze why it's so complicated from a new material on a new material composite towards a finalized product, we have to imagine that in the early stages, the way we do material research is sequential. In the early stages, we have material innovation. Then we go to the device. Then we go to a process optimization. Then we go to lifetime. Then we go to scale up. And if you fail at any of the stages, like in the process optimization or in the lifetime optimization, you have to go back to the beginning. Now, that's for a single material. If you now take ternary, quaternary, quintenary plants, if either of those materials is failing, you have to go back. So you understand the complexity. What we are missing is we need a predictive model which can take a molecular motive or a, a chemical structure and and we, we need predictive models which can translate a motive into a product property. In the case of solar cells, this would be the cost, the lifetime, the efficiency. So that is the challenge we are after. Coming back to the quaternary uh, systems, how complicated can that be? So let's assume just these four quaternary, the quaternary systems with four semiconductors I mentioned before. If you mix them in a 10 weight percent regimes, you're getting a thousand composites. That's just the composite. If you take into account the process, the different solvents, the annealing, the concentration ratios, the film, uh, thin film coding procedures, and you just assume like a hundred variations for each composite, we have a hundred thousand layers. Now, that's not a solar cell. If you go to the solar cell, we need the interfaces, we need the electrode, we need the charge extraction layers. Again, just 100 variations for one of these layers, and we are at 10 million devices. Uh, 10 million devices is beyond what we could do by human operation. And actually, it's also beyond what we can do by robot operation. So this means that the high throughput concept I'm proposing will not be enough in order to manage the full optimization of such complex systems. What we need would be something which can abbreviate here from the material to the final product. And we would like to do this with a couple of thousand experiments, which can be done in a day, in a days, rather than a 10 million experiments. So this is the way we assigned Amanda. So what is Amanda? Amanda is a set of hardware, like spin coder, hot plates, transport robots, evaporators, so everything which you have in the lab and it's integrated in the Cloudbook system. Uh, Amanda is controlled by software. Mainly it's a scheduling robot, uh, which is uh, uh, deciding on the sequence of uh, running a process. Uh, the software is controlling the hardware. There's also an interface to a database you will see and all the input from our sensors and the remote access will go into the control. Uh, we have an interface for computation, which is then the reach out to the machine learning agents, uh, uh, which you need later. So the user itself right now can interact over a graphical user interface where we have the planning and the analysis, or we see the analysis and what we decide on the graphical user interface is going into a control. And all the data we get from here and all the data we get from here over in here is going into a database and will be made accessible by APIs. So this is kind of the sketch we have on the database uh, and the way we extract it currently. Uh, Amanda, the line one is, is not finished. So we are very flexible here in adding further tools we are developing together with companies like spin coding robots and there will be a family of these hardware platforms which you can integrate and then use very versatile in anything which is about thin film processing, multi-layer processing, and device, optoelectronic device engineering. Uh, so that is what Amanda is doing. And on an image from the lab, it's as simple as that. We have the glove boxes. Uh, we have, I, I'll introduce you the sequences on the glove boxes in a second. We have metallization, we have the control desk. 
uh, and all we need in order to fully optimize the devices in this one lab under inert atmosphere. Uh, in the detail, if you go to the first box, uh, which is the solution preparation, what we have there are pipetting robots. The pipetting robots just are doing mixing, they prepare stock solutions, they can do the weighing of powders, uh, they can do shaking, they have a quality control on the stability of the solutions. Everything we do in solutions in the solvent atmosphere is done here. After that, there's a SCAGA robot, which is transferring the solutions from here into the box two. Uh, in the box two, what we are doing is we can dilute the solutions, the master solutions, the stock solutions into, uh, into, the, um, uh, into the final ready-to-go spin coding solutions. But we can do the spin coding of the layers. Um, I'll show you in a second. Uh, how we do this, uh, if I switch this off. Uh, we can do the spin coding uh, of the layers. We can do a post treatment. Uh, we have all the quality control there by optical spectroscopy, by photos, we can do thermal annealing. So all what you otherwise would do in the lab and after we are finished with the spin coding, we have the samples in the box and we move them over here to box three. And in box three, we have uh, all the characterization. We finish the device by metallization. Uh, you see here the image of our testing bench uh, where we can do JV measurements in under light, in the dark. We can move the carriers, we can age them, we can post-treat them, uh, and we can characterize them. So that's uh, what we have integrated in Amanda. And the way we store the data, it's an identity and event-based database. So Whatever we are generating, whether it's a process, a manipulation, a stock solution, or an image, this is an event. And we start a process with a task for a specific event, which is usually coordinated with a substrate. And whenever we do anything with the substrate, uh, it's getting into an app. And this means we have an event, an ID going into an event. And after this event, we get the metadata, the process data, and this gives a new identity. Okay, and this means in our sequence plan, taking a photo manipulates the ID from one to the next ID, measuring the absorption, doing the evaporation, but whatever it is, this is completely free, always creates a new ID, and in the ID, we are storing all the metadata. And uh, the analysis we are using right now is the image, uh, it's uh, optical spectroscopy, it's the electric data, JV data, and it's stability data. This is the tool set of data we are currently working together with the process and the metadata. So let's say the high throughput is the horsepower of our system, uh, but you know that a car is only as good as the assistance system. So let me briefly talk about the system systems and the characterization. The challenge we have is the complexity of uh, organic photovoltaics. So uh, for instance, if you take a degradation curve of a cell, which is good in the beginning and we just degraded after 24 hours. Usually we have to go for very difficult uh, investigations like uh, electron microscopy, XPS, synchrotron facilities to understand microstructure evolution. And after these weeks of evolution, we may get an image. So this is not compatible to the way the line one Amanda is working. We need this within minutes and hours and we need agents in order to extract uh, this information. So. We need different ways to do this. The paradigm change we are proposing here is we have to fix the target quantities in solar cells. It would be efficiency, stability, whatever you think is relevant. And you have to clarify the input parameters, which in our case are the materials, the chemical motives, they can be parameterized, the composition, the processing parameters. Now the challenge is can we get the link from the processing parameters to the target properties? And usually, no, this link doesn't exist. It's not known, it doesn't exist, we don't understand it. It's just not there. So this is the reason why we usually go over the system properties. So we take the TM, we take the GVEX, we take all these measurements and create the sys insight into the material properties. And then we hope from these material properties we can build the relation to the target properties. And this part here is where we lose weeks of uh, investigation. So this doesn't work to an inline system. So we have to skip it. And what we're currently focusing on is we are taking 
proxy features and uh, the most prominent proxy we are using currently are optical features. We know that these optical features are attractive because we can collect them fast, but it's not clear whether there's a direct relation or a linear relation or even a nonlinear relation between these optical features to the target quantities. If it would be, then this would be a major advantage because taking an optical spectrum is seconds and the translation then with the AI agents might be also very fast. So this is the question, can you find such proxies in order to accelerate? The model uh, which is uh, behind uh, these proxies is uh, spectral decomposition. So our semiconductors have a specific absorption. And if we have a blend of semiconductors, we can deconvolute them. You see here material A, material B. Uh, and if you are in, in the optical spectroscopy of soft metals, you will see immediately there are crystalline ordered peaks. There are more amorphous fractions. So this is what we are deconvoluting. You see here the vapronic evolution of the different spectrum. Overall, we are regarding such an absorption spectrum as a matrix of a basis set, which is the pristine crystalline, the pristine amorphous, the pristine higher order structure times uh, the spectral weight vectors. And if we are able to translate uh, or to fit such a matrix uh, system, or actually to fit the, to invert the matrix of this equation, we can describe the spectrum. So we are getting a parametrix and there is a lot of physics behind. And we can couple this by evaluating then the fit of the spectrum. For instance, electronic vibrational coupling has a direct uh, causal path to your and Ruiz factor. So this is the system. The order between the, the short range order in a uh, dispersed system can be analyzed by the spinal relations and has a direct uh, uh, link to the ratio of the order than the morphos. Uh, the energy of the excitons, uh, the local environment like polarizability, the torsion and twist, uh, these are system properties which are not always direct. So we might get here an endogenous parameter selection, like uh, the polarizability might correlate with the center of the uh, crystalline energy, but also with the absorption strengths. So we have there deconvolution, which we need to do with a multi experimental parameter fit. Uh, once we would have this, and we have started to do this, we get uh, clear optical models for each of these materials. And by today, we have developed about 30 materials for donor and acceptors, and we have fully established them in an optical model, which is linked to the physical properties. Now, that is the traditional way we would start now to improve a material system. So we understand there are now processing parameters, and the processing parameters might be the concentration, the film formation, the thermal annealing, the treatment. And then in the multi-scale modeling, we would go forward with these, and we have a predictive model based on a thermodynamics or a phase field model, which is going to give us insight in the morphology. The morphology, uh, like the order, the disorder, the domain size is the ratio of crystalline to amorphous. Uh, we can cross calibrate with our optical data, and then we take a drift diffusion simulation, and uh, whatever our figure of merit would be, efficiency or cost, we might be able to predict this. So this means that over this optical model, we get from the process material directly uh, to our target property. Uh, still, this requires a lot of uh, the simulation, right? So the final question then is, if we have this high throughput and the agents, the AI agents, which do the spectral modeling and the molecular modeling, uh, they can run the car, but we have to figure out who is the driver. And this is currently what we are working on. And this is the step from highly automated to autonomous. So Amanda is capable of doing UVVIS JV data, and it can vary the processing parameter. So on the one hand, we have the spectral agents we are training so that we get the physical biased information and together with the JV data, and we can take, for instance, a Gaussian predictive model and then get a proxy to the target, this figure of merit we have here, which we want to predict. On the other side, Amanda, with uh, getting the JV data, we can directly calculate from the JV data this figure of merit. And then we can go to a patient optimization. And the patient optimizer would start this autonomous loop 
uh, which is then optimizing the process properties. And the process properties, again, would go back to the JV data or the sample making. So we would get a closed loop here as well for an autonomous optimization. But keep in mind, the major advantage of the spectral agent is that we also that we always will have the physics domain knowledge behind the optimization of the patient. So we always know what the patient would be doing uh, thanks to the optical model. And we have a fair chance at some time that we build the link directly from the process parameters to the optical model back to the patient. So that at some time we hope we even don't have to make a device but we can do this optimization with a single, single, simple thin film absorption spectrum. Okay, so let me give you a few examples on where we are and which, uh, why we are using in Bayesian. And what are the, uh, the uh, AI methods we are using? In, in one of a different group in our institute, uh, these people are doing outdoor electroluminescence measurements uh, from solar modules. And you see here like a movie or images from solar modules, uh, we deconvolute them into single modules. So we go from a movie into single images, we categorize them, we recognize uh, what is a single module. And from this model, we are then training uh, uh, or we are taking a deep learning approach. Uh, and we have done this for a few hundred of modules. We had the uh, defect um, class classification, uh, and uh, we could measure the efficiency and we trained a deep learning model. And at the end, we got extremely good predictive power uh, for these modules. Uh, we were limited to cracks because the 600 modules only had, uh, as the only defect, a crack, uh, uh, as, or as the leading effect, a crack. But you see what can be done. Now, these systems of deep learning would be very difficult to translate over to our material systems. It starts with the parameterization of materials, but also from the image recognition, we are not at the stage that we can provide research data as images. We, we still have rather lists or tables than images. We may change it in, a, in some time, but right now it's lists and tables. So this brings me back to why we are using currently the physics-based learning um, in order to accelerate. And as an example of what is capable of doing by today, I'll show you again this material. This is a donor, a state-of-the-art donor. This is the acceptor. So we have this donor acceptor type bulk junction we are mixing. And on the line one, we made like 120 process variations. We varied the active layer in the donor acceptor ratio, the spin speed, the annealing, the additives. We varied the interfaces here. We varied the layer and interface thickness. This was all what Amanda and line one was doing. We were taking the photographs, the UV Vis data, TAV, the UV Vis data, we ran into the spectral deconvolution. We had 12 parameters, and these 12 parameters from the spectral deconvolution we correlated with these device data here in the Gaussian in order to see whether we can get predictive of the target properties. So this is how it looks like. Uh, here you see a few variations we did, the mixing ratios, the concentration, uh, the annealing temperature, the uh, annealing temperature of the EPL. You can see there's sometimes no influence, as you see here, on the active layer spin speed. Sometimes the donor acceptor ratio, there is a clear difference. The ETL, there might be a huge difference. And all of these changes we expect to be mimicked in the absorption spectrum. We can see the evolution of the absorption spectrum. Like here in the spin speed, there's not so much change here, but there's a significant change here, right? So this is going to this, into this spectrum, uh, spectral model we have. And with this, we trained on the efficiency and the fill factor of the solar cell. And I'm just highlighting here the training data on the predicted efficiency versus the measured efficiency. Uh, and you can see actually we get a surprisingly good score. The score is almost fantastic if you do this for the VOC, which is describing the potentials of the materials, but also for the efficiency, it's from the first run, it was actually surprising. And uh, in between we are getting even better relations uh, with more data. Uh, beyond that, we also do understand the prediction. So by um, target analysis of the critical parameters, we can clearly correlate higher efficiencies with specific material properties, like enhanced crystallinity of the one phase, 
reduce the amorphous regimes of the other phase, the peak position of one of the phases, so we, we really understand which molecular parameter is influencing the overall performance. This is the performance. Even more challenging was the question, will we be able uh, to predict lifetime? So we took these devices and we subjected them to a continuous degradation run under 50 hours of intense light. And then again, we did the same spectral modeling. Now you can see for the single devices, degradation means time zero performance, and it can go down to like 80%, 60% of the performance, depending on the processing conditions. And again, we were taking the optical model, we fit it to Gaussian progression, and again, you can see, we get surprised, in my point of view, surprising good predictive power. It wasn't clear to me that the stability, inherent stability, is information which is hidden behind the optical deconvoluted spectrum. Now, you may wonder, is this very specific for just organics? Or are these physics-based models, can we apply them for other systems as well? And uh, we're getting more and more experience. We have translated this to perovskite thin layers, to perovskite cells. Uh, we can use it for solubility parameters. Uh, we can use it for layer-by-layer uh, layer, uh, layer layer processing photovoltaic. So we, we are collecting more information that this might be this proxy-based uh, optical parameter analysis might be indeed helpful to bridge from molecular structures to final device performance. Now, uh, at the end, uh, let me also highlight the complexity behind, behind the autonomous optimization. What I showed you before was not autonomous, this was highly automated with AI agents. On the autonomous side, we are currently exploring and we picked up these quaternary systems from uh, two or three donors and two acceptors uh, in order to find an optimum. I, I told you before, optimizing a quaternary would require 10 million uh, structures, which we cannot do. Uh, so we need uh, more sophisticated parties. So specifically, the question we have been asking here is, what is the most stable quaternary composite against photooxidation? So we took these materials, we put them onto a robot, the robot was making samples, the samples were subject to an UV degradation, and then we take the UV vis data before and after, and the ratio between this was the stability ratio. And we were comparing two approaches, the one was a high throughput approach. Please keep in mind, no process variations, just thin film variations. So this means for a quaternary, we need 10, uh, we need a 1000 variations at the 10% steps. And in parallel, we took a Bayesian optimizer to do this autonomous optimization. So for the high throughput experiment, this is how it looks like, 2000 samples for two different systems of the quaternary were fabricated and tested in less than a week. So this is the power of uh, automation in, in material science. And if you analyze them, you get a very clear phase diagram. Uh, you see here, for instance, high stability, you get at the points here, you have a clear regime of destability here. One component was not a good choice. This polymer really uh, reduces the stability. So th this is what you immediately see from this high throughput experiment. And you would think with this thousand uh, samples, uh, this was doable, and we have the full information and the full understanding behind. In contrast to that, uh, the Bayesian optimizer um, was using about 40 to 50 variations to find the optimum compositions with the highest stability. You see here the comparison. This is the high throughput screen. All the red dots are data points. And you see the self-driving approach from the autonomous approach from the Bayesian which was exploring here in the beginning with the blue, but fairly quickly consolidated here at the lowest level and actually even found uh, the highest, uh, the most stable composition. So here the autonomous testing, really the autonomous strategy really seems to pay off. Uh, and uh, as well as in, in the absolute, uh, the best, the optimum, finding the optimum, but also in the material we used, but uh, the samples per day we could do, uh, the solvents we needed, and the number of experiments it took us in order 
to find the optimum, it was by a factor of 30 to 40 faster uh, for optimizing the system. So I believe this is very promising as an outlook on how the high, this automation with high throughput and autonomous uh, routines can work together hand in hand in order to accelerate. Now, that was a lot of device discussion. Uh, let me come back to our long-term vision and outlook. And this is work that Jen Chang and Anastasia are currently doing. They are uh, experts in the chemistry and synthetics. And what I've been discussing in this optimization loop was when you start with the material and you optimize the film, you have the closed loop optimization, then the films are optimized and then you go to the device, you have the closed loop device optimization, then you go to the global product properties and then you feed this back and in our case it would be here because the material is given. Now, how exciting would it be if we can do the same with the material? That we would have a robot which is synthesized, so let me say first an agent which is simulating materials. We take physics domain knowledge, reduce the number, then we go to the synthesis of the materials, and then these materials are coming to this stage. Now, if we follow on the structure, the Bayesian optimizer now would give feedback directly on the structure of the materials. This means we could ask questions like not can you make the best solar cell out of the material? But we might be able in the future to ask questions, can you synthesize and can you design the best possible material for an application? Now, keep in mind, this is an outlook and we are pretty far away from having any closed loops there. But what we are capable of doing is, uh, thanks to great input from, from colleagues on material synthesis, uh, we have established uh, an automated process based on microrefraction for the media library, which has about a million of different structures you can synthesize. And we've picked up the first of them uh, in an automated process. And these materials are white band with semiconductors. We use them as interface materials for perovskites. So we use them here as an HTM for the perovskites. And uh, by today, we have synthesized about an 80 to 100 materials automated and sent it further into the device characterization. So we are closing right now the loop and the automation from the synthesis to the device. And if this is working, we hope we will be able to do the same also in an autonomous way. So that's it from my side. I hope I wasn't too much out of time. Uh, and uh, if there's still time for questions or if there are any questions, I, I, I'm very happy to answer them. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. I'm looking around, is there any question? Yes, Stefan. In the beginning of your presentation, you showed this long vision with the different roles for the researcher. And what I could not understand, what is the difference between the researcher formulating a hypothesis at the very beginning of the timeline yeah. and the researcher formulating a question at the end of your timeline? So what's the difference between hypothesis and question? Thank you. Yeah, very good point. Hypothesis is the how to do something. Uh, and the question would be to define. Uh, so a simple question in our case would be, uh, how does the best solar cell look like? Or a question better, better, actually better formulated would be, if you talk to line one, can you make the best possible solar cell? So we would only define the objectives, the long-term targets, and this definition of the targets, it's not trivial. Uh, so because you have to break down what does best possible solar cell mean. But uh, in the stage of automated research process, <clears throat> we, would, uh, uh, we would ask the question, uh, we, we would make a pre-formulation of the hypothesis, <clears throat> and this means we either would have to give the materials, define the processes, confine the parameter space and then ask, how can you make the best possible uh, device within this confined parameter process, well assuming that we have an idea on what might be relevant parameters. Okay, I, I have a, one question too. So you excluded, I don't know if it was because you, you tried that, 
to go directly from the parameters of the, the process to the, you know, to some kind of indicator of the performance, is that because there is not enough data to have some kind of, you know, machine learn model out of that? Um, well, the, no, no, uh, sorry, I, I, I might have been unclear here. Let me verify that. So what, what, what we are working on is we, we want to go from here, this chemical motif, like the structure of the molecule towards a device parameter. And this would mean we, we just look at the molecule and you immediately can tell this will have a specific efficiency. Now, there have been great efforts from, uh, from the Harvard Clean Energy Project trying to do these calculations. The complexity in our system was that the efficiency, it of course is related to the chemical structure. But what is really dominating efficiency is the local microstructure. And by today, we do not have any tools being capable of doing a fast and reliable prediction of a microstructure. Even in the molecular dynamics simulation, it's, it's still difficult. It's, people are doing great jobs there and coming closer. But as long as we have the microstructure of a realistic thin film in between, this is complicating so much. If you would have a single crystal, it would be straightforward. But for disordered systems or mixed crystalline amorphous systems, this is so difficult. And this is the reason why we have to go over these proxy optical features. Okay, thank you. Questions uh, from the chat, I don't see any. So maybe we can thank uh, Christoph uh, again, and then we can uh, move to our global discussion about the, <clears throat> the whole session. Um, I don't know if all the speakers are still there. So um, maybe to, to, to start the, the discussion, I mean, I, I could ask Christoph um, something related to what was presented by, um, by Ralph about the, the, the storage of the, the data. So in, in, in your case, do you have some automatic procedure to uh, capture the data, to store them and to analyze them? Yeah. Um, uh, yes, uh, all the data we have, uh, all the data and the metadata are all stored. Uh, we are still working on the structure of the database. Uh, but the good thing is, first of all, the data are stored. So we don't lose any of the data. Uh, we also store the machine status. We store environmental conditions. Uh, we store the sequence of uh, the machine um, the, 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 machine, uh, the, the, the machine procedures. Uh, so all of this data is stored and uh, we are organizing this now in the database in this what I called event-based database, which is, is not doing anything else than here's a sample. And when you do anything with the sample, like a measurement, we create a new idea for, ID for the sample and we find all the data related to this idea. So we, we have a closed sequence where we can follow the history of any sample with all the metadata. Uh, what we have to learn now is how to handle all this data. So by today, we create much more data than we can evaluate. We develop these optical agents, these this agents uh, for the optical modeling. But this is only taking advantage of the direct data. But today, we are not taking into account the metadata or the hidden data uh, for our modeling. So this is still not clear how we can take benefit from these data. There was a question at the previous uh, um, session to, to see whether um, the, the vendors could be, you know, kind of challenged in such a way that we define some kind of standards uh, to, to collect these metadata. Have you done some steps in, in such a direction or in your case, did you do something to collect those metadata? Mm -hmm. uh, all our, so uh, this was a decision from the beginning. We are only use uh, equipment and tools, which is completely open. Uh, all the software is controlled by us. So we are writing the software we are writing the APIs, so we own all the data and uh, we can store all the data. Um, an advantage in our system is that the characterization is 
actually much, much easier than uh, compared to the situation Ralph has. Uh, if we measure a solar cell, all we need to make sure it's reproducible, we need a set of calibrated light sources and uh, calibrated solar cells. The same for absorption measurements. We do this regular calibration. If one of our solar simulators is damaged, we take the next one, calibrate it, and can continue. Um, it's a little more complex than I said, uh, because we have to take into account homogeneity and temperature distribution, but that is all we can measure. So uh, this, this makes our life, I believe, much easier. So far, we do not have very complex uh, research uh, infrastructure, which we cannot control. Thank you. I see that there's a question by Matthew Evans. Matthew, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Okay, I'm going to ask the question if Matthew's not there. So how general is the data, data management framework used by Amanda? How much could be reused by a new automated lab or even a low throughput lab? I guess this question can be applied to many of the speakers. Mm -hmm. uh, good point. Uh, uh, we, are, we are setting up the database behind in close cooperation with our colleagues at the Helmholtz Research Society. So we have colleagues in, in Jülich, in Berlin, and in Karlsruhe, uh, who are all doing uh, solar cell development. And I believe one of the first tests will be to how, how well this database is really working if we spread it within these sites. Uh, so that might be something which could start maybe late next year, uh, that we will uh, open up this database to others who are experiencing solar cells. And if this is working, we may even think about other applications. Okay. Don't see any other questions in the chat nor in the audience. Maybe we can uh, leave it here and uh, we will reconvene then at, uh, at 2 p.m. this afternoon for uh, the um, session about experimental and hybrid databases. Thank you all very much. Thank you.
slowly starts. Yes. So, is there anything to announce from your side, Jean Marco? No, we have just been joined by uh, Elias Vlich. And uh, so there's a few more people here. Okay, then um, I would like to start this afternoon session and welcome everyone who has joined us here. My name is Claudia Draxel. <clears throat> I have the pleasure to chair this session and also spend a few minutes to give you an overview of my, I would so personally view on where the field uh, is that we're talking about. And um, in that sense, I have prepared just a few slides to introduce the topic of experimental and hybrid databases. So we have seen already um, a few talks on these topics in the morning session, but we're going to have a few more in this afternoon. And as I said, I'd like to give you my personal summary about where we are uh, in, in this field. So the first question is, of course, is why do we need databases in experimental or in material science in general? And I think the, the answer is pretty clear. Materials are everywhere, anywhere in our society, whatever we touch or we do, we're somehow concerned with materials. And it's also clear that we need to get better and we need to get faster to the market in order to solve our issues that we have in terms of energy, environment, and, and, and other things. So the question is how do we approach this? And I think a very typical and very a popular approach is high throughput screening. So again, we had already some examples in the morning. Um, high throughput screening um, applies to both theory and experiment. Maybe, it, uh, well, it started in experiment actually, but maybe it's more popular in theory because we can dream up um, any material on the computer and see what, what comes out and what the properties are. But in particular, experimental high throughput screening is getting more and more popular as well. The idea is that you define the properties you're interested in, and then you take as many materials you like, and then you see where you get uh, in this in this funnel whether this material fulfills these properties or whether they drop out somewhere. So, and of course, this creates a lot of materials either by synthesis or by experimental or by theoretical investigations, and these uh, are typically harvested then in, in databases or the information about that. So in that sense, if you combine this why and this how, then uh, we see that databases are very often established in connection to high throughput screening. Um, other databases are established because laboratories like to organize their own data. Or a third category could be that research groups um, do this effort just for their own research to get organized and also to, to harvest the data that they have or, have, or it simply could be a combination uh, of all of this. Right? So going beyond why and how, what does this mean now for our field? Uh, so that means that we have probably a lot of Databases, they serve different purposes, depending on who was behind and what the purpose was of, of starting high throughput screening or, or work in the group. Uh, many of such databases exist. They're very big ones. They're well known. Uh, not so many, in fact, in experiment, because many of these experimental databases are not open or probably not yet open. So I'm aware of quite a few who are right now established but uh, are not open to the public yet. And most of them uh, don't accept data from outside. So I think it's pretty, uh, pretty human that, that people like to stay in their realm because if you accept data from outside and you have to uh, live a, a lot of uncertainties and issues that I'm going to address in the next, uh, next two, three minutes. So in fact, um, what are crucial issues for maximizing the benefits of databases? And I like to address two issues, two examples here. One is metadata. So the description of data without no doubt is crucial in order to exploit data properly. And very often these metadata are either not defined or they are lost. So additional information is lost. So just think about you perform an experiment, then 
we may take down some notes on under which conditions this experiment has been uh, has been um, taken or likewise this applies also to the synthesis of samples or to the uh, to building an apparatus very often also there are failures so um, the results are not as expected so this goes automatically away um, but at the end of, of such an investigation, typically a paper is published, but whatever has been taken down uh, aside is typically forgotten. So this goes to the trash. And in fact, they, I think there are many data around on this globe where people keep the data because uh, data need to be kept, because the funding agency, for instance, tells to do so. But maybe these data are of little value if they're not properly um, annotated. So it's crucially important that all this data that are stored somewhere uh, are indeed very well um, characterized by metadata. So this is a very big issue and this is a lot of work if you want to do it properly. The other issue uh, concerns um, fairness and this in particular the eye in fear. So the interoperability is a particular issue. And I always show the same example, but I think it's really striking. So this is the optical spectra of silver. Right? So silver is a very simple material, it just has one atom in the unit cell. It's a noble metal, so it should behave uh, in a noble way, put it like this. But if you look at this spectra, you can't understand that they obviously uh, all refer to the same material. Because in the ideal world, if 1,000 people measure the same thing on the same material, you should get 1,000 times the same measurement. And this is definitely not the case. So it's not only that the intensities, the magnitude is very different between different experiments, but also the peak positions, they're off by not only milli electron volts, or tens of an electron volt, but even electron volts. So obviously, Either we don't deal with the same material, that means the sample quality and uh, is, is crucially important, um, or the measurement has been taken under different conditions. And so overall, if you look into such data, we realize that there is a lot of veracity and uncertainty in this data. And this uncertainty may come from, let's say, the sample quality, the way we measure, for instance, under UHV conditions or not, is the contamination or the defects inside. But there's also something that is known as the term variety in, in the for v of big data. And in this case, variety means that you can measure the same thing with different means. So for instance, for getting the dielectric function that is proposed here, you can use ellipsometry, absorption, reflectance, spectroscopy, or even electron loss spectroscopy. Interestingly, none of these probes gives you this uh, property directly. So there's always transformation steps involved. And um, that's why there's this not only adds to variety, but again, to veracity, to the uncertainty in data. And also there's needless to say that you can also compute this on many different, uh, different levels. So now if you go back to our databases, what are the pros and the cons, what we can learn from this in relation to what we have heard before. So if we just consider high throughput databases, then data are typically homogeneous because they all the data have been taken under the same conditions or have been computed with the same computational means. So there is no issue of interoperability. However, metadata still are crucial, and uh, but the owners of these databases, they are very free to define file formats and, uh, and metadata according to their wishes and according to their needs. Right? That's uh, one thing. However, if you like to bring data together from different sources, this starts to be, uh, become a burden. So different data from different sources, of course, are great because this allows us to go uh, beyond the individual goals. Uh, so we can screen a large martial material space and employ artificial intelligence techniques. But for this, we need to make sure that data interoperable. So in that sense, this highlights the needs for common standards. Either we come on with common standards for file formats and definitions of metadata, or we need to convert them from one database to the other, which is probably the more practical uh, thing. 
And we also need to assess data quality, otherwise we would compare apples and pears if we bring together data from different uh, sources. So, and this brings me now to our program. Um, I have mentioned before that uh, yeah, databases are created under different conditions and uh, our speakers reflect these different situations, I think, very well. Uh, so we have Christoph Koch, Volker Blum and Andrei Zakutayev. And I start with uh, the, the latest one and the last one in the program, Andrei Zakutayev from NREL. Uh, he is one of the proponent, proponents or uh, a big uh, key person behind the high throughput experimental database that's built up and hosted by NREL, so probably for the purpose of getting the, the data organized in their own lab, but of course also to find uh, materials for certain purposes. Uh, a different situation, uh, I guess Volker Blum is going to talk about. Uh, he is one of the uh, persons behind hybrid three and hybrid is really a hybrid database so it not only hosts experimental data but also theoretical data and also data from literature so i'm also curious what uh, what uh, we hear about this i'm not going to tell more because this is the topic of the talk anyway and last but not least um, christoph koch who is not establishing a database by himself but he is more about uh, verification of uh, a certain instrument or a certain technique, which is electron microscopy in this case. And he's one of the first persons to add experimental data to the NOMAD database that so far has been a theoretical database. And yeah, I think we, we are ready to start. Or Christoph is already ready to start. So he will talk about structuring, analyzing and harvesting big data and material science electron microscopy. And welcome, Christoph, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Claudia. I think, oh, okay, now I will try to share my screen. And, um, okay, ah, sorry, I can go back. Sorry for this. Um, I wanted to share the screen here. Okay, I hope this is the one that you see right now. Good, yeah, so I, I'm actually very happy for this introduction that Claudia just gave and also for the talks of this morning because they really allow me to not have to explain everything that um, I would otherwise have to explain, but jump right into um, what I wanted to talk about. And as Claudia has said, I do not, or we do not, or my group does not try to create its own database, but we like to contribute to this project um, that was mentioned. And that is this, this fair much project here um, that uh, Claudia is the spokesperson of. Um, but I will say a little bit more on this uh, in a minute. But the focus will be, as the title already says, on material science electron microscopy. I focus on material science electron microscopy because there's also life science microscopy, which is a different universe. And um, there's also different um, databases and so on that I won't talk about now. Okay, so yeah, what is the motivation um, and what are the obstacles for fair data infrastructure in experimental material science? Of course, um, a number of motivations have already been mentioned and they have been established already when this acronym FAIR was established. Um, we all want to share um, because we benefit from it, um, because we can re reuse also other people's data, of course. Um, and one of the applications for that is um, that we can train artificial neural networks um, to somehow uh, annotate or interpret data for us. Um, and this interpretation is often then based, of course, also on already existing data. And for that, um, we need these databases that, of course, um, have well annotated data in them. And you can obtain this. Um, Claudia has mentioned this example already. Um, for example, by high throughput combinatorial experiments, and we've heard a nice uh, talk in the morning by Christoph Babitz on this. Um, you can have databases of experimental data collected by many different labs. This is what Fermat wants to establish, and I will talk more about this. This is actually quite complicated. 
um, and I will show you uh, why. Um, but you can also, of course, if you have already a theoretical database, you can simulate experimental data if you have a very good forward model, um, like a digital twin of your experimental setup. And that is actually also a very valid way of doing this. If you have a good model, um, if you want to establish this connection between theoretical data on ab initio, for example, and, and other, for example, atom positions and your experimental observations, um, then actually doing realistic simulations is really one thing to invest into. Um, because then you can really compare theory with experiment on a one-to-one -one basis. Of course, having databases and fair data allows us to also uh, crowdsource data generation, especially in this uh, second um, item here where we then uh, use data from different labs. Um, we can also, of course, crowdsource then the knowledge extraction of data because some people may not even want to collect data themselves not do any experiments or any simulations, but only interpret data that is available. Um, and it immediately then becomes available to the rest if it's done properly. Um, but also data analysis workflows. So just how to, how to process data, how to um, make sense of it, how to interpret it, um, can then also be uh, put basically in this common, uh, on this common basis and everybody has access to the most recent techniques. Um, as this is what I want to say here, that data analysis workflows can immediately be applied to huge amounts of data if they're available. And people can then, of course, benefit from these uh, data analysis workflows that are available. And with that, you get accelerated growth um, of knowledge in material science, of course, because we don't have to reinvent as many wheels anymore as we do at the moment. And there's also innovative approaches of AI going back to collecting more data, because now you can, for example, have um, algorithm and data-driven data acquisition, um, right? We, we've heard that in the talk of Christoph Babitz, where there was an optimization algorithm that was uh, trying to find an optimum uh, feature in the material, and that was driven by data that was acquired within this high throughput experiment. But you can also think of using data that is on a common database that uh, can drive these experiments. But uh, as I said, uh, there are also obstacles um, that we have to overcome. First of all, we have to convince the community. Um, not many of our colleagues are convinced. We don't have 10,000 people attending this conference right now because um, not as many people want to invest into um, stuff that is not related to the actual scientific question that they um, are actually working on. Um, um, then we have a lot of incompatible data formats, um, proprietary data formats, where we don't know exactly what's in the files, um, what companies that develop instrumentation um, store in their data files um, and, and, or how they store the information. Um, then we have also incomplete or unprecise um, metadata. So often our instruments may not be as well characterized as, for example, the parameterization of an ab initio code or so, or some MD code that calculates some atomic structure or electronic structure. And also, um, even if we have characterized this very well, um, in many cases, um, these instruments are not digitally accessible. So we cannot read out the parameters that we would need. Um, we would have to copy them by hand and so on. So all these, all these things um, are uh, obstacles. And also, and especially when you have a complex experiment, um, you often invest a lot, and we do this ourselves as well. We invest a lot into somehow making some, uh, drawing some physical picture from the measurements that you have, and you do some very complicated data processing. And often these data processing steps may not be irreversible. So you may not actually be able to undo and go back to um, the original data. So it's always important, of course, to have the original data. And it may not always be easy to really make uh, reconstruct that link that some group, some research group has established between the experimental data they collected and the publication that they got from it. And so on. So there are many other issues um, that you can think of that may be obstacles in terms of um, having a fair data infrastructure in uh, experimental material science. I just want to say quickly, 
our approach that we work with, and just so that you understand, this is the background that we come from. So we, we operate microscopes, so often, like mostly electron microscopes, but also optical microscopes um, and, and other instrumentation. Um, we invest a lot into this uh, topic of data reconstruction. So reconstructing, for example, 3D atomic positions from experimental TM data, but also modeling our experiments, um, doing when, once we have a model of, for example, an atomic structure or an electronic structure, um, that we then model the behavior that we would see in experimental observation so that we can really compare on a on the ground truth, basically on an experimental data level, um, what we would expect from our model with what we see in the experiment. And that actually is, I would argue, um, something that is really um, very important to pursue, that you have a forward model. Often the reverse is not so easy and may then be potentially reconstructed once you have a forward model, but the forward model is often easier and it allows you then really to compare data on a basis where the statistics is correct. So often, uh, especially in our case, where we have limited number of counts, lim limited number of electrons that we detect, um, there are certain Poisson statistics. And if we do some processing through the experimental data, these Poisson statistics are somehow warped and they cannot be interpreted in that manner anymore. So any statistical comparison of data um, would have to actually really be aware of all this, which is often not really easily possible. So to compare apples with apples, we would really have to go uh, back to the experimental detector level from our model that we have about um, what we expect to see. And then we can adjust the model to make it fit the experimental data. Once we have a good digital twin or forward model of our experimental setup. Here, here's just one example of how data is often treated, um, experimental data. Um, just an example from a former PhD student in my group who is now um, in, in Switzerland at EMPA, uh, working with Rolf Erni. Um, and he developed this um, modification of UNET. UNET, probably many of you have heard, it's, an, it's a tool to process um, images and so on. for example, you can use it for denoising and so on. And um, he made some modification that uh, converges faster, but he also applied it to various types of data. So this is not electron microscopy data, um, as you can see, but he, he did an, a, a, a simple experiment that didn't require him to have access to an electron microscope. So you can see here, this is a laptop. This is the screen of a laptop and the laptop actually faces the door of his room. And um, you can see the reflection of what plays on the screen on this, uh, in the door. And we as humans, we cannot interpret very much um, from this. I mean, we, we see that there's some speckle, but not really much content. But if you train this MNET that he um, developed um, with this data that uh, is somehow reflected from the door with the ground truth that is played by the screen, he can then actually uh, record only the signal on the, on the door and we cover most of what you would see on the screen. So a movie plays and you can somehow capture the story. So some information is lost, but it's amazing how some of these computer algorithms, if they're trained with plenty of data, can actually cover a lot of information from um, very limited amount of data that is actually available or very noisy data. So here is another example. Now, this is not a laptop image anymore. This is now recorded on an actual um, transmission electron microscope. So this is some atomic structure. And the question is now, where are the atoms and how many atoms are there? What's the size and the structure of this atomic cluster? And applying basically these denoising techniques, you can now really retrieve where the atoms are um, if you have a good forward model of how this works. So you need to take um, structures like this and then apply the correct Poisson statistics and um, instrument parameters to simulate images like this. And that is how you establish this forward link. And then this neural networks, they can actually learn how that works and can do the reverse step for you because that is often um, not really easily possible, at least not in a deterministic manner. Um, but neural networks are very uh, good in doing this. So you can also use this type of technique to, for example, if you have defocused images of cells. So if you've ever looked at cells in an optical microscope and you um, uh, saw not much contrast, but when you then go out of focus, you see some contrast. 
Well, that is due to the fact that um, these cells may not be stained and um, actually there's only a phase shift. But neural networks, if you give them uh, images of these types and give them also um, the ground truth, and you can obtain the ground truth by some advanced techniques um, uh, like holographic techniques and or focal series reconstruction or so on, um, then you can train these networks to actually interpret um, these images. So using only two images, you can actually get a very good representation of this and using more images, you can get an even better representation of this. So having all this basically available online in a common database for experimental data, all these tools, you don't have to reinvent them again in every lab, but uh, people across the globe have access to these. And um, it, has, it also benefits the data infrastructure itself because once people realize that this is a useful thing to have, they will also voluntarily upload their data to be processed by these tools. And with that feeding the data infrastructure itself to have even more data to base its results that it um, produces in the future on. So this is somehow, um, I guess, the way that uh, also Google works, right? You provide some uh, nice software or some nice tools that people find useful and they voluntarily provide everything about their life uh, to the infrastructure. Here, it's not about your life, it's just about your data. So um, here's just, just to complete that story about the atoms, of course, then there's more advanced tools that um, other people have developed. And if you make all these then available to the database, that's even better, right? So this is a tool developed by the group of um, Sergei Kalinin at um, Oak Ridge uh, National Lab. And um, they, instead of um, only extracting, extracting atom positions, they also extract the reliability of these atom positions. So you can, if you have enough data and um, you can then run different reconstructions with different seeds and different parameters, you can then also get some information about the reliability of a reconstruction. Something that, for example, we wouldn't have, but once these algorithms are shared on a common database with a common data format that processes our data very easily, then we can immediately also gain uh, information of this type here. So um, there's a lot of benefit in sharing these um, algorithms and also the data. Here, one, one last example um, I wanted to give is tychography. It's a compute intensive technique where you have your sample and you position your beam to de different positions across your sample and um, you collect diffraction patterns at each beam position. And then you can reconstruct using some uh, a layered structure that's like an artificial neural network um, that at the bottom basically produces your experimental data, but within the structure, you have now the three dimensional potential that scatters your electrons. So there's a very nice physical representation of this actually. Um, and then you can reconstruct the, the, the layers of your material um, that um, have scattered your electrons. And once you've you implemented that, you can even now train um, uh, the computer to control your microscope, um, to position the beam to where um, you would most efficiently expect more data to build the structure. So this is just an example to show you that having these data aware algorithms or data trained algorithms, you can now even um, feed back into the experiment and drive the experiment based on um, basically the data that uh, you have already collected prior. So this is one of these tachography reconstructions um, obtained in our microscope um, here in Berlin. And this is a uh, very simple material. It's a monolayer of uh, molybdenum disulfide. And um, so many, many diffraction patterns have been collected and then the reconstruction algorithm has run and produced this beautiful reconstruction of the atomic positions. Now there is um, of course a trade-off. Um, you don't want to position the beam too closely and collect too many diffraction patterns for too long because you may damage your material. And there are these techniques called compressed sensing where you then only position your beam randomly and try to then uh, still do reconstruction with that information. And this would be a uh, reconstruction from a compressed sensing acquisition scheme where you have random positions of your probe um, and you only uh, have, you have a factor of 40 less probe positions. So your material doesn't see as many electrons, it may survive longer, but your reconstruction is actually not very good. But if you now let the computer learn while you're doing the acquisition, to position your probes more smartly. And this is a pre-trained network that has been trained with experimental data. 
Um, you can, it starts first randomly, but then it improves and gets better and better data. And of course, this has to be pre-trained. I mean, this, this acquisition here, that was uh, relatively fast, but the, the information about um, how to interpret these diffraction patterns and so on, that had to actually be pre-trained and took two weeks. Now, if we could make this available online in, in a shared data infrastructure, um, immediately a number of people could benefit from this training and it wouldn't have to be redone. So just a few motivations for why um, uh, we, there's great potential in having a shared infrastructure for experimental material science data, but also data analysis workflows and um, knowledge extraction from data. And I promised you I would get more into this topic here. So we, we can do this classical ANN training and I've showed you a few examples of how these artificial neural networks can help. Um, but um, now it's, it's not so difficult to do this in high throughput experiments where you are in control of all your parameters. Or if you do realistic simulations, then again, you have control of all these parameters. But if you acquire data from different labs, well, you don't have as much control and a lot needs to be done actually to make this happen. But there is again, great potential because now you can apply this crowdsourcing idea here that you don't have to do everything yourself, but you can benefit from what other people do. So here's one example, um, again, uh, artificial neural network processing data. Um, this is an example actually given to me um, by Stefano Cosini from um, um, uh, Trenta, but within this uh, NFFA Europe project um, where they have an infrastructure um, that provides access to microscopes and other um, setups um, for people who don't have these instruments themselves. And he actually from this, um, from these many investigations, he had 22,000 images and was able to have some students train the, uh, this machine by uh, annotating um, some portion of these 20,000 images. And then the test data set um, then was able to show that uh, images can automatically be labeled. For example, you have particles or you have tips or whatever. You have a biological sample and, and so on. This, the, the, the thing was that all this data came from the same instrument. So this was one in the same SEM that collected this, the data always with exactly these parameters and these could all be retrieved. So the magnification was calibrated and the current and so on. So these images could easily be interpreted. Also the detector was always the same configuration. That's very important in, in electron microscopes, for example. How do you detect your signals? Um, here's another example. Um, this is um, when, you, when you shine in, in, in TEM, electron beam through a sample, you can collect the fraction patterns. And um, the fraction patterns, if you collect them different ways, they may look, for example, like this, if your convergence angle is um, smaller than uh, the inverse of the unit cell size, these disks don't overlap and you get these beautiful patterns and they contain a lot of information. But one thing that one, uh, people want to extract from this is how thick is the sample? So you do a lot of simulations and then you train an artificial neural network and you can then, these are these position average convergent beam electron diffraction pattern. So you, you position average over basically one unit cell in your material and you get these patterns and you can easily compare that with simulations. And it has been shown that these are very sensitive to um, uh, the thickness, for example, these patterns and you can then extract very precisely the specimen thickness, which you need to know for uh, further analysis of your, of your data. So again, this neural network needs data. It needs to have input from many different crystal structures and could be then shared online um, with others. But if you do this for the same experiment, for the same microscope, you can easily do this because you have calibrated your um, camera links of the diffraction patterns and so on. And also the way that your detector works, but if you try to apply this now to data provided by other groups, it becomes more complicated because the detector characteristics play a role. Um, maybe uh, the calibration of your camera length needs to be redone and so on. Um, there are many complications and I will deal with that right now. And you don't even have to go across the country or the globe to um, have data from a different lab, even within the same lab. So this is our physics building here. This is the Iris Atlas Hof. Um, and even within this building, there's a number of different microscopes actually from three different uh, groups that bring that somehow pool the microscopes here together. Um, and comparing data from any of these two microscopes is already 
a challenge. And so we already have a nice playground um, locally here that we try to tackle. And once we um, make some progress with this, uh, we can hopefully then also very easily um, go beyond the boundaries of, of our city or basically this local lab here. So if you look online and look for databases on experimental data related to what we can look at with electron microscopes, you can see, for example, and I think it has already been mentioned uh, in a talk today, for example, this crystallography open database where um, data is stored in a, um, in, a, in a format that can easily be read and that is actually independent of instrumentation. So um, while in this database, this is for example, the EELS database and we'll come back to EELS and Claudia has already mentioned EELS as an example in her introduction. Um, there's raw experimental data in this database here. Now we have crystal structures, that means atom positions. And this is like theoretical data that you can now apply a forward model to compare your experiment with. And um, actually this is instrument independent. So it's actually much more easy to use and much more widely applicable than this one here, which provides raw data that is instrument dependent and may not even be interpretable at all because some of the metadata that would be required to do the interpretation is missing in this uh, data. But I will come to this example of yields um, here in a minute. Um, so this is some data that Alberto Everard from my group, he acquired on, on our microscope, which has a very good resolution in yields. So this is the zero loss peak for anyone who uh, knows about yields. Um, it's monochromated, so it has a very well-defined primary beam energy. And this is the plasmon peak. But what we're interested in is can we map the band gap um, in silicon? And that is always a challenge uh, for these electron energy loss uh, spectroscopy experiments because the band gap of 1.1 EV and a very weak signal makes it um, difficult to somehow separate from this zero loss peak. So this, this what you see here, this is the zero loss peak. That is in principle, this very sharp peak that you see here only blown up basically. This small area down here is blown up. So he then developed this reconstruction algorithm. Um, this is uh, also something that is computationally quite demanding. It runs on GPUs and uh, takes a while to process multiple spectra, um, but it basically tries to now self-consistently reconstruct the dielectric function of this material, um, taking into account the thickness of the material, the primary beam energy, relativistic effects that somehow produce artifacts in these spectra, to then retrieve uh, the dielectric function. So this is the dielectric function represented in N and K. Um, these dashed lines here are from the, um, from the uh, database. I have a link to that in, in the next slide. I forget what the name It's a uh, dielectric function database. Um, so this is from optical uh, measurements, the, um, the reference data. It doesn't quite look like the reconstruction that we obtained from these experiments, despite this advanced reconstruction algorithm here. But, um, the assumption was that you have pure silicon. And of course, now you see already the problem that we have with experimental data. We always make assumptions about the data. Um, and, and that is the assumption that we then also write as metadata, <clears throat> excuse me, into the database, right? Um, and um, this is again, the picture I, I've shown you in the previous uh, slide. This is now not in the, N and K representation, but now in the uh, real and imaginary part of the dielectric constant or dielectric function as a function of frequency. And um, you see there is not a very good correspondence to the optical reference data. But when Alberto now assumes um, that there is also native oxide on the silicon, which makes sense if you know how the silicon sample was stored, right? It was not processed basically under protective atmosphere, but it was exposed to air and then the native oxide can grow. And if you have that information, then you can also make that assumption and you can then build that into the model. And now actually reconstructing the dielectric function from this uh, material uh, looks much better. So now you have here the solid line is the optical reference data and the dashed line is the yields reconstructed dielectric function and you can see much better agreement. So what I'm saying is um, many of these experimental databases, for example, this EELS database that I showed you before, 
um, may contain data that is not useful at all because um, you don't know how the data or the sample were processed. And um, that's why it makes it very uh, difficult to actually work with if you don't have all the information and one really needs to have, um, sorry for this. Uh, and one really needs to have um, very, uh, very good information about how data um, was obtained. And now I come to um, the project that Claudia has already mentioned, the Fairmark project. Um, and um, she uh, has not said very much about it. So I will say a little bit more about it. And also Balk Anstorfer has uh, mentioned it. So it's a large project that includes many partners spread across um, the country, Germany, because it's a response to a national call for data infrastructure. Claudia is the spokesperson. Um, Matthias Scheffler is the deputy. And um, there are actually um, many institutions that participate also large scale projects which produce uh, lots of data. And um, it's split into these um, seven areas where um, some of them are administration and also use cases and so on. But um, uh, uh, three of them are actually more focused on really um, how data is being collected or areas where data is collected. So one of them is a synthesis so different types of synthesizing materials. Another one is um, experimental materials characterization. That's what I'm, I'm gonna talk about more. And then um, the third one is also computational material science that uh, is represented um, by um, Claudia, especially, but there will be a talk also by uh, Markus Scheidken on this, as far as I know. And it's based on um, the whole project actually lives and um, actually thrives due to the uh, large amount of work that was already put into this NOMAD uh, database that, that already exists and that um, contains lots of uh, uh, theoretical, especially ab initio uh, data on atomic and electronic structure of materials. The experimental science part, um, that is uh, now the characterization of materials using different techniques, uh, does not want to cover all different um, aspects of experimental material science characterization, but wants to focus first on only five techniques. So um, these techniques include um, atom probe tomography, electron microscopy, angular resolved full electron spectroscopy. You've heard about a talk by Ralph Anstorff already, optical spectroscopy, and also um, XPS, so photo electron spectroscopy. And um, they are very diverse in the type of data, the data formats, also the instruments that they use. And so if we can tackle these five, we hope to be able to actually extract this also to, to other um, uh, data acquisition techniques. So what, what we now focus a lot on is how do we actually allow data to be um, uh, collected and made available to databases like this. Um, and we need to start actually where the data is being generated and that we facilitate the digital acquisition of data and also incorporation into databases. And we work very heavily with electronic lab notebooks um, on this because they actually um, allow us to then have data sets that we can transfer to a database. And so in electron microscopy, we need to prepare samples in, in a specimen preparation lab. And these samples um, are then uh, already uh, recorded and characterized and so on. And information is then processed using uh, actually uh, such uh, open source software that can do image processing that we can actually, we can run the same software on different machines and uh, operate optical microscopes and also electron microscopes with it. And uh, data is then pushed from there into the electronic lab notebook where it can then be further processed and annotated and so on. And once we go to our microscope, um, um, this is actually a TEM. This is how the software is used operating the SEM. The same software can operate both microscopes. Um, we uh, draw this data from the data from the electronic lab notebook into here so that we have information available about where the sample came from and so on. And we can then process the data and uh, put it again to the electronic lab notebook. And the same happens when we then process the data in our, uh, in our office. Actually, I will show you that uh, the data processing can even be done directly on the electronic lab notebook um, through a web browser, which um, allows actually uh, much faster sharing of 
data analysis workflows and so on. And you can also make it more reproducible because you have better control of what, what, what happens to your data if the processing is done in a controlled environment. Um, so actually the same software here that you can see here that controls the microscopes and we can analyze the data with can also now run actually on the server and we can operate it through a web browser, which really uh, makes things also much more easy. Also when training new students, for example, um, uh, they can they can train basically online and don't uh, uh, yeah they, all the tools are available to them right away and we use an electronic lab notebook and um, we wanted to have something that we can easily modify ourselves and that can also be um, extended by us and um, where we can also give it away to others and recommend it to others without um, asking them to pay a lot of money and so we decided for an open source solution. Um, that was developed by Nicholas Carpi uh, at Skilab FTW. We discovered that actually independent of us, also other labs have adopted this solution. So um, we developed solutions for this, but keep in mind that we can also copy them also to other e-lab um, or electronic lab notebook solutions. Um, so, but this is basically the, the, the platform that we currently um, build on. And also very large data sets that um, you would not normally be able to download and process on your own laptop can be then operated and processed now um, and viewed and browsed and so on, on basically the server. Um, and that is another incentive for us to actually work with this because some of the data sets that we collect, they're huge, they're uh, very large. For example, here's a data set that has 34 gigabytes um, that exceeds the RAM of uh, some of the computers that we have, but you can now process these data with your local uh, laptop very easily. Right, and um, for this to happen, you have to actually bring now these different solutions together. Um, and um, I've heard already uh, one of the talks this morning, uh, hackathons being mentioned. I think this is something that in this process of developing these data infrastructures, is something very important. So we got together um, people from uh, the Libertem project. So this is from the research center, ULH, who developed a, a software to a browse arbitrarily and browse and process actually arbitrarily large data sets. Um, then we get also somebody from the Neon company who provided this open source um, graphical user interface for processing two and three dimensional data sets. And then we have our own specialists in particular, I want to highlight here, Shajir Shabi, who really invested a lot into this and was responsible for much of the software that I'm gonna tell you about. And of course, also you have to have the users, those people who want to work with this and have applications of this and help to actually um, develop um, the uh, publications from these developments so that you can have joint papers at the end that also have scientific um, relevance. So I see that my time is uh, running out slowly, but um, I won't get into all the details because they, some of these may be a bit too specific to microscopy, but I have three little videos that I just wanted to um, show you. Uh, um, but before, let me just show you how the data infrastructure that we're working with um, uh, works. So we have these different instruments that collect data um, and um, that are able to now push this data to the electronic lab notebook. Either you do this through the web interface of the electronic lab notebook, or you do it directly through this um, data acquisition software that I've shown you. Um, one of the videos I may probably skip, but shows how you can directly from the data acquisition tool. I think this is essential actually, that many of the data acquisition tools that people work with in the different labs, that they um, somehow extend it using plugins or whatever is possible with the software to directly push data to, for example, an electronic lab notebook or a database and so on, because you want to lower the threshold as much as possible to ingest data into these common databases. Um, be it only your local database um, from which one can then copy data into a common database or electronic lab notebook or whatever, but you want to have it somehow in a place where it can be sorted and annotated and so on. Because if that step is not done and if that step is not easy, it will just end up on some hard drive in some PhD student's drawer. And after the PhD student has graduated, nobody will ever know what to do with that data again. So this first step of getting your data directly during the characterization session 
into the database electronic lab notebook, whatever in our case, it's this uh, electronic lab notebook. That is actually very crucial. And that is actually where we saw we have to invest first because once that step is not done, we don't have any data to actually process and do other things on, right? Um, and of course, there needs to be some permanent storage um, because you want to keep the raw data um, uh, that um, needs to then also record it in an immutable manner so that people cannot modify it. Um, users can interact with it. And what's now very important for us, where we really see a big benefit and where we also see that people may like this idea and may want to actually process um, the, their data directly on the server, is that we provide tools that make it easy um, and also uh, provide um, um, methods that they may not actually have locally on their computer available. For example, we have also a server that has um, seven B100 GPUs. So this is not something that you have on your desktop. So you have to apply some of these methods on the server anyway, if you want to use them. And this Elab FTW server actually gives access to all this. So it runs stupid notebooks on your data. So you're very flexible in the way how you process data. You can also have um, this, uh, this tool Libertem that can browse and process huge amounts of data. Um, this is actually linked now to also this open source GUI where you can have any user interaction um, that you want with your data when you process it. Um, and of course, also inline tools, for example, we have focal series reconstruction and some atom probe uh, tomography tools and so on. And then also other tools that are, that you normally have and that people have developed um, tools with that provide now access to this data directly on the server through a web browser without having to install anything on your local computer. So I, I see my time is already um, uh, welcome. Sorry, coming to an end, but um, I want to demonstrate. If you have any questions on this, I, I uh, can definitely answer them, but I want to show you one last video. And that is now how to actually run uh, different applications in this electronic lab notebook. So this is, an, this is just an, a demo setup where there's only one entry in this electronic lab notebook just to demonstrate this um, capability. So you can now edit this and you can go into it. There's not um, much data yet uh, in the description of the experiment, but you can have, for example, uh, now Jupyter Notebooks uploaded here. And if you click on this Jupyter Notebook, you get access to all the files that are within this experiment that you collected. And you can now run these Jupyter Notebooks and process data. And you can also um, uh, have now, again, another tool that's this Libertem that can browse these very large data sets. And again, um, it opens a new window and you can now have this other tool that uh, can now work with your data and you can now uh, see the different data sets that are available um, within this experiment. So one thing is, of course, you need to have a container that makes your code only accessible to the data that corresponds to this experiment. So um, here is, uh, you can also do a reconstruction. So this is now running a reconstruction. This is again, a Jupyter notebook that opens one of these data sets and it's a HDF5 stack. Um, that you can now uh, really modify online within the browser, the stupid notebook, and for example, display different frames of this data stack. It's a focal series. So nothing super fancy, just to show that it can be done. But what you can also do now is you can, uh, if, if the, the file has a certain extension, you can now actually even, uh, um, the, the, the software knows that this can be associated, for example, with this reconstruction algorithm. Um, data is structured in JSON files. Um, so if you want to have any structured metadata, you can have free text descriptions, but also structured metadata in these JSON files that you can browse and edit. And um, uh, if you now click on the reconstruction, um, you can see it here. Uh, then this reconstruction runs directly on the server. And once the reconstruction is done, it actually then uh, ingests the reconstruction result that was obtained back into the electronic lab notebook so that you now have also the reconstruction results available on your server as part of your data set um, that, you've, uh, that you've created. And I guess this will be now, now you refresh the view and you can see there are now two new data sets that have been added to this entry in an electronic lab notebook, which are your reconstruction results. So I think um, I, uh, 
won't show you everything, but um, I want to finish now with a summary. Um, so there are a number of obstacles for implementing fair principles in experimental material science, especially when you want to combine information from different labs um, because you have data formats, uh, you need to record metadata in a digital manner and so on. Um, but once you have that, um, machine learning can really uh, give you a huge amount of benefits uh, and these benefits become immediately available to everybody who participates in this project. And I will stop here and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Christoph. Um, we still have a few minutes for questions. So you could either speak up directly under the microphone or write a question to the chat. I don't see any hands up. Also nothing in the chat. Let me ask a question meanwhile. Um, so you mentioned already the different solutions, different file formats, all these kinds of things. So of how many um, bigger, let's say, initiatives are you aware? Are you aware of bigger initiatives who are doing similar things? Because obviously now the time is ripe, everyone tries to, to harvest data, to verify data. So obviously there are many things done now in parallel. Um, are you aware of who is doing what? Uh, a little bit, um, but I won't be able to now give you a complete list of sure, what's yeah. going on. Um, I would have to sit down and really think very hard and also maybe do some research. But yeah, definitely. Um, there are other activities. I mean, even in Europe, we have the European Open Science Cloud, where a lot of including projects, including Fermat, um, also will ultimately, hopefully, um, link into. But um, I, for example, today, even today, I learned that within Esteem 3, which is one of the activities, um, it's, it's a European network of excellence where people have access to TEM infrastructure. Um, they have also something where they provide an online processing of diffraction patterns and simulation comparison to, for example, do this packed bed analysis that I showed on this position average um, conversion beam electron diffraction analysis. And yeah, so in the life science, for example, there is already a large database in this. They are much better organized um, because I believe they're also much not not as diverse um life science electron microscopy mm -hmm. um they have a well established database already of electron microscopy images of cells and proteins and so on do you have an idea how many electron microscopy groups are in germany or europe or so because it's a very popular technique also being a very expensive um, instrument <laughs> i would be curious to how many people one would have to pick up if you want to homogenize the community yeah, I mean, even, even in Germany alone, you would have probably at least 25 like, TEM groups. I mean, SEMs you can find in pretty much every lab um, because they're easier to use and, and cheaper. But even TEMs you have, well, again, I would have to think about it, and, and, but roughly 25 at least, yeah. And then, of course, uh, in all the other European countries and uh, yeah. have a lot more. And then across the world, in the US, you have a huge number. Yeah. So Matthias has raised his hand. Yeah, actually, uh, a question which, in fact, I had asked you, so, uh, actually, you had explained to me several years ago, and that was mentioned by you, but also by others, the problem of uh, uh, proprietary software of the companies. Now, I think you have some experience how to convince uh, companies to, to get more open, which I think is really very important. Can you elaborate on that? Um yeah, so I mean, we, we do talk to companies that open their, for, and, and just really different companies have different company spirits or philosophies or whatever. So they are more or less open to this. But I know, for example, and, and this is, I think, a good example from the life science electron microscopy community, they have decided on an open data standard. And uh, they have basically agreed that all data should, so everybody buying a detector. Um, would have to convince the company providing the detector that they actually save data in this format. And now even a company that has always had closed formats has one open format, and that is the one that these life science people have uh, told them to include. And I believe now with all these open data formats and standards and requirements by funding agencies being around, companies realize more and more that they have to do something. 
and things are changing slowly. So I think we're riding a wave um, where it becomes easier to actually convince them. Great, good, thanks. Okay, last chance to ask a question. <laughs> Okay, I don't see any, so then we are perfect in time. I thank Christoph again, and we are moving to the next presentation that is given by Volker Blum from Duke University. Uh, hi, Volker, and he's going to talk or to tell us about how difficult or easy, I don't know, it is to deal with hybrid databases, right? Uh, so the, the screen is yours, Volker. Yes, thank you. Well. First of all, thank you very much for, for actually having me at the conference. And uh, second, I'm <laughs> excited to see some of the live participants in, in, in Louvain. And I, I wish I was there, but yeah, uh, at least some of us get to be in the same room and otherwise hopefully uh, someday soon. So I'll try uh, some screen sharing in the next second, uh, just a moment. one more window in my way that I didn't expect. So let's see what happens now. And great. So this looks like it's on my screen. I hope it's on yours. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Yeah. So thanks again. So um, as you already uh, said, Claudia, I'll be uh, talking about data for hybrid perovskites. It's really a little bit broader. It's hybrid organic, inorganic semiconductors, but the, the data uh, structure and also project uh, that fuels this is called hybrid cubed. So the three stands for cubed and the three D stand for uh, discovery, design and dissemination. Uh, that will uh, come in a moment. Um, what we focus on really are semiconductors inspired by the hybrid perovskite paradigm. You can see one of them over here, uh, which is actually a fairly complex uh, object. If you look at it more closely, it has inorganic components, it has organic uh, components, in this case, an organic uh, uh, ligomer of an organic semiconductor, so uh, quarter thiophene. But more importantly, these materials actually exist as crystalline materials. And so that's what we focus on, materials that have high crystalline uh, quality, so they can be made with high definition as new semiconductor materials. And the key funding agency, uh, which I'll mention, but I want to say this uh, at the beginning, that funded this particular project is uh, the National Science Foundation in the DEMREF project. And so we're extremely grateful to them that this happened. We also work in a Center for Hybrid Organic and Organic Semiconductors uh, Choice that's funded by Department of Energy. And on the computational side, our work has been supported by, by a number of large infrastructures or else we wouldn't be here. And then there's uh, Springer Materials. Uh, so Springer Nature is credited down here with whom we're also going to be working on this in the future. And so then you see my name, but it turns out uh, there are a lot of other names uh, involved and I'll detail them uh, on the next slide. So this is, before I do anything else, uh, these are the acknowledgements of the people who really are doing the work. And so on the database, which is the um, narrow data focus project uh, that I'll be highlighting in the center of the talk. Amazingly, actually, uh, some of the key work has been done by undergraduate students. So all these six people shown here are actually undergraduate students and Zhao Chen Du, uh, who came into my office um, uh, four years ago and, and asked if there was a project. He really founded this database and programmed uh, a good part of it and, and made sure that this uh, continued. Becca Lau, Lily Alomari, and then Yannick Eisenlohr actually helped uh, with, uh, with conceiving and, and pushing on some things for the stock, uh, apart from being contributors to the database at the high level. And then uh, many others contributed. So in, in my group alone, probably the most important one is Raul Lasner, who did a lot of the infrastructure programming uh, at, the, at the base of this. Manuj Jana is actually an experimental uh, scientist and, and quite established in his own right. He comes from David Mitzi's group. And so this brings me to the, to the overall project, which is focused on science of hybrid perovskites, which brings together six PIs from uh, institutions here in the research triangle near Duke University, also UNC and uh, NC State University. And, and Matt Beard, Hyping Lu have supported this from choice. And I should mention Springer Materials because that will play a role towards the end of my talk, and Sharon George, uh, in particular, the senior editor in Springer Materials responsible for these things. We've worked together well, uh, also in other contexts over the years. 
So let me get to the agenda. So what I'll try to speak about in the next uh, 40 minutes uh, or so uh, is, well, hybrid organic, inorganic perovskites, which I'm sure many in the audience uh, are familiar with, uh, say a few things anyway. And then uh, the, the hybrid cube database and also the MATD cube software that we've been working on uh, to, to enable uh, the database and, and perhaps more databases that can be built on this in the future. And then I'll give one example on uh, where, where we're having accurate data helped us, which in this case is a, a structural descriptor based on um, octahedral bond angle differences that allow us to, to predict the, the occurrence of uh, large spin splittings of, of Rushba or Dresselhaus types or uh, well, spin orbit coupling mediated in chiral layered perovskites, which is a hot topic in this field today. And then in data, really, there is the, the, the other question of sustainability and what do you do in the long term? And already during my PhD, my own PhD, I found that Landold Bernstein was actually a book uh, that I needed very often because it had high quality curated data. And that's a hard thing uh, to obtain because it requires detailed work and Landold Bernstein had that. And so I'm quite proud that, that, that we've been working with Springer materials for a while on, on other data and, and that uh, we're also going to be working with them in the hybrid perovskites and general perovskites area in the future. Yeah, so that's the outset. So hybrid organic inorganic semiconductors, I already had this image on uh, my first slide. So this is uh, lead bromide quarter thiophene. But in general, you can think of them as materials that are made of two components, an inorganic component and an organic component. And you can tune both uh, in, in different ways. So you have a number of inorganic uh, options available, but you also have the full array of synthetic organic chemistry that can allow you to, to tune models. And so you could hope to make new functional materials. And so this is ongoing in this field in a, in a, in a rather uh, successful uh, uh, approach uh, at this stage. The key point, as I mentioned earlier, is that we're interested in materials that have a crystalline, so well-defined framework but we can have quite complex organic functionality. And um, that, that creates the space of semiconductors we're interested in. Uh, and, and that entails plenty of properties. So the energy band gap is, is probably the most important one for any semiconductor, as well as carrier properties. Uh, so which carriers do you have? Can you dope them? Can the carriers move around? Optical characteristics are, are probably the leading spectroscopic uh, uh, quantity of interest and also for applications, of course. Uh, but, but other quantities are coming in as well. So magnetic uh, semiconductors have been of interest for a long time, but, but semiconductors that are not themselves magnetic, but, but allow for spin transport. So controlled transport of uh, spin polarized carriers are also quite interesting. And, and I could go on uh, with this list. It turns out there are a lot of properties that people are actually exploring in these semiconductors. And so there's a very rapid addition of known and, and prospective hybrid semiconductors going on in this field. So how did this come about? Actually, it turns out that the uh, advent uh, of the perovskite field as, as interesting semiconductors, in, in particular for photovoltaics, um, is not that new. Photovoltaics probably boosted uh, the hybrid perovskite field to its current shape, as you'll see. But David Mitzi uh, pointed out to me uh, long ago but that there's a Nature paper in 1958 that talks about crystal structure and photoconductivity of cesium plumbo halides. And that already says that essentially uh, materials of this kind, in this case, cesium instead of a, an organic uh, component, uh, materials of this kind can be uh, photoactive. And so if you look further, uh, there is this hybrid perovskite, uh, methyl ammonium uh, lead X3, a lead two system with cubic perovskite structure. And this was characterized in this paper in 1978. And since then, uh, the field actually grew and many developments of organic, inorganic hybrids based on this paradigm followed up to 2009 when this paper was published, which I'm sure many uh, in the audience have, have heard about, which, which says organometal halide perovskites as visible light sensitizers for photovoltaic cells. At this point in the context of disensitized solar cells, but it turns out that methyl ammonium lead iodide in particular was, was uh, a, a good solar cell material in its own right. And then a, a run started. And as of yesterday, uh, this paper has been cited 14,000 times. And this gives, gives, gives one a partial idea of how fast this field is actually growing. 
so the net result of this uh, boost that the field got is that there was, there's a vast increase uh, of the number of newly synthesized hybrid compounds. Uh, there's also a vast increase of the number and type of properties uh, being studied. And more importantly, a vast increase of literature to keep track of. And if anybody works in this field, you know that this is a, a challenge. But there's also an ongoing issue, of course, if you have a lot of literature, then the question is um, how variable is the data that's reported? And to an extent, there is actually some variability of data in the literature. And so the, the question is, can we capture this data volume? And that's what we set out to do uh, a few years ago. So this is the short uh, introduction of uh, what this uh, database is about. It's, and it's a, in principle, very simple uh, hope which is that we can create a curated database. So one that's focused specifically on any properties of, of hybrid organic inorganic compounds related to the perovskite paradigm. This is a long sentence, but it gives us the flexibility and also the delineation that we need. And so again, this hybrid cube stands for hybrid design, discovery and dissemination of, of such materials. And the database itself can be found at this URL here. And uh, the way to use it is to start searching. We'll come to that. Uh, in a few minutes. So what have we at this point? Uh, we actually, because this is curated and hand entered, we have about uh, 442 uh, hybrid uh, organic and organic compounds in the database uh, from uh, uh, only a few hundred references, but going through the references and pushing through with them is, is, uh, is, is an ongoing challenge. And we have 69 properties. And this of course is some volume that we wanna increase uh, in the future. More importantly, the, the experimental properties that uh, we have in there, like atomic structure and photoluminescence in, in particular, uh, or absorbance, uh, can be quite varied. There are many others. And on the computational side, of course, things like atomic structure, band structure, and so on are the targets. But the real challenges in, in, in the field, as you know, are, uh, rest upon the structural diversity, which are also the opportunities uh, that come from the field. So there are the three-dimensional perovskites, this is the calcium titanate, so perhaps the uh, original uh, perovskite structure, all inorganic, which is then mimicked by, by methyl ammonium uh, lead halides. So this is uh, methyl ammonium lead iodide in the same structure. But there are also the two-dimensional perovskites, which we focused on more also in our scientific work in the two projects, uh, which can occur in various uh, shapes uh, with a van der Waals gap or, or without one. Uh, then there are 2.5 dimensional um, perovskites such as this one, where you have well-controlled numbers of layers of, of 3D perovskites wedged uh, between molecules uh, that allows you to tune the band gap. Uh, you can have one-dimensional structures. So this is actually a one-dimensional structure just looking along the one dimension uh, or zero-dimensional perovskites where the octahedra coming from the perovskites are actually uh, uh, isolated in a matrix of molecules. Or you can have something that's inspired by the perovskite paradigm. So this thing here, uh, has octahedra, but the octahedra are connected in a slightly different way. They're connected over edge and not corner. And for the people who categorize these things, that, that's actually a difference. And yet they're organic and organic hybrid semiconductors. And you can see that this gives, a, gives rise to a vast space of um, materials that one could imagine. But the question is, can one predict things simply and uh, also do structural subtleties make a difference? And so they do, of course, and this is why I think that, that it's important to, to, to do this carefully and, and look, at, uh, look at data individually one by one, because it turns out structural subtleties matter. And so this, this comes from our own work, but um, I'll try to uh, jump through this briefly, but it's, it's really an important point. You can't just go and assume that you put the molecule in here uh, in a predicted structure. This actually is a, an XRD structure. It's not predicted. Uh, it, it's confirmed by a prediction, but not itself predicted. Uh, but you can't just put the molecule in and hope for the best. It turns out that the electronic properties will be affected by uh, the structural subtleties. And in our case, this is, this is most easily seen by, by looking at these particular structures, um, which are actually quantum well structures. So you can reduce them to a quantum well model where you have band edges of an inorganic and band edges of an organic shown here in red and blue. And that gives rise to four different types of quantum wells that you could look at. And, and the question for a given new functional material that you would like to make is which type of quantum well is it? And we were quite successful with this initially. So you can do electronic structure calculations um, and uh, electronic structure calculations are fairly straightforward. So this shows energy bands that are derived from lead. So the inorganic bands, 
which lie above these at the conduction bandage above these black lines here. So these are the organic derived bands. These here down here are also organic derived bands. And if you do a calculation without a spin orbit coupling, which was the standard in the field uh, in, in the first five years or so uh, for some of the 3D perovskites, you see that this is actually an organic to organic uh, semi quantum well. So type one, this kind here. That's not true. If you actually do the calculation correctly, including spin orbit coupling, you see that the lead bands come down and you actually have a semiconductor where the electrons are on uh, the inorganic and on the conduction bands and, and, and some inorganic conduction bands and the holes are on the organic uh, valence bands. And so in fact, uh, what this really says, it's a semiconductor of this type here, which, which we call type 1B in this case. And that, that's an innocent little thing, but of course it has significant uh, uh, ramifications for the structure. Now, in this case, uh, that says the same thing. This is this picture again. In this case, uh, this was actually something uh, that we could probe further and, and, and something that already um, had been discussed before, at least for uh, this uh, amino acid, water of thiophene lead iodide and chloride, uh, where the bands shift around in different ways. Uh, so this one is also type 1B, whereas this one, type 2B, Whereas this one actually is, is almost organic to organic and should have different optical properties. Uh, and that was actually seen in uh, a, a paper by, by David Mitzi and co-workers early on already in 1999, except when we made the computational prediction, we didn't know that this data existed. So here you can see that there's a very strong uh, photoluminescence uh, line uh, at room temperature in the chloride variant, but, but not in the iodide variant. And so this is consistent with this assessment. Okay, so this works. And so where's the problem? Actually, the problem is here. This is a, a different uh, variant of the same material. We have two thiophene groups instead of four thiophene groups. And it turns out that if you look at the crystal structure a bit more closely, which Manuj Strana uh, did experimentally uh, with, with uh, David Mitzi's group and then, then with us, you get different orientations that are possible for these organic molecules. And they can be herringbone-like or they can be all parallel stacked and um, uh, in, in two different, in, it turns out there's rotational disorder actually, if you look at X-ray diffraction images of this material uh, a little bit more closely, which is related to, to different layers being differently oriented. And so you can, for instance, believe in all parallel stacking or you can believe in herringbone stacking of different types. And it turns out that the energy band structures that come out of this kind of exercise look subtly different. This, in fact, here is an uh, inorganic uh, to organic quantum well. This is an inorganic to inorganic quantum well. So the optical properties should be quite different. And uh, that's uh, shown here as well. And so if you, if you look at total energies, you see that total energies per atom are actually noticeably different uh, in this case. But if you don't know that, you would be predicting the wrong uh, quantum well type. And so the, the detailed orientation of these molecules actually matters and the correct uh, quantum well type is this here, uh, which is actually optically active. All right, so that's one challenge that came uh, from our own work. This is something else that comes directly from the database that Zhao Chen uh, put together a while ago. We looked at phase transition temperatures as another example, in this case, the orthorhombic to tetragonal phase transition in MAPI. And this is sort of the, the grandmother of all phase transitions, I would say, in, in these materials that's, that should be very well studied. And, and yet it turns out that there's a fairly large variety of values for this transition temperature reported in the literature. And Zhao Chen did a few things. So for instance, he um, uh, looked at them as a function of sample type. Uh, that's important, we record this in the database. And it turns out that um, uh, powder and crystal samples are slightly different, but they, they give noticeably better agreement between the respective values uh, than, than thin film materials, which um, presumably have a larger variety in, in how they're processed. But if one looks into things a little bit more closely, one can also uh, categorize this as a function of year. And it turns out that the early studies actually all sort of agreed when one could suspect that the run in the field wasn't yet there, and this was just an organic inorganic compound. And, and then in the later studies, there's actually a significantly larger variety independent of sample type in what came out. And so this is something one has to be careful about because now we're in this phase and this is where most of the data uh, that we have is generated. All right, so um, what's next? So we have a database and we're, we're growing it and it's actually intended to be a community database uh, with, with contributions from others and that it's, it's open for this. Uh, registration in this is, is free. 
And the idea is to have a carefully collected, curated um, database of data, our own or others in the literature. And the limit is uh, finding enough people to curate data and putting them in. And uh, it's also in principle designed to be incorporable and, and shareable with any interested larger material space. What it's not, um, this point is not a large data collection geared at uniformity of data, right? It's not supposed to have one type of data, regardless of whether that method is appropriate or inappropriate. It's supposed to reflect the diversity of existing research efforts with uh, some intelligence to make sure, uh, and that means human intelligence often, to make sure that the data is actually trustworthy. And it's also not supposed to be a large standalone database that's intended to supplant everybody else. So if, if you go in, you, you find a list of contributors that have done something, but more importantly, you find the data contributors that are here. And as I said before, interestingly, the, the, the largest contributions really have come from some very motivated undergraduate students, which is really a, a, a pleasure to, uh, to have worked with, with them. And I'm immensely grateful to them. Um, the scope of the database I already mentioned uh, in terms of uh, materials and properties that are there, there's of course a lot of room uh, for growth here. And, um, uh, the, the types of uh, quantities that we collect are sample details. That's important. Uh, synthesis is also something that we pay attention to. On the theory side, of course, we try to pay attention to what kind of computational methods was, already, uh, was used. And then if you look, you find materials data that look hopefully um, as a database should be. Um, uh, this is one example of naphthyl methyl uh, ammonium lead bromide. You find JMOL, which, which is a huge contribution to the community that this actually works in browsers. Uh, you can find information about crystal systems. Uh, you can actually verify data. So if you're registered in the database, you can actually verify somebody else's uh, findings or, or, or raise, raise a flag uh, that the data might not be uh, accurate. And you can also, for your own data, mint a DOI if you like to keep this permanently accessible. And um, those are just the larger images of what I just said, including references, including history of who extracted this. And um, there's other data. For this one, for instance, there's photoluminescence uh, and the band structure computations that were done at a certain level of theory. So the other thing that came out of this and that I'm uh, thinking uh, might be useful uh, for wider uptake, uptake is actually the software uh, behind all these efforts. Um, if you start this effort, one thing you find is that there's a lot of good open source software available uh, that, that allows you to create a database in principle, but the actual data collection, you still have to program yourself. You have to create that from scratch. And so without Raul Lasner, who's a, who's a full-fledged uh, uh, postdoc uh, in, in electronic structure theory at the time, of course, and without Zhao Chen Du, who started this, as I mentioned, as an undergraduate, we would not be where we are and the contributions of several other people. In fact, Mati Ropo on the first page as a collaborator who helped us a lot here. And so we, we put out the software uh, that, that drives this database, uh, which we call MatDcubed. So that's the software, not the data, as a separate publication, uh, as an open source project that can be picked up by anybody else. So if, if, you, have, if you have a collection of data that you, you want to collect somewhere, the software here is there. It's based on the Django uh, web framework. It deploys a, an SQL database, and uh, it actually comes with an API um, for access and manipulation of the underlying data sets. Um, and it's interoperable with a, a uh, software called QRESP that was uh, produced by Julia Galli's group, uh, which, which allows one to, to archive uh, data in one's own papers. It also should uh, be useful uh, for many of the data efforts that we have in, in, in the world. And, and just to say that this, this MapDQ uh, software is actually reasonably uh, uh, straightforward uh, to install. Uh, so Yannick, one of the undergraduates on the first screen did it on his own. Um, on his laptop. It follows the usual Python paradigms and then you basically install it by pip install. It has certain requirements for software that is needed. Uh, it also comes with, with tests, with unit tests to make sure that the, the database actually works. And if that works out, if you follow this recipe, hopefully you have the database installed. The API is also reasonably easy to access by just using these uh, entry points here uh, that are documented uh, on the web. And then finally, uh, in the database itself, you have all sorts of properties, in, including compound names and IUPAC names, which is a which is a story of its own. So we're trying to get uh, IUPAC names for molecules correctly, and so this is a difficult task. If you look into the details of how the IUPAC standard for uh, organic compounds works. All right, 
And I, I mentioned these things uh, before, in particular, that you can verify data. You can, of course, download the data, and, and data sets can also be linked with one another in the Matikube software uh, to make sure that they, they correspond to the same measurement or reference. So what can we do? This is what I announced in my agenda earlier. So of course we can do something with the data and here's, here's something that we did ourselves. Uh, this was again led by, by Manuj Jana and, and David Mitzi's group with, with Rui Song, who's a PhD student in my group. And so in short, we were interested in, uh, in the interplay of, of chirality in the organic components and spin splitting uh, of the carrier levels in hybrid perovskites. And uh, so this is just a short example of a chiral molecule, which is a mirror image that cannot be rotated uh, onto itself. So it irrevocably breaks inversion symmetry in a structure and, and therefore also the symmetry of spin bands uh, in a structure. This is on the, the organic component, whereas often the semiconductor transport properties are more impacted by the, by the inorganic components. So the octahedral uh, inorganic groups that you see here. Uh, in this example. And then the natural question arises that a lot of people are pursuing is, can, can we use chiral organics to control the spin properties of carriers? And then uh, by spin properties, what I really mean is uh, spin splitting of the band structure so that uh, carriers of one momentum have one type of spin polarization. In this case, the blue carriers in, of, of, of momentum, uh, uh, of negative momentum in this unit system uh, are spin down carriers. Um, and so there are uh, different ways of, of breaking the spin symmetry. Here's Rasper splitting, which actually splits two separate bands uh, if one makes a projection in, in their entirety. Um, so we can try to find out about spin splitting. And, and it turns out if one uses a naphthal um, um, uh, uh, benzyl uh, uh, ammonium group, in uh, a, a lead bromide framework that's done in this particular material and one uses uh, only molecules of one chirality, uh, one, one actually uh, gets that spin splitting. I'll show you that in a moment, but more importantly, uh, this is actually, this can be related in detail to the chiral molecule imparting its structure onto the uh, 2D uh, perovskite layer. So uh, the, the organic uh, chiral molecule that's shown here Creates some kind of helical in-plane distortion of the atoms in the in the inorganic plane, and that leads to a spin splitting that that ultimately splits bands, uh, as you can see here. Uh, so where you have uh, spin degenerate bands uh, in a centrosymmetric version, uh, you'll have spin split bands in a non-centrosymmetric version of the uh, of the system. And so this is the spin splitting that I'm talking about. You, you can clearly see this in the chiral versions uh, of this uh, material. Uh, but it doesn't appear in the racemic version. So if you have a 50-50 mixture of uh, NEA molecules in this case, uh, then the bands are centrosymmetric, uh, indicative of a centrosymmetric structure as they should be. All right, so this is interesting, but this is a single material and we studied it in detail. So for this purpose, the, the real question is, what can you do if you have more data? And so we have a little bit more data. And so Manuj went through a detailed analysis of, of 17 uh, non-centrosymmetric chiral layered perovskite structures, including some that he synthesized uh, himself uh, to look at different characteristics of the structure. So octahedral distortions, but also bond angle distortions and see what might be the driving force for this. And he also looked at, at 56 centrosymmetric ones for, for, for comparison. And it turns out that the driving force in this case was actually a fairly simple uh, parameter that didn't need a, a great a deep degree of machine learning. It actually went back to the foundations of the perovskite field and then consisted of looking at different tilt angles between the octahedra that make up the inorganic structure. But this was not obvious to us in the beginning. So it's the difference between tilt angles on one side of a structure element like this and the other side of structure elements like that, that correlates most heavily with the spin splitting that we observed. And this really, in my view, is a success because while we still have to make and characterize the structure, at least this gives us a direct indicator of where we should look for spin splitting in these materials. All right, so I'm heading towards the last part of my talk. And uh, that really is about the question what to do next. And so this is uh, uh, in many respects, uh, something that if you, if you know about uh, materials data, you probably know about, but nevertheless, it's, it's where we'd like to go. 
So from the beginning of this project, we were in touch with Springer materials. Uh, this was, in fact, always my concern that we would collect a lot of data and then uh, we would have it and eventually, and eventually the project would go away and the data would go away too. And so the sustainability question was on my mind and I sent a letter uh, to uh, email to Springer materials uh, before we even submitted the project asking if they would be interested in, in collaborating uh, with us and they said yes and uh, sent us a, a letter of collaboration and so it was always the plan uh, if, if, if we didn't have any other options uh, to work with Springer materials and eventually incorporate the data that we could collect into their uh, into their collection of materials properties and so Springer materials itself is, is a very big collection as you probably know uh, it has all sorts of property types, all sorts of materials, uh, 600,000 plus entries at this point of phase diagram structure and uh, properties uh, of materials uh, that you can access online. Uh, the history uh, is, of course, goes back a long way. In fact, it goes back to, to Berlin, where apparently FairDI is centered. So that's uh, interesting. Berlin is still there, except at the time it was Landold and Bernstein who founded the Landold Bernstein series. Uh, that was one of the uh, critical drivers for uh, for this materials collection over many years and with many very senior people in the community involved in this. Uh, Landau Bernstein apparently makes up still 30% of the um, uh, material here, whereas 70% uh, are made up of other databases that have been incorporated over time. Uh, and Landau Bernstein for me personally is of course of interest uh, because, well, not of course, we did not mention this, but, but it turns out we actually got involved uh, sideways a little bit, not directly related to hybrid uh, organic and organic perovskites, but, but to help uh, digitizing and, and reformatting the content of the semiconductor collection uh, of Springer materials to make that ready for uh, digital incorporation. So we did that for a few years and, and uh, other people in academia are also involved with the Springer materials. So I'm not the only one on, on other uh, volumes to work on Lumber Bernstein data and, and make them uh, digitally accessible. So you get from this uh, format here to, to a MySQL format, and then eventually uh, from, from the PDF format to something that is much more easily accessible as data uh, in an interactive graph. And so in short, this is what we'd like to do with our hybrid cube data as well, as well as with other data related to perovskites in the future. That, however, is the future. And so this is the end of my talk. I talked fast. I'm sorry about this. That's the Zoom uh, phenomenon, uh, I suppose. Uh, the summary of this talk, uh, what I wanted to emphasize is that, that hybrid organic, inorganic semiconductors are a, a rapidly growing material space that needs some categorization. We're trying this in the context of our hybrid cubed project. Uh, the details in these materials really do matter. So this isn't a, a simple, uh, plan of just putting something together and seeing whether it works. You need to pay attention to the atomic structure details, synthesis protocols, the effects on the materials and so on to get reproducible and, and reliable data. And uh, so we're trying to do this. And uh, the next step is to try and incorporate and grow this collection in collaboration with Springer materials. And in fact, there's a postdoctoral uh, position open uh, at Duke University uh, to continue this work if you're interested, contact me. Before I completely end, I, I would like to thank again the funding agencies, particularly NSF, who's funded our side of this effort for four years, for which we're immensely grateful, as well as Department of Energy, all the computational agencies in Springer Nature. And with this, thanks again for having me and, and thanks for your attention. Thank you, Volker. So we have enough time for, for questions, which is definitely good for, for an interactive conference and community. So far, I don't see any hands up in the chat. We have one yes. locally here. Yeah, Matthias? Uh, I have a small question here. Oh, okay. A live uh, question for a non-live okay. speaker. Yeah. Um, it was an impressive overview of what you gave, and uh, indeed I couldn't agree more with uh, details matter, because over time, if you look, for instance, at detection of inversion symmetry, this is a very difficult uh, crystallographic issue, and uh, the possibilities of detecting this have changed over time. So the question is, uh, if you curate data, 
how do you make sure that you make use of the most modern insights in all aspects that you mentioned, like uh, crystallography or in terms of uh, uh, yeah, other details as you men mentioned them, the synthesis, it matters very much on which solvents you are using, on how you grow your materials. So how do you, do you want to uh, incorporate this into, into the curation of your uh, database? Yeah, that's a great question because that's that's of course the reason why this year says postdoctoral position, right? And so the uh, and and so I, I will say that my 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 firm belief is that this actually takes care, and um, until we have a computer that can keep track of all the points you just said, which are exactly what's on my mind here, until we have a computer that can keep track of all these um, uh, points, we're limited. To understanding the science very well. And so the Landolt Bernstein volumes, of course, were not edited by somebody who didn't have a different job. They were edited by people like Madelung or so, if I'm not mistaken. And so people who were top scientists in their field, and, and they had the experience to do that. Um, and I think the best we can hope for is to, to, to apply a lot of care to the curation that we do and, and read carefully. So that doesn't mean that we need to discount everything, right? So for instance, we, we can certainly and, and do have different data on the same topic from different sources in there. But eventually, um, if we're cautious, uh, we can also identify particular data types as, as particularly reliable. But especially in the um, uh, field of inversion symmetry, for instance, I, I cannot overemphasize the roles of uh, David Mitzi and Manuj Jana, who I mentioned more, who are extremely careful scientists. And so they, uh, they, they know what they're doing and they, they pay attention to these issue, issues in immense detail. And that's why we, we, were, we were ultimately successful, I think, with our, our study. But yeah, so the, 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 this understanding that you mentioned is needed at the data level. And it takes somebody to actually bring in this understanding and make that work. I was lucky to work with a few people who actually who actually had that, both the motivation and to do this. And they were not all postdocs, right? The, so Becca Lau, for instance, who I mentioned, and Zhao Chengdu on the undergraduate side, and, and the others are also extremely careful uh, in what they do. And so I was I was lucky to help them. But but it's an ongoing challenge. So it was Matthias first, and then Gianmarco. Uh, actually, my, my question was somewhat similar to, to, to the previous one, uh, but may, maybe I can, can then ask another question. Uh, um, somewhat in the middle of your talk, when you discussed your, your calculations, uh, uh, which I think were HSE 06 uh, calculations. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, but when you talk about band gaps and, and, and band offsets, I mean, some people are fudging around with, with mixing parameters, uh, which, which I never really liked very much. But uh, I just wanted to know, actually, when it comes to, to so delicate questions as, as you are addressing, uh, are, you doing, are you doing something there? Great. So first of all, I think it's a totally, as you know, data-related question, because if you don't record these things, and, and we tried, at least I tried in, in when I, whenever I <laughs> look to record these things. Um, if you don't record these things, you get random answers. So we stuck with one mixing parameter for the same reasons uh, that you just mentioned, which is that I, I, I have concerns with, uh, especially with the hybrid materials, with applying uh, protocols uh, depending on the material in question, that one becomes very materials dependent. Mm -hmm. So I have another concern, which is that I know that the screening matters here and the mixing parameter is an inadequate way, and in fact, a, a non-adequate way of reflecting long-range screening in materials with two different components. But for the sizes we have, it's the best we can do. And so for this reason, for many years, I've actually written on this success here, and that was something we didn't take lightly, right? The fact that we predicted these band structures and, and their types, so different uh, uh, different quantum well types for the lead chloride and uh, lead bromide, lead iodide variants of this material. Um, and that in a meeting, David Mitzi then said, this is very nice. The predictions look like my experiment in 1999. So we did not know this. And so we did a few more um, uh, tests that I ironically left out in terms of time reasons, but for the qualitative 
actually a, a few more papers with, with different people and different materials that indicate that for the qualitative properties, our computational predictions are in line with what is found experimentally. But I, it took a, a paper with Letian Du's group, who's also excellent at Purdue University, and a very detailed paper with Adrian Steph Roberts here at Duke and David Mitzi on 16 of these compounds. I might have thrown that into my supporting material. So we looked at predicted band offsets of 16, no, sorry, 15 different uh, graphs guides of, of the type I just showed to look at the band offsets. And Adrienne actually synthesized a few of them uh, in her lab and they were then studied to convince ourselves that this works. So in short, the, the answer is very detailed because we actually try to do this and, and, and uh, be cautious about our protocols. Yes, uh, so thank you. I, I very like the idea that you had to, to pay attention to the fact of what happens uh, in case, you know, a project is not funded anymore. There's the, the notable example of the clean energy project, which has completely disappeared uh, from, from the internet. And so, I mean, in the framework of Optimate, there was the idea to, to define something called Necro-Optimate that allows to kind of revive some uh, databases that were existing. In, in that framework also, I was wondering if in a sense, I mean, all these uh, interfaces online are not repli replicating some tools to visualize the data. So you mentioned the, the Springer materials interface, which, which is nice, but we know plenty of different, uh, uh, you know, web interfaces, Nomad, Materials Project, and so on, where similar tools in the end are being developed. Have you never thought about, you know, some kind of standardization there as well? Yeah, so as you know, I'm still quite interested in, so hybrid cube itself is not going away, right? So the database itself is not going to die. That, however, depends on external funding uh, from funding agencies. And as you know, I'm quite interested in uh, still getting the Optimate uh, uh, API in. In fact, uh, I think this is limited uh, by, sorry to go back so much. This is limited by, 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 by the efforts of, of Yannick, one of our undergraduates who, uh, who has actually programmed this and who had an interest in programming uh, this. I personally think that the more widely data like this is archived, the better. And so um, a lot of our computational data, for instance, is, is, is in Nomad and that's for a reason because, it, because the Nomad database exists. I do think that the model of Landold Bernstein, however, is a also compelling case that one should not forget, right? It's actually the longevity of a publisher uh, that made this possible. Right? And so it's, it's something we should not quite discount. But, and, and that's why I'm actually interested uh, in, uh, in supporting this as well, because yeah. I know that it's been around for a long time. I mean, so, yes. Yeah, my, my point was not to say that it's not interesting. Mm -hmm. The point is that is there in some way a way to share tools? So, for instance, there is the encyclopedia in uh, in Nomad that, in some sense, resembles also Lander Bernstein, if you want. So maybe we may want to share some tools there at some stage. Yeah, and this is this is probably more a question of how Springer materials themselves, because I'm not Springer materials, of course, right? I'm just a, a, a collaborator who's already happy that I'm a collaborator. Um, uh, but uh, but it may be a question to discuss with them. Yes, I agree. So thank you. I don't see any hands up anymore. So then I somehow I wish you a nice coffee break. Actually, so we reconvene in in half an hour. And yeah, unfortunately the coffee is virtual. I don't know about the Louvain crowd. Probably you have a real one. Um, yeah. Is there any other announcement, John Marco? No, we just go for the the coffee, the real we coffee. Go for coffee. Okay, then let's be back at uh, four fifteen again. See you. I will find some real coffee as well. Thank you so much again. <laughs>
That's that's the, the video uh, focus. So here's the sound, and as the person speaks, it's from the focus. Yeah. <laughs> okay, welcome back, everyone. So uh, we are we still have one talk in this uh, afternoon session. So this talk is going to be by Andrei Zakutayev from NREL. And he's going to speak about a research data infrastructure for high throughput experimental materials database. That's the HTEM database. Uh, Andre, the floor is yours. We see your screen at this stage. Yeah, in full, full um, screen mode. And so you can go ahead. Thank you very much for introduction. So uh, I'll talk about this research data infrastructure behind HTEM database. And I'll present this talk on behalf of myself, who is a scientist in materials science center at NREL, National Renewable Energy Lab, and Caleb Phillips, who is my main computational collaborator on the data science side of things in the computational science center. And most of the work that I'll show you today was actually not externally funded. It's um, uh, small bits and pieces of internal funding and uh, funding of other unrelated projects that led to uh, both the database and research data infrastructure behind it. So by means of introduction, I come from National Renewable Energy Lab. It's a DOE-funded national lab in Golden, Colorado, near Denver. So this is over here, Golden. Uh, it's at the foothills of Rocky Mountains. These things here are foothills. Rocky Mountains is actually over to the left with a lot of snow on the peaks. Um, it's very old research institutions. In 1978, it's been around the Solar Energy Research Institute. In the 90s, it got expanded and uh, gained the status of a national lab. Uh, by looking not only on solar energy research, but also wind, bio, and many other um, energy-related technologies, uh, including analysis for them. Uh, it's about 2,000 people, research institution with 100 million, and then just by means of background of um, where I come from. Specifically, I represent a materials discovery team in the Materials Science Center at NREL, where we focus on uh, uh, and aim to discover new materials for a uh, broad range of energy applications. Historically, it has been uh, a lot of uh, new photovoltaic absorbers and more recently um, on absorbers for photoelectrochemical water splitting. We also work on energy conversion materials such as thermoelectrics, piezoelectrics, and ferroelectrics energy storage, including batteries and materials for fuel cells. And uh, very importantly, recently, energy efficiency, specifically new uh, wideband gap semiconductors for power electronics. In addition to this applied uh, research topic, uh, our materials discovery team looks at fundamental and works on fundamental material science uh, that underpins uh, these discoveries. Specifically, we develop new high throughput experimental or as they sometimes called combinatorial research capabilities, um, as well as uh, do fundamental materials discovery in uh, spaces of, for example, nitrate semiconductors or metastable materials. A couple of examples of uh, new high throughput experimental and related tools that I'll show you today pertain to uh, data tools that underpin high throughput experiments. And uh, these include high throughput experimental database that we published uh, four years ago and made publicly available as well. Uh, Combeager, I'll mention as a, a research package for uh, processing a large volume of high throughput experimental materials data. And most recently, um, uh, research data infrastructure, uh, actually the backbone of uh, these various different products that we have, uh, that uh, we have paper about and patents accepted and will be available uh, pretty soon. So here's a uh, typical research flow that we follow with our high throughput experimental materials research from materials discovery. And we often start with theoretical calculations, um, for example, from first principle simulations or perhaps uh, uh, science or uh, chemistry-driven hypothesis. 
perform uh, combinatorial experiments that in our case uh, often are made in physical vapor deposition way. We co spot or core deposit, uh, co MBE, co PLD, uh, different metal targets in the presence of uh, various gases to form uh, sulfides, oxides, nitrates, lithium containing materials, very broad range of uh, chemical compounds, mostly focusing on inorganic solid state type materials rather than polymers, polymers or small molecules. We have broad range of characterization uh, uh, techniques all of for measuring composition, structure, and various uh, physical properties of the compounds with the common theme that uh, all of them have special result in computer controlled XY motion stages that allow us to probe the combinatorial gradients of composition or temperature that we create across our libraries in an automated way and gain uh, large, information, uh, large amounts of information about the properties that these materials have. Uh, Finally, this uh, cycle itself uh, repeats. We have a feedback uh, loop here, including data analysis that I'll talk about today, um, but also the output of the research that uh, we do in materials discovery team uh, in forms of publication or, or, or patents or knowledge transfer are used to do more uh, applied optimization uh, type of research, for example, in uh, gaining uh, high efficiency in, in creating these materials into solar cells or other um, functional devices. And uh, so basically the bottom line here is that we use a lot of these high throughput combinatorial experiments to, do, to discover new materials. This is nice cartoons, but this is actually maybe less so nice, but very realistic picture. So what this uh, instrumental infrastructure behind materials discovery can look like, you'd see here examples of seven different combinatorial chambers that we have focused on various uh, chemistries. We try to separate chemistry to ensure high purity of the materials, as well as uh, a selection of couple of uh, spatial resolve characterization tool for uh, composition structure and property uh, measurements. Well, I'm, uh, I guess the point of this slide is that uh, uh, the, the, this instrumental infrastructure have taken a lot of time, decades of time to de develop and we have a lot of it. And uh, if any of you are uh, interested in gaining uh, a lot of experimental uh, data from any of these characterization tools for any of the materials chemistry that we could deposit, we, of course, are uh, very open and uh, welcoming for uh, collaborations that we could have. So just contact me after uh, if you're interested. So that was a background of um, where I come from and uh, why we do the re research that we do. Let me now say a few words about high throughput experimental materials database. Uh, one of the um, main side benefits or side outcomes that uh, resulted from doing this high throughput experimental research for for the last decade. Uh, to motivate the creation of HGM, um, I'd like to talk about the uh, trade-off in data sites and data diversity among various computational experimental databases that exist out there. If you look at, the, at the, uh, some of the European uh, databases, like many people represent here, as well as uh, American uh, computational databases, including materials project, AFL, LIC, or OQMD, uh, one would notice that the size of these databases is very large. They can trade uh, perhaps hundreds of thousand materials, and they are also quite diverse. They include uh, structure of the materials, their stability, and a large number of properties. This is unfortunately not the case in experimental databases. Um, some of the largest experimental databases like ICSD or ICDD are structural databases. They contain only information about the structure of the materials. Uh, whereas those that contain properties like Langdon and Burstman database you've heard in the last talk uh, uh, are of course very nice, but they're significantly smaller in size than ICSD and ICDD. And there are of course examples uh, that are kind of in between. Um, this basically creates a trade-off in data size versus data diversity of these experimental databases. In even maybe bigger problem of, of, uh, of this trade-off is that none of these databases contains information about synthesis conditions, about how the materials that the properties are reported of are made. And as um, I think um, Claudia pointed out in the introductory talk, uh, a lot of uh, oftentimes uh, properties of the materials uh, in experimental world depend on how exactly they have been processed. To try to fill this experimental gap, at least partially, we developed high throughput experimental database that I'll talk about uh, today in the first part of the talk. Uh, but also there are in the cup in more recent years, 2020 uh, 20 and 2021 examples of other experimentally driven databases such as Meet from Caltech uh, and Hybrid uh, D-Cube uh, that um, Walter just talked about uh, that basically trying to uh, provide in a similar way to HGM 
uh, large and consistent uh, experimental data sets uh, that include not only structure, but various properties of materials and perhaps some of their synthesis recipes. So here's the content of HGMDB, High Throughput Experimental data Database for short, as it was approximately a year ago. At the time we had uh, seven, more than 7,000 uh, sample libraries, these objects that we create with composition or temperature gradient in our uh, high throughput experimental uh, materials, which uh, uh, each of which has approximately 44 point, unique points in which uh, these libraries are mapped, resulting in more than 3,000 uh, unique samples or entries in the database. We have synthesis conditions reported for most of these uh, libraries, um, and they correspond to typical uh, synthesis conditions uh, of uh, techniques like magnet transpatrying or pulse data deposition or MB, so vapor physical vapor deposition methods for um, inorganic materials. Both thermodynamic properties like temperatures at which these materials are grown or pressures, as well as more uh, kinetic uh, materials that are is often computationally difficult to capture, for example, fluxes or rates of gases or metal precursors that have been used to synthesize these compounds. For approximately half of uh, all of this information, we have uh, some ways in which the uh, sample libraries have been characterized um, by uh, measuring their composition, structure, electrical and optical properties as reported in the public version of the database. Um, so we measure structure by X-ray diffraction, composition often by X-ray fluorescence, also other technique, but X-ray fluorescence data is what's reported in the, in, in the database. Uh, electrical properties by four point uh, prop methods and optical uh, properties by um, UV with uh, transmission reflection spectroscopy. And approximately half of all of these data are publicly available. The rest of it is either uh, hasn't been uh, published yet and released, or decision has not been made on publishing it and therefore it's possible to release, or uh, the data comes from project that was funded by private entities that would rather uh, keep that data, including what materials the data was made for, uh, for themselves. In terms of actually what materials uh, we have in the database, uh, these are, as I mentioned, inorganic compounds, often oxide nitrites, sulfides or selenides or tellurides, uh, as well as phosphides and lithium containing materials. Um, and these are a selection of uh, 33 most popular uh, metal elements that uh, are bind with these uh, non-metals to make the compounds. So uh, all along here, I would say that uh, the number of entries that we have in this high experimental database is comparable to the size of some of the computational um, databases. And perhaps one advantage uh, that this database, or one complementary feature that this database provides uh, compared to computational databases that actually contains explicit synthesis information for all of the samples that, uh, and all the entries that are included in here. Uh, perhaps one of the disadvantages that some of the uh, data here uh, is focused on the smaller number of chemical samples explored in larger number of um, uh, statistically uh, significant uh, points. For example, we, when we create a compositional uh, gradient uh, across one specific material, all the 44 data points here would have the same uh, set of elements created and they only vary by uh, changing the stoichiometry. And uh, this point is just, I guess, a difference with respect to computational databases that can be viewed as uh, advantage or disadvantage depending on the, uh, on the vintage point. Here's the way to access high throughput experimental database in the most simple way through its web interface. If you go to hgm.nl.gov, the public um, URL that has been around since 2018 for this database, uh, you would find something like a periodic uh, table where you could type in the elements of the interest that you um, would like to search for experimental data. And then this process navigation bar on the top will guide you through different steps. If you click uh, on the next step to filter, you would find uh, information about all the possible libraries and samples in these libraries that uh, contain the selected elements. And you could filter these libraries as well by uh, how or when or whom they've been made by, as well as what synthesis conditions uh, have been used. So in this filter results, you could see some metadata about who made these samples and uh, what properties for them have been measured and what elements they contain, uh, as well as uh, some information about how exactly the samples uh, have been made. Uh, after filter, the next step is to click and in, to visualize, and you could look both at the uh, raw data as it comes from instruments for uh, these data, uh, for, for these samples, for example, X-ray diffraction spectra here plotted for 44 uh, points on the sample library for this particular uh, library ID, as well as optical uh, absorption spectrum, or look at derived properties uh, that come uh, from these uh, spectral or diffractograms. Uh, for example, here we plot the uh, uh, thickness of the sample, uh, 
across a sample library with a little bit of thickness gradient going across x and y uh, dimension of that sample library. Or you could do cross correlative plots, for example, choose to plot the average visible transmission as a function of thin content of that sample and uh, color the uh, plots by, for example, number of peaks that exist in X-ray diffraction or do the same type of plots with uh, resistivity or conductivity or band gap of the material that had been extracted from um, these data. This is a more simple uh, way of visualizing the data and the one that works well for people that are just interested in finding out what kind of materials we've been working on, what uh, synthesis conditions we use to grow these materials and what properties they might have. If you come at it more from the uh, data science perspective, interested in using our data for, um, for machine learning, let's say, the simple uh, view in Web UI that I uh, mentioned provides you a uh, somewhat limited uh, way of seeing the data here. As I mentioned, we could see, uh, for example, for synthesis conditions only, uh, metadata associated with the sample, as well as a few basic most important, I would say, synthesis parameters, such as substrate temperature, the pressure at which it was grown, the time at which it was deposited, and the relative um, uh, fluxes of the uh, both the gaseous and non-gaseous precursors. If you uh, are doing more in-depth machine learning studies, this information uh, for synthesis may be insufficient to do, to do predictive uh, descriptive of how to synthesize samples. So in that case, uh, you're welcome to use the API that we have developed for HTMDB. And uh, in that way, you would get a JSON file like this, which contains much more information about other samples that are uh, other conditions that are relevant, but perhaps less important for general audience. For example, uh, base pressure that was existing in the, uh, uh, in the uh, chamber during the synthesis and um, various kind of far forward and reflected power on the, uh, uh, metal supplies, the gas flows on the gaseous uh, supplies, and, and, and many other um, uh, details. Uh, in addition to providing this API with uh, substantial documentation uh, on how to form the queries, we also uh, have Jupyter notebooks with a couple of examples of how to use this API. So if you go to this link at, uh, at GitHub, uh, you'll find plenty of HGM examples showing you how to do some basic queries against our API in uh, retrieving the samples and uh, then digging deeper into them and looking at their synthesis conditions and, and properties. All right, so this is some information about uh, more in-depth analysis of synthesis conditions. And um, I also mentioned that besides synthesis conditions, which I think is uh, one of the most important advantages of HGMDB, uh, we also have uh, more standard uh, structural, compositional, and optoelectronic properties reported. So let me now show you a few uh, slides about what we've done in analyzing and processing um, these other properties. So for chemical composition, I mentioned the distribution of different elements, uh, metal elements that we have combined with oxygen, nitrogen, and other anions in the database to, um, to form inorganic compounds um, to try to understand better how these chemical elements are actually grouped together, because often they are not binaries. For example, copper oxide or zirconium oxide, they are ternaries. Uh, we've uh, tried this, uh, we've used this to distributed stochastic neighbor embedding TSNA algorithm. It's a, a very interesting dimensionality reduction model that are used in other applications to try to collapse multidimensional spaces like this 40 or 50 dimensional space of uh, chemical space of elements into a uh, simple reduced uh, coordinate dimension of, um, of dimension of just two. So here you could see that uh, in, in, in this type of analysis, we uh, would find that many of our uh, materials, different combination of elements now, form these types of lines and the other one forms clouds. Uh, lines correspond to uh, pseudo binary composition spread. For example, if you're deposit copper oxide and zirconium nitrate, the zirconium oxide in the gradient, you would have a line like this. Whereas some of the uh, clouds here correspond to ternary composition spread, such as this uh, zinc, titanium, uh, tin um, oxide case that I was talking about earlier. And um, this seems to be a very effective way for us to visualize the uh, all the different uh, interrelation of elements that we have in our database to perform more in-depth chemical analysis in them, as well as understand how some samples in our database are related to others. For example, one may expect that the synthesis conditions used for uh, this particular line could be similar uh, to that particular line, which uh, or, or the one that would fall in between of a hypothetical material that haven't been synthesized. And that uh, could be useful for synthesizing future materials. We have also uh, found ways to process large amount of crystallographic uh, information that we have in form of X-ray diffraction in our database and something more uh, meaningful than uh, just X-ray diffraction pattern. So this, uh, we have more than 100,000 X-ray diffraction patterns uh, that is available and 
uh, this uh, plot here shows uh, a very compressed selection of only 1,000 of them. So it's just a fraction of what we have in the database. Uh, that corresponds to one specific material system uh, that contains zinc, nickel, cobalt, as well as oxygen. Uh, we have tested and um, optimized a particular um, machine learning algorithm that enables us to convolute the composition measured for each of these X-ray diffraction patterns with the similarity of X-ray diffraction pattern itself to perform speculative casting. So we have this uh, custom uh, distance metric in the composition and structural space that we use to perform sample clustering and look at the similarity of different um, sample that we made both in terms of proximity of their composition, as well as the um, similarity of the fraction peaks that they have. And running such analysis on, on this particular data set uh, uh, results um, into something like this. So this uh, uh, ternary plot here represents for the same um, composition space um, prediction for what the uh, phases would be in this um, space. So there's one sp uh, specific uh, ray phase here that we know is now is a spinel uh, single phase and then Two other phases, there is a spinel plus rock salt or spinel plus vortex. Uh, so essentially, uh, applying this machine learning algorithm, this cl spectral clustering against uh, our composition and structural data, uh, lets us uh, create structural phase diagrams, which is very useful uh, because that's the type of information that can be directly compared to, uh, for example, convex hull uh, calculations or more advanced temperature, including convex hull uh, calculations from theoretical uh, databases such as uh, annual materials database or a number of any other ones. All right, so um, I talked so far about the analysis of composition structure. The other two examples would be optical absorption electrical properties. Uh, we develop algorithms to take that transmission and reflection spectra that we measure in our, uh, on our instruments and uh, report in the database, convert them into absorption spectra, and then automatically extract band gap from these materials. So this is often done by tau plots. Um, and we have bench, uh, benchmarked several different ways in constructing uh, uh, in processing data to make these uh, talc plots as well as then extract the band gap out of these talc plots and batch mark them against the uh, theoretical uh, GW calculation that exists in uh, nl 9 db I'm not going to say too much about this except to uh, highlight that this uh, algorithm replaces on often very subjective manual process uh, that is quite often biased in extracting band gaps out, out of uh, experimental measure optical absorption spectra with something that's much more unbiased, uh, mathematically consistent and scalable uh, to be uh, applied across uh, tens of thousands of optical absorption spectra that are uh, measured and reported in HGMDB for extracting band gaps out of the spectra as a quantity that can be directly compared with theoretically predicted band gaps. Uh, finally, we have um, applied uh, or used the random forest uh, method to predict electrical conductivity reported in, on a um, large number of semiconductors in our database. Uh, and we used uh, both chemical composition, X-ray diffraction features, as well as the position conditions for uh, training this data set by tenfold cross-validation, which was around 25% of sample libraries. Um, so with the training set of only uh, 16K data, which is what we had at that time when we were doing that study, um, we uh, created a model that uh, predicts electrical conductivity with an accuracy of maybe one or two orders of magnitude, which may seem like a uh, very bad accuracy, but uh, thinking about the fact that for semiconductors, and I really mean semiconductors all the way from narrow band gap, almost metallic materials to uh, pretty much insulators, uh, this, uh, this quantity of electrical conductivity or doping level varies by uh, maybe 10 or even more orders of magnitude. So this uh, type of uh, prediction based on the synthesis data that we have, as well as uh, diffraction and uh, data and chemical composition seems to be still pretty um, good accuracy to us, at least trying to understand which materials would be more conductive or less conductive, more semiconductors or more metals, more insulators in um, for the types of synthesis that we do in our uh, lab for HGMDB. So to summarize, um, uh, we do a lot of high throughput experimental materials uh, research at annual and um, create a database that contains this information currently internally more than 300,000 uh, materials, compositions, structures, and properties. And then um, uh, that is accessible through both web UI and API. This uh, large data set that we have enables uh, scientific discoveries uh, using uh, machine learning methods uh, uh, to experimental materials problems now in addition to uh, well-established field of applying machine learning methods to computational data. 
maybe uh, most important conclusion that we have taken from uh, this couple of years of uh, past research was that uh, creation of HGMDB and subsequent uh, materials data applications would not have been possible without research data infrastructure. So in the next couple of slides, I would like to spend some uh, time describing what the research data infrastructure at ANAL is, how it has been built, what features it contains uh, to, uh, uh, in the spirit of this workshop on fair uh, GI to uh, explain uh, how we actually do it on the back end under the hood, so to speak, at end or behind uh, HTMDB. And this is the uh, more information along these lines would be in this uh, forthcoming patterns article. Uh, to motivate this, um, I would use a quote from my colleague, Kelly Phillips, who helped to build a lot of this research data infrastructure. He says that data plumbing is the inglorious work that supports modern data science, would it be in material science or many other uh, areas of uh, modern data science. So 80% of the time uh, uh, is often actually spent on uh, plumbing, um, on uh, extracting the data, processing it, present, organizing it, and only 20% is actually spent on doing data science and uh, material science with, with the data that has been extracted. So there are two main data streams that uh, exist around the experimental workflow that uh, we have at Daniel. I talked about how we do the position. Often we do also various kinds of post-processing such as annealing and spatial results measurements. The corresponding data flow uh, uh, that results from use of all of these instruments uh, can be divided in the digital data collection, digital data flow, uh, for which we have this research data infrastructure. Um, we, the data flow uh, goes into this data warehouse and gets extracted, transformed, and loaded into HGMDB, as I'll discuss later, as well as uh, metadata flow. So here we use laboratory metadata collector, special tool that we created to help us uh, capture the metadata uh, that was associated with uh, depositing on the sample or uh, doing the characterization. And both of these uh, data flow are, I think, equally important uh, uh, parts uh, for any research data infrastructure that could be designed in uh, another laboratory. Digital data captures the actual data, for example, the fractograms uh, that are being measured for sample, whereas the metadata captures what conditions these datagrams, uh, these uh, diffractograms have been collected on, or what conditions the samples have been grown at. And uh, it's impossible to do meaningful, uh, I would argue, machine learning on experimental data without knowing both of them. So let's uh, look a little bit deeper in these two data flows. So for research uh, data infrastructure part that has to do with a digital flow collection. Uh, the main important components of, of it are data warehouse. It's an um, uh, essentially time and instrument sorted uh, archive of uh, data as well as associated automated data harvesting tools. Uh, that serves as a uh, first collection point of the data where all the data from different instruments flows. The second important component is extract transform load, ETL process as we call it. It's a process that extracts uh, meaningful and relevant scientific data out of the various proprietary, non-proprietary data files that have been collected out of these different uh, uh, instruments uh, and, trans and transforms them into something uh, more meaningful like an uh, ASCII file where this data could be cross-compared or cross-correlated or convoluted to, to, uh, to obtain the right data. And finally, a load process where um, we uh, load different types of data, for example, composition measurement, structure measurement, and, and, and some uh, property measurement for one particular sample library and center uh, it around the library concept and associated with the synthesis data. Um, so we go kind of from the instrument uh, centric view of data collection to sample centric view of data collection where this data can be compared and cross-correlated and science uh, can be gleaned specifically uh, synthesis structure property relationship, which is often mantra material science. So this is the pictorial view of uh, there is RD, three most important RDI components, data warehouse, ETL process, and, and the application programming interface that is behind the HTMDB that we used for uh, building the web UI for HTMDB and that is behind the API that you could access directly. And all of this has been uh, built over the past 10 years. Uh, that basically data plumbing, the, ki the kind of thing that Caleb says we should spend 80% uh, of our work on and, and point to enable the remaining 20% of machine learning uh, for materials uh, research. Uh, if you look uh, kind of one level deeper about how these, these different uh, research data infrastructure components have been created, um, 
on the data warehouse side of things, it's basically a Postgres SQL database and a lot of uh, Bash script and some custom C++ code uh, that is behind the data harvester that takes the data from uh, tools and puts it in the da database. He'll have a lot of Python for the ETL code here that uh, as well as some R and other custom code that basically extract uh, to extract the data from these uh, custom files and put them uh, in, again into relational Postgres SQL database. And then uh, the front end here, uh, the API and IBI uh, implement uses Express, Node GA, as well as a little bit of uh, Python as well, and, and some Jupyter notebooks to provide examples of that API. And all of this, uh, you could see is very diverse, right? We have full uh, software stack here, um, which is understandable by right? different parts of the research data infrastructure require different software tools um, and uh, for uh, different programming languages. Uh, but also it reflects the fact that a lot of this uh, research data infrastructure has been built with very small amounts of effort. For example, here it was one guy over course with 20% of his time over course of, one, of 10 years. And here there was some other person that did that and different people have different preferences of how to build it. So uh, this is just a reality of not having uh, dedicated external funding for uh, in the US for, for, for these types of endeavors and uh, building things from ground up rather than in a design and orchestrated fashion. All right, so uh, now to describe the high level uh, what these research data infrastructure components are and how they implement it from point of view of software, let me show you what they look like roughly from a uh, user perspective. So data warehouse, as I mentioned, is something that harvests and stores all the digital files that are generated uh, during materials growth and characterization process into a central um, lab and tool and date-based archives. So here you can see different tools are sorted by different labs and different labs there are different tools. And if you click on the given tool, there'll be different dates in which the tool has generated the data and then inside of these folders will be found. So it's like a time step uh, permanent record of all the data that has been generated and collected. An important feature that enables the data warehouse is uh, what we call data harvester. It's a set of uh, different uh, custom codes written mostly in C++ that monitors activity on instrument computers that uh, generate the data and targets automatically targets and identifies the files that have been recently either created or updated uh, in order to um, pull them out uh, and find them in a new file and add them to this uh, data warehouse. The instruments, the computers are connected to the data harvester versus a special firewall isolated uh, subnetwork. It's not part of uh, official annual uh, IT network that is subject often to various, um, yeah, ID, and, and, and government mandated uh, security updates and other uh, special requirements, uh, which often incompatible with the sensitive uh, instrumental equipment that, uh, that we have to track the instrument. Um, so we had to create a special subnet for, for these tools, um, but that's another reality of doing a high throughput experimental data science and, uh, and, and data analytics and data collection in very much an, ex an experimental laboratory would be university or national level. Uh, perhaps maybe one most important feature that I'd like to mention about this data warehouse, um, that was also mentioned two talks ago, I believe. So this data warehouse actually does not, uh, putting data there, data harvest, using data harvesters does not include any software to be installed to instrument computers. So often uh, experimental uh, instrument owners would be very wary of uh, installing additional software because of its potential to interfere with the measurement process or break some of the old computers that, uh, frankly, I used to run experimental equipment uh, quite often. Uh, in this particular case, all we have to do with this data harvester approach uh, is that they live on the central server and the server reaches out uh, to a specific set of um, open folders uh, that are open for harvesting on that particular instrument and identify it and pull all the tiles. So there is absolutely no user input and there's no interaction with the data collection software that is required. And that really enables the large size of this data warehouse that we have. So for high throughput experimental database, I mentioned we have uh, this data collected from more than 300,000 samples, but this is actually operating across very large number of labs and buildings at annual and different types of not only materials discovery, high throughput experimental data being collected uh, using these data harvesters. Second important component of RDI is the extract, transform, load, or ETL process. Basically, has three parts: um, a lot of Python code, uh, R code, and, and uh, Ruby code that is uh, written. And, and you know, I don't know how to represent it. Doesn't just show the GitHub repository that we have for this. But basically, uh, find the relevant folders in the data warehouse that uh, have names that correspond to file name conventions. Uh, that we used to uh, name our high throughput experimental samples, targets only these files that are relevant to our materials discovery work. 
um, copies them into a special uh, repository that only now includes hydroplex experimental data. Then it extracts the files from uh, data and transforms it often from this uh, proprietary original format uh, to final formats. Uh, often we had to do very painfully some reverse engineering in these proprietary formats to be able to do steps, at least for, for some of the instruments. Mm -hmm. um, and finally, uh, aligns individual pieces of data centered around uh, a, a single sample. So that we, for example, could take uh, you know, thickness from one uh, measured from on one instrument and an optical uh, absorption uh, transmission reflection spectrum measured in the other instrument and then put them together uh, to calculate the optical absorption spectrum and extract the bandwidth from that. Uh, this uh, repository uh, of the code here again has been constructed over the past I don't know, three or five years and all very much uh, ground up haven't really um, refactored this code to make it publicly available however I would point out that the uh, structure of that code and its philosophy uh, is basically built on uh, what we call Combeager. And Combeager is an open source data analysis package uh, that we use essentially to prototype this ETL process. And that is publicly available. And uh, you could get an idea about how this ETL process works from this Combeager package. So let me just intervene now and say a couple of words of this Combeager. It's something that we um, uh, released publicly through this web page as well as on GitHub. Uh, a couple of years ago and published paper about this in ACS Combinatorial Science when the journal was still alive. Um, it's a code uh, code base, uh, it's a plugin for a commercial software analysis tool called Igor Pro that we tend to use a lot of annual uh, that is focused on uh, loading various kinds of data files that come from high throughput experimental research that uh, instrument that we are using. Uh, processing and organizing around the samples, kind of like our ETL code does, and then uh, has a lot of advanced uh, graphics functionality for making correlation and plots and analysis of this uh, data with each other. It's a very powerful tool for people that are interested in high throughput experimental uh, research, and it's also open based. You could develop new instruments, meaning new instrument loaders for this code, uh, using templates that we have uh, here as well as new plugins, for example, different other ways of visualizing and processing the data. Uh, but that's probably as much as I'll say about this Combeager in this talk, uh, because the audience here obviously different, not high throughput experimentalists so much, uh, only to say that uh, this Combeager code and structure is basically a similar way in which the ETL process mentioned in the previous uh, slide uh, has been designed. Finally, uh, I think I started the session by talking about the importance of both uh, digital data that we collect from different instruments as well as, as, well as metadata. And metadata um, is, I think, equally important part of the experimental data stream. It's something that describes how, example, how exactly the samples have been measured or how exactly they've been synthesized beyond some uh, log files that can be extracted automatically from synthesis chambers. And it's very, very difficult stream to capture because um, it requires uh, interactions with humans, right? Somebody uh, has to go and instead of writing in their uh, lab notebook about how experiments have been made, or in addition to writing in the lab book, also fill out some sort of digital form to, uh, to digitize this, this data. So uh, we've tried many, many different versions of lab metadata collection over the past 10 years. It's, uh, it's probably third or the fourth version of the design that you're finally converging uh, on and seems to uh, have all the features that were not quite uh, there in the previous version. So uh, LMC in its current implementation is a web-based um, form, lab metadata collector that is done per instrument. So every instrument would have a form like this. Uh, and it's very simple form that is dynamic. You could um, expand this as, as you go. For example, if you're using additional target or gas sources for metal or gaseous precursors, and then um, put in information of, um, of what exactly parameters were used to synthesize this, as well as that, uh, uh, notes or data that this can not be captured by, by this form. It's very easy to complete. It really takes like 30 seconds for somebody to complete. And uh, we find that uh, having, having this very short and very uh, informative uh, form that users can complete um, actually works. Um, the motivation that the users have uh, to complete this, this form rather than just ignoring it and writing things in the old way in the, in the lab book is that they could take the files that are generated this form, the JSON files, and actually once this form is created, load these files into Combeager, which is the software platform that they use anyways to analyze their data. And uh, this provides motivation for them, right? They, they basically digitize their data, they uh, convert uh, this into the JSON file and they load it into Igor so that they could actually then correlate their measured uh, properties in the sample structure that they create with the synthesis conditions. So having something 
for user to do with the data that they are spending time putting in. Uh, we find it's a very important motivation factor for uh, success of lab metadata collection tool in its present um, implementation or in our prior Python-based uh, or LabVIEW-based in implementations. All right, to summarize this part of my talk, um, research data infrastructure is really a critical and enabled component for HTMDB. We have two important data streams, data, digital data collection, laboratory metadata collection, uh, and, and uh, laboratory metadata collection I just talked about for a moment, digital data collection. Uh, has several important components. One is a data warehouse, uh, which is the lab instrument and time sorted archive of files. We have an extract and transform uh, load process with underlying relational um, Postgres SQL HTMDB that uh, takes the files from instrument sorted archive, puts them in a sample based archive, and cross correlates the data in a relational database. And finally, we have this extra layer that didn't really talk as much about. Uh, of application programming interface um, implemented in Express Node GA uh, that is used for uh, web interfaces, other custom visualization programs. For example, our web UI that we have uh, used at htmnl.gov to, uh, to display the data that I uh, featured a couple of slides ago uses the same IPI that runs against the HTMDB to, uh, to get all the data and visualize it. And you could build yourself any number of custom application visualization and machine learning tools using that API. All right, so uh, that was uh, two main parts of my talk about HTMDB and research uh, data infrastructure behind it. Let me now um, summarize this as a whole thing and conclude. So uh, in terms of interesting future research direction I'd like to pursue with, uh, with this data infrastructure and HTMDB, there's two of them, uh, or at least two. Two I'd like to highlight is uh, first is integrating experimental computational databases. We have now, there are a number of them computational uh, databases. We also have one at annual called MedDB, uh, the one that I mentioned has GW calculated band gaps in it. Uh, we would like to try integrating this material in with HTM or experimental database because we think it provides many complementary information about uh, materials. Uh, for example, things like effective methods that are very, very difficult to experimentally measure uh, exist in computational databases. And then things like synthesis conditions that are non-existent in computational databases are very abundant experimental databases. The challenge about doing this is actually linking up materials. That's at least maybe one of the challenges. Uh, we, for example, have different ways of describing the structure of material, right? Uh, theorists often operate on things like SIF file or postcards. And experimentalists talk about extra diffraction patterns um, as characterization of material structure. And there are steps that need to be taken on both computational and experimental side to bridge this divide and to be able to link entries in the computational and experimental databases. The other interesting direction, um, I think, is autonomous experimentation, experimentation with specifically inorganic solid state materials. Obviously, it's a very active research area and a lot of wonderful research done both in Europe and Canada and some in the United States about uh, doing autonomous experimentation with organic materials. And we'll here, what I mean is both small and large molecules that contain a lot of carbon and other important elements, uh, as well as polymers, um, as um, uh, was talked about this morning. Uh, I think that doing something like this in the space of inorganic or solid state materials, the oxides or nitrites or sulfides or the semiconducting type of uh, materials that are inorganic that are very prevalent and very commercially important for many energy technologies uh, would be extremely interesting uh, from point of view of its energy applications. As, uh, but it's also very much more challenging, right? You can't use, for example, simple spectroscopy, vibrational spectroscopy in the way uh, organic or polymer people do to identify what they made. Uh, we have to use tools like X-ray diffraction, which are very difficult to couple with uh, typical uh, physical vapor deposition methods that are used to making organic materials. And also uh, even just the cost itself, right? Which ha has, comes with the risk. Uh, typical uh, physical vapor deposition tool costs something like $1 million. And it's possible to set up with maybe $10,000 only and uh, flask type uh, organic synthesis in, in, in the lab. So the scale of the problem and the unique challenges uh, make it uh, this problem of autonomous and organic material synthesis is something quite unique and something I wish we could do. Uh, however, for neither of these two uh, topics, uh, whether it's integration in experimental computational databases or autonomous synthesis of inorganic materials, we currently have uh, external research funding. So uh, this is still in dreams and uh, very small amount of seed efforts uh, that happen internally to try to inch in, in, into that direction. So that's in terms of future research direction application of my talk. Uh, this slide only shows the summary and conclusions from what I told so far. 
two topics I covered were high throughput experimental materials database that is very large public repository of experimental materials data. Uh, more than 300,000 uh, entries that we have internally and roughly half of them available um, publicly that can be accessed through both web user interface and API with more details described in this publication, as well as underlying research data infrastructure, the 80% inglorious task of uh, plumbing all of this uh, data to lead to a product like this. Uh, and we've been doing this for, for 10 years. So we really have a lot of tools and multiple versions of these uh, tools that are getting better and better with time about how to harvest the data, how to tra start transform a lot of it and how to collect the meta uh, data that is uh, briefly described in this uh, forthcoming patterns article. So that uh, I would like to thank you for inclusion and just uh, make a final statement that I do think that this research data infrastructure, which seems to be in focus of this conference and the workshop and the project that you guys have is very important for uh, experimental materials databases, not only computational ones. So I'm very glad you're doing something like this uh, in Europe. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Are there questions? Don't see any hands up, so let me start. On page 13 or so, you showed this uh, comparison of band gaps with, with calculations. Yeah. And I understand this is optical absorption and you compare it with GW. So how do you correct for electron hole interactions, so excitonic effects, because GW doesn't give you the optical gap, and also electron phonon coupling? Uh, yes, very, Those very good point. Those are in the order of a few tenths of an electron volt, both reduce the gap, so there must be a lot of discrepancies otherwise. That's right. Uh, you're absolutely right. There are uncertainties both on the uh, computational side that you pointed out, the electron hole interaction and excitonic uh, effects, which I'm aware of from my personal research experience are very important. But I would say maybe even a larger uncertainty comes from experimental data. It's also very, very far from perfect. Uh, we find that uh, even not comparing different uh, research algorithms, uh, computational research algorithms to extract the data from optical drop spectra, but comparing in, in interpretation of different humans to each other can lead to even larger discrepancies. So that is reflected by very large distribution of this data. For example, here, you could see that the indirect data for this particular material uh, calculated from GW lies below experimental data distribution. And uh, the same thing with the uh, direct, direct band gap, but uh, even the error bars on this GW uh, calculations have uh, smaller point, smaller magnitude compared to error bars on experimental data that had to do with uncertainty interpretation of optical absorption spectra, as well as spread of the uh, synthesis conditions that lead to variation of materials properties. So yeah, it is very important uh, computational challenge to get the band gap right, but I think there's even more for an experimental challenge to control the samples and to interpret data in a faithful and, and, and mathematically consistent way that people talk less about, but, but very, very important. Okay, thank you. Jean Marco? Uh, Tom Polstra here, <clears throat> University of Twente. Uh, thank you for this very impressive talk. Uh, a lot and lot of uh, efforts and materials. I have two uh, questions on the more general level. Um, if you do this high throughput uh, materials uh, data science, um, I can see various aspects that are valuable, and I would like to extract uh, some kind of opinion of you, uh, whether, which is more valuable. Is it more valuable uh, to learn of new stoichiometries, new materials, new compositions that are stable and form a, uh, that give you the, uh, the handle of new properties? Or is it that you learn more about uh, the, uh, uh, the dependencies using machine learning, that you know exactly what kind of composition, what kind of synthesis conditions you need in order to, to find dependencies that uh, are not easily uh, observable. And I do have a follow-up question. Yeah, uh, I think that the first type of question that you posed uh, can be reasonably well addressed with the modern uh, accurate computational uh, uh, data science, the questions of how definition, how elements that go into a crystal structure affect the resulting properties across very broad range of materials that are accessible computational in these days uh, could give pretty good insight into uh, crystal chemistry uh, trends. And I think there's a lot of very valuable uh, publication literature these days on that topic. I do think that the experimental uh, database and specifically inclusion of the synthesis conditions in the uh, in these databases um, is something that would be very difficult to capture 
uh, computational and provides an additional value there. Uh, you mentioned already how the synthesis condition affect different properties. The other uh, maybe hidden variable here is how the off stoichiometry captures the properties, right? We often uh, make these compositionally graded sample libraries where stoichiometric material, let's say, is in the middle and there's an off stoichiometry on the left and the right. Um, how exactly off stoichiometry influences the properties, in particular electrical properties, right? How it leads to self doping of the materials is something that is extremely difficult to capture computationally. And I think these types of more subtle synthesis property relationship and various non ideologies including kinetic synthesis conditions as well as effects of off geometry and materials properties is a big added value yeah i uh, uh, must disagree with you on the first uh, picture but i think it's still exceedingly difficult to pre uh, to predict crystal structures especially if you look at the last talk uh, of these organic inorganic hybrids uh, i've mm -hmm. it's uh, but uh, but i can see the advantages but let me follow up on the other aspect that is the composition dependence, because mm -hmm. if you have uh, materials uh, that uh, that uh, do not uh, crystallize in the same crystal structure, or even if they do, you the properties are often very much determined by grain boundaries or by interfaces, and the exact nature of these interfaces, of course, uh, is something that also is uh, uh, visible uh, for you experimentally. So is this something that you focus on as well, or should that receive more attention? Uh, yeah, it's a very good question. Effects of uh, microstructure interfaces and grain boundaries are certainly very important, uh, more so for some applications than the others. For example, if you talk about the optical absorption spectra and the band gap, this is very much locally dominated uh, property that is maybe less sensitive to this, but um, uh, other properties like charge transports are extremely important. Um, Sometimes very difficult to implement the high throughput experimental measurement techniques that would, uh, in a high throughput way, um, provide information about the microstructure or interfaces. Often uh, doing this from SEM or from TEM requires very involved uh, uh, measurements that are performed in a very small fraction of a sample compared to an, say, two inch by two inch library that we generate this. And, and there could be variability of the microstructure across uh, in the vicinity, even with that sample, not even speaking across a uh, large size of two inches. So, yeah, we try to uh, do it maybe in a similar way that Claudia was talking in her introductory talk by um, staggering different characterization techniques. We measure what we can measure first quickly, including uh, materials composition structure and some basic properties. And then for the most interesting cases where we do have information uh, that, that that particular sample is worth investigating, uh, we look at the effects of microstructure interface and other thing that simply cannot be characterized in a high throughput way or very difficult to characterize in a high throughput way in this type of final fashion of the approach where you measure easy things first and then you measure harder things later. Thanks. Thank you. Are there further questions? I don't see any hand up. So actually- One, one here, we have one here. Sorry? Yeah. So, can I go? Sure. Yeah. Thanks. So, so I have one more question. We already addressed grain boundaries, and I I like it very much that you take into account the the, the growth conditions and like the deposition. Um, in in most of these cases, you also have traces of like carrier gases still there, right? Um, hydrogen is is one thing that is almost always still there in in some some quantities. And this actually influences properties of these materials, especially optical and electrical properties, even if it is like sub uh, percentage levels in, in, in mass even. Do you have any, any idea of, of how large these quantities are in your deposition methods? Yeah, thank you for that question. Certainly there are various non ideologies in the uh, experimental synthesis setup that may prevent uh, from achieving a deal property of the material. We don't have direct measurements of hydrogen, as you may be aware of, these uh, are extremely difficult. We have tools like Rutherford back scattering, for example, at Endo that conceivably can measure hydrogen in the sample, but these are very, again, specialized experiments of the kind of grain boundaries that I was talking about that just impossible to do in a high throughput way. Uh, but there are types of data in our database and accessible through API that may uh, let you get an idea about how at least relative amount of contaminants or hydrogen are uh, changing between different samples. So for example, um, not in this web UI, but if you dig deeper into the API, there is a field here under the uh, guesses uh, that is called base. 
underscore tor. And this is the base pressure in tor of our chamber. And for this particular sample, it happens to be eight times 10 to the minus seven tor. That base pressure is pretty much entirely made out of water. And I think water or cracking of water in plasma to produce some oxygen or hydrogen that can both intentionally or unintentionally be incorporated into the sample, the main source of hydrogen. So uh, there's probably some correlation about the uh, amount of unintentional hydrogen that exists in our sample with this quantity called uh, base store. And even though we don't exactly know how much of hydrogen is there, the relative base pressure that was done for different samples in this chamber or between different chambers could be used as a relative metric of how much uh, of this impurity could be in our samples. Yeah, thank you, very, very useful. More questions? Then let me go right away into our general discussion. And um, I start by asking a probably provocative question. So we have seen now various presentations uh, telling us or showing us really impressive work on data infrastructure and all kinds of tools for processing story and then harvesting data. So, but at the same time, we, we already see that uh, everyone is going in a little bit different directions. So is there any chance for achieving interoperability uh, in the next, I don't know, five years, 10 years? And I really would like to, to have all the speakers uh, yeah, providing the opinion uh, on that. I mean, how, how far are you from each other and how much effort will it be in order to somehow to bring data from these different sources together that are already quite advanced, which is great, right? Who, who likes to start? Maybe Walker should start because he has the most interoperable database in the sense that there are data pieces coming from different different directions. Yeah, but the operable part is a good question, right? I actually thought that your infrastructure was <laughs> was the solution, right? You made a lot of progress. But coming to Claudia's question, um, my naive and truly naive impression is that this will come together but it takes the last bit on, on Andre's slide, which is sustained funding, right? And this is, this is an interesting question. Mm -hmm. As a company, you can probably do this. If you're funded by three or four year projects, uh, it's, it's difficult because you have to uh, work uh, with uh, people who change jobs who need to learn from scratch who need to be excited about the work and some people are excited about this work which is fantastic but every new person coming in needs to see the value so if one has seen the outcome like to name one which which i mentioned initially landall bernstein which really influenced me during my phd if one has seen the outcome then it's fairly easy to be excited about this work or at least be convinced that this is worth it right and so andre's infrastructure that, that was just put together is, is again that's quite impressive and so I think we'll get there, uh, but the, the challenge of the sustained funding and just working working to make this big vision come together is, is still a large one, I think. Well, FairDI is going to, Fairmat is going to solve it, right? <laughs> Hopefully, no, I mean, of course, Andre's infrastructure is, is more sustained, well, is, is at least secured because I don't think that the annual will be closed at some point, but still probably it only maintains his infrastructure, the infrastructure of NREL, and still the interoperability. So this can be quite advanced, right? But still the interoperability between different uh, sources is not secured even in this case, no? That, that, that's true, absolutely true. I mean, it, uh, I guess somewhat logical and natural that NREL infrastructure is limited to NREL's application because none of the uh, external funding other than what was internally available at Renault was used to develop it. So right, what was developed uh, was used for annual purposes. I wish we could have external funding on a similar scale that uh, may be available in Europe, or for example, the one that um, Materials Project folks at Berkeley and joined for computational data infrastructure to make uh, something similar uh, for, for the experimental world. However, that hasn't happened uh, so far. Perhaps the closest example I would say uh, to interoperable large experimental data sets uh, or infrastructure to create such large interoperable uh, public experimental data sets would be the um, energy materials network. It's type of funding uh, that uh, was established in the last five years or so 
Uh, and there are several of these energy materials network in the US funded by energy efficiency, renewable energy focused on different topics, including hydrogen generation, storage, and uh, utilization in, in fuel cell uh, vehicles, light uh, weight materials, and so on. Uh, but all of them, they have these uh, things called data hubs. Uh, and most of these data hubs designed around a single um, platform. There is actually a group at annual that, uh, uh, that rolls out and customizes this, this web CCAN based platform for um, experimental data collection that includes both capability of data capture. So there's kind of a, uh, I don't know, externally looking, maybe simpler, but externally looking uh, customizable version of the LMC lab metadata collector that I mentioned, as well as the data repository, data warehouse implemented in the CCAN platform that enables different projects participants in this consortium to upload, upload compare their data. Um, that may be one potential route of, of, of doing it. But again, uh, I think Volker kind of uh, would agree with me on that there's very little um, funding in the US on creating this uh, data and sustaining this data infra infrastructure. Often even that effort, and this data hubs that I mentioned, an energy materials network is very much driven by specific applications such as was this hydrogen storage or hydrogen generation, uh, rather than the goal of creating data structures that will work for different people. And therefore the product is more application oriented than the science oriented or discovery oriented. So is there money yeah. in Europe, Christoph? <laughs> or whoever likes to comment on that? <laughs> Yeah, I think, well, we, we focus more on trying to get together the very diverse labs, not, not one infrastructure that has already maybe a top-down possibility to create some kind of interoperability. And I think the solution will be to really focus on one application or maybe a few applications initially and try to make some progress there and convince the community to, to invest in this. Um, but yeah, it cannot be done by one group alone. It has to somehow be some community effort that is driven by um, role model examples. Claudio, may I turn around the question that you just asked and ask you or, or Matthias a question here. For experimental community, what lessons are there to be learned from uh, all the efforts in integration and homogenization of computational material science databases that we should uh, follow or pursue and not, not you know, use the best knowledge and, and not repeat the mistakes? I mean, the lesson learned is it's a lot of effort. So I think it took us something like 20 percent years to homogenize the, the electronic structure calculations to write the parses and so on. Maybe it will be faster now having this experience and having people who are already skilled in doing that. So this is this is the hope. But our experience is, is the same. That it's, it's really a huge, huge amount of time that goes in there. Maybe Matthias wants to comment on that. Still muted or any comments? Uh, yeah, okay. So, so you asked me, so sorry. Yeah. Actually, I, I don't have to add much more, except actually a little correction when you said actually 20 person years. It was 20 person years for five years. So yeah, it was five years ago, so it was the first. <laughs> so, so, so that's that's right. right. So it's at least yeah. already doing that. And I would say really uh, the work on the experimental side is, is comparable in the sense it will be a factor 10 or 100 more. That's daunting. Yeah, and don't and don't try to get everything done at the same time. Just start by example. <laughs> yeah, I think really the important thing is that we as, as, uh, yeah, that we start really by example that people see already immediately that is useful, and that, that we also show what I call it bring the science into this infrastructure work. I think it's it's what what we are doing is really a long term. Uh, uh, project and 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 and, uh, and and the people here together know why we are doing it, but uh, someone else had said that I think I forgot who said that, uh, but but the majority of people is not there yet, right? And that we have to convince them and show them uh, uh, that they also gain from this immediately. There is some hands up in the room. Yeah, um, Claudia, if I may, uh, I would sure. like to return the question to you. Uh, what do you mean with interoperability? Uh, we heard uh, a beautiful talk by uh, Volker Bloom about these hybrids. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone working on magnetism knew these hybrids from the work of low dimensional magnetism. 
everyone knew that they uh, existed, everyone was familiar with them, and nevertheless, no one thought about them as synthesizers for, uh, for photovoltaics. So uh, the question for me for interoperability is that if we have this enormous database, that we should also think very carefully about what kind of purposes do we give our materials and that uh, these communities uh, can uh, find each other. And that uh, somewhat is counter to what uh, Christoph Cox just said. We should focus on one particular property because otherwise it becomes too difficult to, to, uh, mm -hmm. to start such an effort. I'm very mm -hmm. curious to learn about this aspect. Mm -hmm. I think probably what you're addressing is more reusability that some some databases data store that is has been built by someone can be used by someone else. What I mean with interoperability is what happens if you bring together data from different sources, and this could be either uh, different calculations computed by different codes and different people, how to make sure that they are comparable and we don't compare apples with oranges to bring together experimental and theoretical data. Are we really sure that we're talking about the same thing? And then yet another aspect is now there are many different databases built up defining their own metadata, their own file formats and so on. So how can we make sure that at some point we can extract data from different sources, again, comparing them on equal footing? So I think interoperability is an extremely complex topic and we need to make sure that we capture all of these subtleties in order to, to guarantee that, that we operate on data that are really uh, reconcilable. Probably Optimate, so to say that the Optimate API is already a good first starting point for extracting data from different sources, but I think um, um, maybe Christoph can comment on this as well. So, I mean, in, in, in Nomad and in Fermat, we are, we are concerned with very heterogeneous data anyway, because we, we somehow have to embrace the whole community in Germany and all different kinds of experiments and, and, uh, and techniques. So in that sense, we are used that, or we anticipate that not everyone will use our standards or file formats. And we, we, we are aware of the fact that we have to write converters to transform from one metadata set to a definition to another, or from one file format to another, or, or not. So in that sense, we are prepared for this, but of course, this will be a huge effort finally to do it for the entire community. Yeah, maybe since you asked me to comment on this, um, there definitely is a lot of work that needs to be put into. And the idea would be that this doesn't have to be done all by manual programming. Like there's a different data format. Now somebody has to sit down for a week and somehow implement this. But there should be two directions. Of course, uh, different labs and different manufacturers start to adopt one format um, that somehow crystallizes to be uh, the most liked one or so. But on the other hand, also, we, we're thinking about developing smart algorithms that can really make sense of new data formats automatically. So, I mean, we don't always need to use machine learning only for interpreting the data once we have it read in. We can also use the machine learning, for example, to interpret data formats, because we, in principle, know what to expect in this and there can also be an automated way of reading data. When, like humans would do this. When we see a new data format, people can hack data formats and can make sense of the data that's in there. Maybe not of everything, but uh, let's say the important data. Why shouldn't the machine be able to do this? So there was Luba first and then Matthias. Yeah, I think, I think everything starts with the APIs, right? I mean, I don't think it's a really big difficulty that there's different data formats, right? as long as they stay the same, right? So if we kind of all focus on having APIs that kind of are closed to change, but open to extension, then we can start having, having converters and kind of start merging. So I think the most important thing is that people apply this, this, this design principle of, of computer or of software design to make sure that your, your APIs are extremely stable, that they don't change ever, and that they only are open for, for further extension. 
Yeah, yeah, I also agree. I think really the data formats is something which is at least say well defined and, and you can transform one into the other one. The, the big problem I see is, I think Ernst, um, Ralf Ernsthofer said that, if you compare experiments on the so-called same material for different groups, the two experiments may be more different than really theory and experiment. Uh, and, 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 and the problem is, uh, um, is, is in, 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 that has been also really mentioned that uh, the, the synthesis of the sample, I mean, what is the number of dislocations? What is, is hydrogen? What are impurities and, and so on? And, and, and what, what, whatever I understand from people is identifying the relevant parameters. I mean, in theory, we know what we have to give. So that is really easy to send because you have an input file, we have an output file, we have a theory of some approximations. But in experiments to define what are the important parameters for defining the synthesis is something we all still have to learn. And I think it's really very exciting to learn that because, uh, and, and we call this really in, in, in Fermat, we call this making, making synthesis reproducible. At the moment, there is really a big step to, to really do this. Uh, at least that is what the people in synthesis tell me. Well, if you want, I can, can confirm this. Uh, at IMEC, we try to make new semiconductor materials. And, and I can computationally predict new materials and kind of suggest to make something. Actually making this is a completely different story. And then if we make it by PVD or by ALD or by whatever other deposition technique, you get something completely different. The pressure of the carrier gases is extremely important. The temperature of the deposition, the temperature of the cooling, the ramp up of the temperature makes that you get different materials. And we are in need of, of materials with extremely well-defined well defined properties. If you are on the center of the wafer, on the edge of the wafer, you have a slightly different gradient and you get a completely different material. So I completely have <laughs> confirm with, uh, with Matthias's remark. This is probably the most, most the, the biggest challenge that we have here. Any remarks or questions from the audience? No. So any more remarks from speakers, from Luba, from Matthias? Okay, so then let's conclude that everything is very challenging, but uh, <laughs> we're positive that at some point we will we will succeed. And actually, it's not not just what I what I emphasize all the time. So somehow it's boring. Uh, it's it's boring uh, stuff if you have to prepare things in order to do science before. But I think this process is not boring at all. So it captures a lot, a lot of interesting challenges and questions and also scientific problems uh, along, uh, along this road. So with this, I, I thank all the speakers again for their really excellent presentations, for, for all of you, for, for your active discussions, and we'll reconvene tomorrow morning. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for thank organizing you. this very interesting session and discussion. Yes. Thank you very much, and I wish the people in Louvain a great dinner. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye bye. Sorry? No, they didn't. It was just the. It was just the. It was just for the people who are actually attending. They didn't understand the question. But we do not. We do not know. Of course we do. Yeah. 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 Yeah.